Hey now, it's your boy PSA Sitch here with another Tuesday Tuesday stream with everyone's favorite drinking all the pills and all the soy milk. <laughs> all, the white, all the white pills, all the black pills, all the blue pills, the red all pills. The pills, 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 pills. Mixes and matches. So we're here with Rolo Tomasi, who runs a channel called The Rational Mail. Hmm? Uh, he came to my attention because I guess Pearly Things is the name of the channel. Pearl has uh, been kind of uh, blowing up. Well, I guess she's she's been uh, relatively good size already. I think she's over a million mm -hmm. subscribers. But I heard her in some conversation mention Rolo and say Rolo is like one of the thought leaders of the red pill movement. So uh, mm -hmm. Pearly Thing seems maybe out of our reach because she's got a million subscribers. So I reached out to Rolo. It seems like I'm going to call her. I got it right here. <laughs> well, that's <laughs> cool. That's cool. But it seems like we have a, you know, you know how, you know how the game is played, Rolo. Like we have a similar audience size. So it seems like we're in this, in the status realm that we are able to talk to one another and have a conversation. Well, so also you're a big David Buss fan, Adam. True, true, true. And so is, so is Rolo. I listened well, to. He, maybe you were, I don't know. <laughs> you no, I, yes. No, I got a, I got kind of a love hate relationship with Dr. Buss. Okay. Well, that's great. I, I, I have some questions. I have about eight questions. And we we're just going to basically try to treat this as like an interview where we're going to walk away and better understand the red pill movement. When red pill stuff comes up on our stream, a lot of times we get people in our audience that push back at us and say we're misrepresenting things. Uh, we did an interview with uh, another YouTuber, not so erudite recently, where we mm -hmm. were talking about evolutionary psychology. I'm a big fan of evolutionary psychology. We talk about evolutionary psychology on the show all the time in the context of uh, morality, which obviously a lot of the dating stuff I think does, mm -hmm. does encompass morality to some extent. And she was really, really against evolutionary psychology. And I really, I think it was because of the red pill movement. <laughs> I think the red pill <laughs> movement uh, had turned her sour on evolutionary psychology so that's another thing that made me start looking closer at the red pill movement so but i i want to give you a chance to like introduce yourself and introduce your channel or or uh, mm -hmm. what you're doing or anything like that just to give people an idea who you are sure um well i'm Rolo tomasi i've been doing this for about 20 years about 21 mm -hmm. yeah about 21 now since about 2002 2004 somewhere in there and uh, I took a keen interest to uh, like what was going on as far as like the seduction communities at that time. Now, that was back in the day before we had YouTube, before we had like w w before social media really was what it was. And it's what I call the forum days. And I was a moderator on a forum called So Suave at that time. And uh, there's a lot of other ones that were going on as well. So if you ever read the book, The Game by Neil Strauss and all the stuff that was going on in that, it's, I, I never really looked at that so much as like a, an instruction book, but more of a, it's basically entertainment is what it is, but it was interesting. But it, uh, it revealed like what was going on in the seduction communities uh, during the early 2000s. And so uh, basically what it was, is was guys who took to the internet, there was these forums and people, guys were all over the world and they shared one common interest, which is how do I get my dick wet? You know, that's all, that's basically what they were looking to do. And so you had guys from every every corner of the world coming together and uh, comparing notes and saying, hey, this is how things are here. This, you know, in South Africa, Japan, you know, Europe, whatever. And uh, we're going to go and we're going to just be experimental in all this. And really that lasted for almost like 12 years ish, I think. And uh, I started my blog, The Rational Mail, in 2011, and, which is still going today, although I haven't really done much to it recently. I've um, been writing more on Substack than the, than the blog. But uh, I, I started doing it in 2011, and most of the essays and the, the posts and everything that I put on the blog uh, stemmed from conversations that I had on So Suave and the, those forums for, by that time, probably about eight, maybe 10 years at that time. And uh, so I developed them out and I, I turned them into like something like substantial as far as like a blog post is concerned. And then I just kept going with it and had these conversations, had a really active um, at, at one point. I was like, so I, I think the not this probably not the first most traffic, but the second most traffic blog at the time within the seduction communities at that time. And uh, I'm one of the f the three R's of the Manosphere, which is Roosh, Roycey and Rolo. And so the, we were sort of the the guys who would compare notes and just bounce ideas off of each other. And I took more of a, a, 
let's say a, a theoretical slash uh, psychological slash rational um, uh, perspective to it. So while Roosh and Royce were also writing similar stuff, um, they were more like hands on, like we're going to get out in the field, like field field work or field experiments. And there was at the time where um, uh, RSD, real social dynamics was a thing that was going on, uh, mystery uh, from mystery method and the Venusian arts was going on at that time. And yes, they were pickup artists, uh, like, you know, by their own admission. But I was never a pickup artist. I was just had a really keen interest in the the psychological aspects of it because I was studying psychology, behavioral psychology at the time. And I just got into it and had a lot of conversations with a lot of guys. And when I was studying for psychology, I used to do peer counseling. And I took the unsexy work of peer counseling guys who are much older than I was. So it was the 45 to 65 demographic of guys. And uh, I found that a lot of their um, a lot of their distress and a lot of their their problems in life uh, stemmed from many of the same problems that guys who are in the man, what we call the manosphere now it wasn't called that back then um, were were kind of going through at that time. And so I just had took a keen interest in all this. I started getting into evolutionary psychology during that time as well. And then uh, around about 2013, I had so many people say, you're just a blogger because <laughs> this was the blog days. It was a forum days and the blog days. And then I had hey, people have to say, Rolo, can you turn your mic down a little bit? People are, oh, am I too hot? Am I, how about that? Are... I'm, I'm a, I'll pop myself down, but it's on my board. Probably. Is that better? I came down about, like, I mean, I can't tell the difference, but it's, it sounds people in there. Yeah. People are probably will complain. I'm sorry. I'm on, I'm on my roadcaster board and it's a different audio when oh, it's okay. Not Zoom even. than Mike Streamyard. Uh, so anyways, the, um, around about 2013, I produced the, uh, the rational mail as a book I self published. Um, and then I was just kind of flying by the seat of my pants. I thought that would be the only book I ever published. And I wanted to write the book that I wanted to read because I never really got that out of uh, the game or any of this other stuff. And I really wanted to just sort of codify all this stuff because I have people saying, you know, if you put this in a book form, people would take you more seriously. I'm like, okay. So I made a book out of it. And then uh, it kind of snowballed from there. And the Rational Mail, the first book, the Rational Mail is really, to, even to this day, people call it the Bible of the Red Pill. And so I, I started encountering guys like Rich Cooper, Ryan Stone, some of these other guys who, like, like I guess, um, the it's in my sphere, they're much bigger names than probably your sphere, but um, like Richard Cooper, um, I mean, even Kevin Samuels, even uh, Andrew Tate, all kind of, uh, I say lift, but they they kind of reference the material that I've been talking about at that point, about 10 years from there. So, so, I did, so is the book like a pickup artist book? Are, are you, no, no, are you like not. a former just, pickup artist? No, I've never been a pick, pickup artist. I've never sold myself as a pickup artist. I'm not a PUA. I'm not an MRA, men's rights activist. I'm not a MGTOW. I'm not a black pill guy. If, there, if you're going to have to classify me as anything, I'm red pill per se. So what I, what my interest is in is uh, intersexual dynamics, the nature of women, the nature of men and the confluence of those two together. So sometimes people will say, well, you're a pickup artist. Sometimes people will say you're uh, you're a MGTOW, like men going their own way or men's rights activists. I've been called a variety of different categories because people really want to categorize you just so they can either dismiss you or they can just reference you as being, oh, the PUA role of Tomasi. I've never been a PUA. Okay, no. I just I don't I didn't know and just obviously PUAs that use my material, but I, I don't actually. I my, my stuff is much more theoretical. The, so the book you wrote though is it like a handbook to picking up women? No, no. It's okay, not. And, and so there is. Um, is it a handbook to having good relationships with it's women? A handbook. It's a handbook of understanding men's nature and women's nature. If it has to be a handbook at all, and remember, okay. I've written five different books, so there's like a series of books now. So, um. The, including the last book, which is called The Player's Handbook. It's not a pickup guide. It's how and why this stuff works. So when people ask me- Works or they, to do what? Well, it works as in um, uh, whether it's seduction or it's why do the, why do God, why do PUAs say, oh, use a neg hit, you like uh, use a backhanded compliment. Uh, why is it that we say stuff like women will, are women- um, will break rules for alphas and they'll make rules for betas. Why, why, why is that a thing? We, we, it, it sounds like some like kind of, you know, jingoistic buzz term that, that guys use. And so when I wrote that book, I wanted to explain, here's how we come to this conclusion. 
because mm-hmm. too many people hear that and they go, oh, those guys, what the hell they're talking about, blah, blah, no girl, whatever, you know, no one with any good self-esteem would, would fall for that. But why are we still talking about it like, you know, 15, 18 years later? Well, look, it well, sounds like the goal is, behind it. It sound, but it sounds like the goal of the, the literature is to mm-hmm. have sex with women. <laughs> like it, it, the goal, okay, so here's the thing is, that's, that's the problem. And, and like when you were titling this, this, uh, this show, you know, the Red Pill Movement, there is no Red Pill Movement. Okay. Red that's... Pill itself is what, I've, what I loosely call a praxeology. So a okay. praxeology is the study of human behavior in that that behavior has a point or a purpose to it. Right. So and now I understand there's other definitions of it. there's an economics definition of it. There's the classical Greek definition of it. So, but it, as far as the red pill itself, it is a moral, a religious, a social, a political, and it should remain. So it's try, it, it's like the Chilton manual of human nature. That's why it, it dovetails so nicely with evolutionary psychology, because it's not about here's what you ought to do. It's not about shoulds. It's not about prescriptions. It's about what is. But all, all behavior, absolutism. though, all mm-hmm. behavior is to facilitate goals. Like the only purpose of behavior mm-hmm. is to facilitate some For the behavior objective. Itself. But you got to remember, you have to understand what the dynamics of that behavior. Why do we do that in the first place? Yes, yes. What yes. is that? What is Mostly that? to yeah, achieve so status or to like have it sex. Or eat. So, here's, so think of it as this, what I, what I say in like most of the introductions of my books is this, is I'm not in the business of making men better men. I'm in the business of having or helping men become better men themselves. So it's like, it's equipping guys. It's like reading a textbook so that you can use the information in that to your own ends. So for some guys, it might be, I want to get my wife to have sex with me again. For other guys, it might be, I want to, I want to have a rotation of five girls at the same time. For some guys, it might be just getting a girlfriend or getting, you know, getting uh, past, you know, getting a kiss or a, or a second date. So it just depends on what, you, what your purpose for it is. It's, it's think so, of it in So, in but terms all of, of those things, all, all of those things that you list though, seem like behaviors you can do to modify the behaviors of women. Um, it's not necessarily to modify the behaviors of women. It's also to modify your own behaviors as well. Right. But so, to achieve the goal of a woman modifying her behavior, well, having sex it, with you, or it, de- it, it depends on what you want to do with it. Mm-hmm. So again, that might be the case for some guys, mm-hmm. for other it guys sounds they like already have women and they want to become a better version of themselves. So it's like maybe their wives want to start fucking them again. Right. It, or it could it sounds, be that it could be that they're using it just so that they can understand their own nature and why did I do that? But I why, don't. Why do I default to this behavior? I don't yeah. want to be accusatory oh, wait, here because I, I like having sex wait, with wait, women wait. is fine as wait, far as I like. I feel like it, it, it sounds like you're describing um, the red pill in your book specifically as kind of like the. I'm sure, have you read the Dictator's Handbook? No, which uh, it's uh, rules for rulers. It's kind of like about you know, Saul, how, it's not Saul Alinsky, right? It's not rules for radicals or anything. No, like no, 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 no. This uh, who wrote rules? Uh, Dictator's Handbook, Adam. Do you remember? Uh, Alistair. Uh, no, I don't remember. Well, whatever. It's a really good book. It's kind of about how like political power works, and it kind of goes through, you know, like the nitty gritty, gross levels of corruption and why corruption exists. It's not advocating for anyone to do anything uh, bad. It's just saying like this is sort of how these. The trappings right. of power work. Right. It right. sounds like that's kind of what you're saying. Like from Bruce North Bueno thing, de Mesquita and Alistair of... Smith is uh, are the author. But go yeah, ahead. Yeah, you're, you're just trying to you're just trying to explain like this is how human behavior works. You know, obviously someone could use it for malicious or for good reasons. Right. 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 It's like uh, 48 Laws of Power. Like when 48 Laws right. of Power first came out, they banned it in prisons, and they thought it was like an instruction manual as to how to become some like political, powerful tyrant. And it's really not. It's just these are the rules, and these are. 48 uh you know rules that robert green came up with he's not saying in fact in the introduction he says you don't have to like clearly there are some of these rules or some of these laws of power that are unethical Mm -hmm. it's not saying you should use these but you should know these in case somebody is using them against you so you can protect it against yourself Mm -hmm. and there's also reversals of them as well so it's like it's in it's information not prescription so how do you um, specifically define the red pill, I guess? Like, what does that mean? Uh, that's, I, I get that so many times. It's like the, everybody wants like a, an elevator pitch for the red pill. I know. Well, it's just because like, I feel like a lot of the conversation is what isn't the red pill. So it's like, well, well what is it then? Um, it's hard to say. I, okay. What, by my 
terminology, my definition, the red pill is strictly about intersexual dynamics. A lot of people will take it and because that's where it began. I can show you posts from back in the so suave days where, you know, it's 2004 and we're specifically referencing the red pill in terms of like, you know, waking up from the quote unquote matrix, which is right. funny to me because we used to get so much grief for using that back then. And now everybody wants to say, oh, the matrix is after us. <laughs> Like now what is um, not repopularized again, but it's a, it's basically thinking yeah. about like your conditioning to understand how the world works, I guess. But in terms of the, what my terminology anyways, is the, the nature of men and the nature of women and how that is sort of used to, to keep you in line or used to keep you in a certain a way of a certain mindset, let's just say. And I think that one of the things that happened during, say, like the, the early 2000s when the Internet started expanding and growing and then we got social media and we're now we're on YouTube kind of thing, uh, is that we're exposed to more information and it's un, it's unignorable now. So we see the nature of women and we see the nature of men every day on on Twitter, on Instagram, on 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 Facebook, wherever wherever your your social media is. So when I talk about the red pill, I'm specifically referring to intersexual dynamics. What does that mean? Well, taking the red pill is sort of like you used to think about, you know, women and men in a certain way. Maybe it was your parents. Maybe it was your church. Maybe it was popular media. And then you realize at some point that what you have thought was true for a long time is not exactly the the, the case. And there's a process of sort of like, I guess, unplugging and, and sort of going through the, the anger phase and going through the resentment phase and then sort of the acceptance phase. It's kind of like the five stages of grief kind of thing. And then understanding that the red pill is not really about hating women. It's about so it's about the red pill doesn't exist. So you will hate women. It exists. So you won't hate women for what they can't be to you, if that makes any sense to you. But it's that when people ask me like, well, give us a give it in a nutshell in five minutes, three minutes, give us the, the down low on on the red pill. Well, in the beginning, it started as guys in the pickup artists and the seduction communities um, wanting to, you know, find a better way to get laid. Whether that was to have a, a you know a, a rotation of women, or it was just to find a girlfriend. Most of the guys in the old PUA move, movement, whatever, uh, wanted to just get a, a girlfriend for the very first time in their lives, and they couldn't understand why they couldn't. And then you know through process of you know experimentation and theory and everything else, that's that it becomes what it is today. But along the way, we we uh, we can apply it to um, uh, evolutionary psychology anthropology sociology uh evolutionary biology i've had to, i've had to like uh study up on like brain science you know neurochemistry uh i've had to study up on endocrinology to know how our hormones work so there's a lot more to it than just like oh here's how you get a girlfriend there's so much more to it so sometimes i'll write um i'll write essays or i'll talk to like say dr richard reeves and we'll be talking about male friendship that relates to a lot of the stuff that I've talked about in the red pill context for a long time. So it's not just, oh, you know, um, high value men cheating and closed on her end, open on his end, whatever it is. I don't even know what it, where we're at with that right now, but it's not just about, you know, getting a, a bunch of girls around a table and, and holding them accountable. There's so much more to it than just that. And that's why I think like the red pill kind of gets short shrift right now because too many people have found too many ways to sensationalize it. And, and, and I, I've dealt with the unsexy parts of the, of the red pill, like male suicide is a really unsexy part of the red pill, but we still have to talk about that because men kill themselves at higher rates. Mm -hmm. than it seems like um, the perception of the red pill from outsiders mm -hmm. is, you know, they'll see a clip of, you know, fresh and fit or Sneeko or someone like that. And they're basically, advocating that you know a man should be able to sleep around with a bunch of women and women should be loyal to a single guy and i think you know that's sort of like the perception a lot of people outside have of, of the red pill and that problem assuming that would give it like a very bad because name that's, for most people. because that's sensational those those kinds of messages mm -hmm. are, are outrage bait it's outrage brokership is what it is the like for instance just on on that topic there um you'll hear myron and fresh or you'll hear uh sneeko or you'll hear um Andrew Tate, hell, even like Kevin Samuels when he was still alive, it was the message was high value men uh, can cheat or will cheat or should cheat. Those are prescriptions. Those aren't that's not descriptions. The red pill is about descriptions. It's not about prescriptions. So when people ask me that, I have to clarify things for them. So when when I was talking about that, 
Um, it was actually from a book called Alpha God by Dr. Hector Garcia. And uh, he broke this down as that uh, powerful men throughout the course of history have had three things. They've had access to resources, they've had territory, and then they've had ac exclusive access to a harem of preferably virginic um, young fertile women. So you've got a harem and you know, Chinese emperors in the Forbidden City, or you've got uh, even if you've got mistresses and you're a king or you're a royalty or nobility in, in, in Western Europe, uh, or your you know, feudal Japan. There's all of those things have carried over into different cultures in throughout human history. So when I break that down, that's informational. I'm saying this is what has defined powerful men throughout the throughout the you know course of history. You give that to Sneeko, and he's going to say powerful men should cheat or high <laughs> men should cheat. And I'm like, <laughs> like that's not what I said. You know, I, I broke it down into into really what Dr. Hector Garcia was talking about at that time. And so it goes from high value men are uh, have access to those three, those three things to high value men should cheat, or you can expect high value men to cheat. And there's a bigger, there's a much broader conversation that's had there, but what do people fixate on? Mm -hmm. You're telling men to go cheat on girls and have a rotation and it's open on his end and closed on their ends. That gets clicks. When I right. talk about like, you know, Dr. Hector Garcia, like, oh, I'm lucky if I got 12,000 views on it. <laughs> sure, sure. No, I mean, listen, I hear you. Um, I mean, and I feel like this is a trap that some people fall into with Evo Psych is, you know, I think Evo Psych is great for describing things. It should rarely be used for prescribing moral claims because, right. I mean, obviously evolution is not only uh, an amoral process, but, you know, if we were to base a morality of you know, on evolution, I think our society would be, you know, not one people would want to uh, live in, you know, people, most people don't want to live in a eugenics based society. Um, and does it, I mean, do you feel that the red pill movement nowadays seems to be dominated at least on its face by like the Andrew Tate's or the people that are prescribing things as opposed to just yeah, prescribing yeah. things? Yeah. Well, and I'll tell you why, because you can't state facts today without telling somebody how to feel about those facts. Right. If you if you say, um, if, for instance, if I explain, I just said a minute ago, if, uh, men kill themselves at three and a half to five times the rate of women, depending on whose numbers you're using. Um, if I state that as a fact, people will, will say, well, well, what about women? Right. That's mm -hmm. like, tell me how to feel about this. Right. Well, what do we do about that? What do what's the you know, why? Why are they like that? And so you'll get a, just a, 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 all kinds of different answers or all kinds of different prescriptions as to either what we should do or why that problem exists in the first place. And usually it's because oh, it's toxic masculinity and they were brought up the wrong way and <laughs> they really need friends. And it's like what they need thera right. Men need therapy. Right. That's the reason why people jump to that is because they need to be told how to feel about that that information now that's just male suicide there's a lot of other you know data little factoids that we throw out in the in the red pill all the time and we're not i think that's probably if there's a if there's a problem with the red pill it's understanding or preempting that need to be like to to tell people how to feel about that so what happens is you get um you get a sneeko or a or an andrew tate or whoever and they state facts but then they either lean into the feels or they lean into, you know, saying here and here's what we ought to do about it. High value men should cheat. That comes from me explaining that high value men throughout the course of history have had the, you know, resources, territory and, and access to to virginic, productively good women. Right. Right. That's right. the fact. Prescription then becomes, well, you ought to do these things. I don't deal right. in oughts. I don't deal in shoulds. And and the red pill in its purest sense should never, it should be factual absolutism. It should not be about, uh, it should be understanding the dynamic and not what to do with that. Because I don't want a cult. I don't want people to be like Tomasi men. I want them to take that information and use it to their best advantage. Because it would be, I would be insulting people to say like, here's a one size fits all solution with using this this information because my culture is different my, my hell my demographic is different than you guys is here so it'd be stupid for me to say here's what you ought to do guys well i don't know what your situation is i don't know where you live i don't know what your background is but here's the factual basis of the red pill go and take this and build something with it so it's like equipping guys and giving them information and education and tools that they might not have otherwise had 
I don't really care about kudos. I don't care about people like pat me on the back for stuff. But what I do care about is what people build with that information. That to me is more satisfying than than people like you know, citing sources and, and calling out my name. I would much rather have them say, here's what I did. Here's how you saved my life. Here's how you changed my life. Here's what I built as a result of this information. So mm -hmm. are there are there main arguments of the red pill movement? Like I've heard you use the term alpha fucks, beta bucks quite mm -hmm. often. And uh, David Buss even references this in his work, but I think has recently um, use a uh, different term though. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Alpha, he, I, I, I have alpha, two ways of alpha fucks, that. Alpha fucks, beta bucks works. I think we all understand what we have. But the, I, the idea is that women have a reproductive strategy where they want to get the best genes from the best alpha male, and they want uh, someone who will be a good stepdad for those genes and provide resources to the kids. And this is... Uh, a popular reproductive strategy in women. And David Buss says, well, yeah, this could happen, but he has recently been in favor of a different theory where women actually, where, yeah, where women are not cheating because they want to, you know, get great genes and cuck mm -hmm. some guy. They actually want to, um, get out of a relationship. They use it. They use affairs as a way to move from one relationship to another, which makes a lot more sense to me. the The thing about the alpha fucks beta bucks thing, I, is that like essential to the red pill movement? Because it seems like the science is kind of unsettled. And if it moves well, more towards this other theory, I'm okay, curious so, where the red pill. So first off, the, the science is very much settled in that. The problem, I, that's one of the reasons I have a problem with David Buss these days is because David Buss has decided that he wants to be a, say, a pop psychologist or a, cel a celebrity rather than a, an academic. Well, I, I mean, he's doing research, so obviously. Oh, he is. He is. And we keep refer and I have this conversation with Mike Sartain all the time because he he really likes David Buss. He, he refers to him all the time. There are other people in evolutionary psychology other than David Buss. <laughs> there are, um, there are, you know, God Saad, for example, uh, Dr. Marty Hazelton. I use her work constantly. I've been using her work since like really the early days, like as far back as like 2007. David she is Sloan a, Wilson, Jonathan Haidt. Yeah, we, well, there's a bunch of people, obviously. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there's, or Steve Stewart Williams is a good one. I, I even reference Rob Henderson now, even though he has, doesn't have, he's almost a doctor, almost Dr. Rob Henderson. Um, but there's a lot of people there's, and, and by the way, that's so, not just the, the only basis of the red pill. So my, my, uh, my question though, is, and it's, you've, it's, I understand that you, so you're saying that it's settled and it's settled in your favor. Let's just say hypothetically, I'm, I'm not saying it is. I'm just saying that hypothetically, um, if well, you, uh, so, I so thought you did, no, let me give you, let me give you my breakdown here. Okay. So alpha fucks beta bucks is based on really the idea of what's called ovulatory shift. What that means is that at different phases of a woman's uh, ovulatory cycle, she prefers to, uh, she has preferences for men with more masculinized features. And then when she's in the luteal phase, let's just say when she's, when the, after ovulation has happened, she's more interested in men who are comfort, like look, look comfortable, look like it's like a nesting phase. It's like a little mini nesting phase for women. And so what they're looking for is guys with more feminized, more more emotional uh, accessibility. They're looking for like the the beta buck side. So there's the alpha fucks and the beta bucks. Right. So when women go through the 28 day cycle of their ovulatory of their ovulatory cycle, there's what's called the proliferative phase, and then there's the luteal phase. The luteal phase is really where when she's already gone through Just, the ov ovulation. We're we're kind of getting in the weeds here because I, well, I, I really you, I really yeah, look. See, I understand yeah. that you mm -hmm. I understand you have an argument in favor of this reproductive mm -hmm. strategy that women want to bring a cuck baby home to their husband. Like <laughs> I understand no, they that don't. You, that's like, that's a that's a thing. That's that's a that's a that's a misnomer right there. Okay. okay. So that's why I have to say this. Well, no, no. If that's if that's the case, we can we can we, without going into all the gory details, we can. You're you're saying that this uh, reproductive strategy is not necessarily a reproductive strategy that the red pill uh, cautions against. Well, the, again, who is again who is quoting this and who is saying this? Well, really, that's that's kind of a fear of like sort of the black pill, uh, MGTOW doomer side of things. Okay, mm -hmm. should I get into a? Uh, a relationship with a woman if all she's going to be doing is looking for a, a bigger and better guy than me. Okay. The high right. program is a straight jacket and, and it's the juice ain't worth the squeeze. And the reason why guys have that mentality is because they don't understand women's nature. 
Women are not, their nature is not to go and look for the high value guy who they can cuck or they, the low value guy that they can cuck with a higher value guy. That's the way that the strategy works out a lot of the times, but it's not necessarily the, there's no like purpose to that. So, so you're, so you're saying it happens, but it happens have, unconsciously. Well, a woman would rather have, ideally, I think pretty much most women would agree with this. Most women would want to get with a guy who is the best of both of those, right? The total package. You of probably course. Heard say that. Yeah. I want to get a guy. Everyone wants to marry up, of course. Yeah. Well, they won't. Well, they marry up, but what is up? So up is I want a guy higher status, more attractive. He's hot. He looks good. He's the he's the perfect blend of alpha fucks and beta bucks. The short term sexual benefits, the genetic benefits, plus long term security benefits, parental investment, provisioning, and protection. So you've got all of those things. Uh, again, when we talk about alpha fucks, beta bucks, I'm not like saying one's negative or one's positive. You can, you can cast them in both lights. What I'm saying is that women are looking, the dualistic nature of women's mating strategy is to get the best genetic material they can to get the the guy with the sexy sons, right? To get the right. guy who was well, taller, looks but, good, is, is in shape, is a good is a good sexual experience for her. And then also have that guy also be the guy who... Uh, protects, provides for her, keeps her, you know, keeps the home fires, you know, keeps the electricity on in the house kind of thing. So ideally, women would like to find a guy who is the best of both worlds. Unfortunately, that's hard to do in an, in a world where there are guys who are very much, um, uh, you know, the, the alpha, alpha guys are not necessarily the guys who are going to want to commit to long-term security. Whereas guys who were ready to, uh, you know, commit to long-term security and and be a better beta experience for that woman, they're not necessarily the most exciting. It's cads versus dads, right? There's the there's the hot guy that you have fun with in your youth and your college days, in you know the hot guy in the foam cannon party in Cancun on spring break, right? And then there's the guy who is the good dad who's been waiting patiently and building himself up, and he's not as fun. He might not be as good looking as the guy that she had fun with in her her uh, her college days, but this guy is better uh, in the long term. So there's kind of two. There's a dichotomy there. So it's not that that alpha fucks beta bucks is one side or the other. Ideally, women would like it to be both. Unfortunately, especially in well, a right, well, society look, that I hate to keep in, interrupting you, okay? But we, we do a little more conversational here and I keep, you're, you're going off on like 10 Please different do. tangents yeah. and I, I, I wanna focus in on this point because I understand what you're saying. You're saying, listen, this is a, you, they want the whole package. They want someone that uh, has high status and is good looking. They can't necessarily get that in one man. So therefore they go to multiple men to, uh, to get the genes from one man and the uh, parental investment from the other man. That is a mm -hmm. cuck situation, is it not? That is literally the situation that's going on here. So yeah. the question that I have is, you know, as a descriptive understanding of the world is this, 1% of women? Is it a half a percent of women? Or is it 35% of women? And I just, from the perception of the red pill, it seems like they would say it's like, oh, that's like 50% of women. And no, I just- 100% of women. Okay, so you, so, so listen, so you're, you're saying, you are saying that the mm -hmm. women 100% of the time go out and do the cuck strategy with men. Okay. You're talking about practice versus what is the innate- mating strategy of women right. well you're which so is hypergamy i understand what well, you're saying it well hy hypergamy is basically trying to get the best mate that you could possibly get it's not this dual strategy where you're you know trying to get a one guy to be the seed and the other guy to be the parental investment like well hypergamy is again just what i described it's the best of the short-term genetic benefits versus the long-term security benefits when we talk Hi, about hypergamy like, is trying to marry above your status that in in the in the classic like dictionary definition of hypergamy yes you're correct right it's trying Spain to marry above that, your status so it's a woman well, it's, who's a six trying to marry an eight right well what what qualifies a guy as an eight is it his financial status right but right. men men don't practice hypergamy men will marry down um an eight will marry a six well status wise <laughs> but maybe not looks wise See, that's a oh yes yeah thinks, so between that's an important point between, thank you so, <laughs> well between the physical side of things and the long-term security side that's why you have to know the difference between alpha fucks and beta bucks that's well, why my, hypergamy is important to understand because all women are hypergamous how they are allowed to express that 
is the real is the key here. So if you have a woman who comes from a very religious society, she's still very much hypergamous, but she's well, only I, I, allowed I don't to dispute. choose based on based on like cultural norms and religious norms. I don't I don't dispute the hypergamy. I the thing that I dispute is because I and I don't really know that we have realistic numbers on this. If you're telling people that 100% of women want to do this cuck strategy, that's going to create massive paranoia in people. That's just, it's going to, so, that's going to yeah, sabotage get, their relationships yes. from the get go. Okay. Let me see if I can explain this. 100% women are not going to actually cuck a guy, but 100% of women are hypergamous. If, does that make sense to you? Well, because, hypergamous means hyper they want to marry up. That doesn't mean that they're, that they also want to fuck up too. Yes. But wait, Fucking up and getting into a stable monogamous relationship is not the cuck strategy. The cuck strategy is literally, as I explained it, it's it's getting two men, one to be the provider and one to be the the genetic material for the offspring. That's okay. So what you're what you're describing here is two different things. One is the practice, and one is the the principle. Let's just say so. Hypergamy is the principle. Meaning, and by the way, when I talk about uh, alpha fucks, beta bucks is not. Hypergamy. Alpha fucks beta bucks is exactly hypergamy. No, but let's so let's separate hypergamy. You're you're saying hypergamy is this two mate option, and I'm looking at hypergamy as just wanting to marry up in a monogamous relationship. That's because, that's Both of those things are hypergamy. Relationship perspective. So again, from the dictionary. Okay, so hypergamy. The word hypergamy came from a sociologist back in the 50s or the 60s who was studying the caste system in India at that time. So mm -hmm. women had the tendency to marry out of one caste into a higher caste. That's why he called it hypergamy. It's a serviceable word. If you want to just call it something else, that's fine. But it's really the dualistic nature of women's mating strategy. Short-term sexual benefits, genetic benefits versus long-term security benefits. Sometimes the strategy, the marketing, whatever it is, the, the, the practice of achieving the best result of, for both of those can be cuckoldry. So let me explain. Right, one more right, one right. Other. But my question is, how often is it that? That's the question David Buss is asking. That's the question that people want to know well, because the, that's the a question that creates all the uh, paranoia in men. Yeah, and then I think that that's one of the things that like guys like David Buss would like to find sort of some sort of hedge against. So when you talk about like say Jordan Peterson or Dr. David Buss, and they're talking, they want to find some way to sort of uh, let's say buffer the the more the uglier side of hypergamy. They only focus on what you're focusing on right now, which well, is uh, long-term relationships and the beta buck side of women's mating strategy, rather than focusing on the side where it's the hot guy in the foam cannon party, right? The guy who is the the best genetic guy that they really want to have, is they really want to bang. Hypergamy. I you, you keep saying hypergamy, hypergamy, but I don't think you're using the the, the definition correctly. Well, okay, I, okay, hypergamy. Let's call, let's call hypergamy. The dual no, the, the, dual the dual mating strategy. strategy is different than hypergamy. Hypergamy is wanting to have a wanting to have sex or wanting to have a relationship with someone that is higher than you in status. Well, okay. I, I, okay. Let me. Let me um, the dual mating me, strategy is getting two mates to serve different purposes in one relationship. Te tell me if this is what you're saying, Rolo. You're saying that. Basically, women have hypergamy. Have evolved to have hyper. Have women have evolved to have hypergamy be like their main mating strategy? But a way in which that and hypergamy just means women want to marry up. But a way that that can manifest in our world is through dual mating strategy. Not that they're necessarily the intrinsically same thing. So over the course of really the last ten or fifteen years, we've expanded the definition of hypergamy. So if you want to call it dualistic mating strategy, alpha fucks, beta bucks, fine. But when we when I refer to hypergamy, it refers to both the marrying up and the fucking upwards in the in uh, in, in status, uh, wanting a better than merited sexual experience or a better than deserved merit. Uh, if you're looking at like things in terms of a sexual economy, when you're looking at the sexual marketplace, you've got a guy who is. Uh, a seven and the woman's a seven, she's looking for a guy who's going to be an eight. Whether that guy is, whether you judge an eight as being the guy who's got a better job, better, higher status, uh, would be a better long-term relationship, or the guy is just simply better looking, 
they're still you're still looking at the status going upwards. So if you want to call it dualistic mating strategy, fine. But in the red pill, we just simply call it hypergamy. If you think that that's a a, a mischaracterization of the definition, then we can just call it uh, you know dualistic mating mm -hmm. strategy. Well, you can practice hypergamy without the dualistic mating strategy, obviously. Well, here, the problem with that is that when you're looking at the the base innate mating strategy of women, it is dualistic. There is the alpha fucks and the beta bucks side of things. The problem is, is most guy most guys who want to study this or guys who have a critic a critique of this only focus on the beta buck side. So wait, a minute, I'm, I guess I'm confused because I thought you said, like, if you say that hypergamy is the primary female mating strategy, and mm -hmm. just meaning only that women want to marry up. I like okay. I, that right, makes sense to me. Let's, I understand. Let's, let's back up. The, the right. dualistic mating strategy: alpha fucks, beta bucks. That's women's innate mating strategy. No, but so but so I you're saying specifically only with one side? Then we could call it. Then we could say, okay, well, that's just the beta buck side. Well, well wait. Well, the, I'm saying there's there's two different things here. I could understand that women generally want to marry up, and women evolved as a sex to want to marry up, mm -hmm. and then when they're in certain situations. Um, where maybe that's not applicable or they are married to someone and then they realize they want to, you know, move beyond that person's status, mm -hmm. it could create the dual mating strategy situation. But that's very different than saying, no, the specific dual mating strategy of I want to marry someone who is a beta and fuck someone who's an alpha. That's that's, that's a little not bit different thing, right? Yeah. That's a little bit different concept. Okay. So I guess so I'm, let's I'm just, confused the, as to which one you're saying is that, okay. the primary so the way strategy. that we reference that is that is hypergamy. Okay, if you want to call that like for the, well, for, no, the for the well, sake no, no, of, I, I don't, I don't wait, wait, I don't care what, what I don't, I don't care what you call it. I'm just I'm asking. So you're saying specifically that the dual mating strategy, wanting to do this, is that's the thing you're talking. That is what every woman innately yes. wants to do. One hundred percent. Yes. Okay. All women are dualistic mating strategists. How's that? Does that sound better? Well, be but so I don't know because to me that doesn't that doesn't seem like that would make sense. Like like if a woman marries someone who fulfill, checks all those boxes, like obviously she's not going to be engaged in the dual mating strategy, right? Well, to get to that point in the first place, she's mm -hmm. using a dualistic mating strategy. Oh, she yeah. has to climb. She has to climb the ladder. No, no so here, here's here's what I'm saying. Okay, <laughs> let, let me let's see if I can clarify this a little bit okay. better because I know Dr. Bustle is very fond of the uh, the mating mate switching strategy. The problem with that is you have to be mated to switch in the first place. Right. So if the woman is single and the man is single, what is in play at that point? Is it the mate switching strategy, or is it he looks hot? And I want to get with this guy. It's it, what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Or is it? Uh, I really want to have. I really want to get with this guy because I want to have. A, I want to have babies with him and start a family with him. Well, with with Bus, I mean, he was specifically talking about affairs, so that would only apply to exactly. People in he's not talking right? about. He's not talking about what happens before there. You have to have a relationship for there to be an affair in the first sure. place. So. Right. And uh, my my argument is this, is that the, the ovulatory shift model that Dr. Marty Hazelton, who also, by the way, is a student of Dr. David Buss, uh, it was it's very popular right up until a point where we get into the crisis of replicability and more women get into psychology. And there's there's a lot of there's a lot of, of politics that go on behind all that. But what I'm saying is this, is that you don't get to mate switching hypothesis unless you've already made it in the first place, unless you've got like a, a, a monogamous relationship going on there. Mm hmm. And they, my my original question was like, how essential is this alpha fucks beta bucks to the red pill philosophy? That was my original question. So, okay, I just, well, first off, the red pill is not a philosophy; it's a what? it's a praxeology. A praxeology, so, okay. So the, the it's a praxeology, and how are you defining that? What is what do you mean by praxeology? praxeology it's like that, it's human behavior, study of human behavior, in that it has a purpose, in that there is right. something motivating it. What's the what's the point of it? Okay, so it's it's. Like That's praxis, exactly. when they talk about well, praxis, is like educating. A f I just I feel like if uh, you can look it up on uh, hell, we have I've actually defined it in several of my books already. No, that's okay. I'll, I'll look it up. Go ahead. Yeah, have well, a look who, at it. Yeah, um, who, I don't care about the sure. either way. Yeah, either way. Yeah, it's, it the idea is this. I I understand your concern, Adam, about like guys who go they they get real nihilistic because they think that they're never going to measure up or there's going to be some some guy's going to walk into the party and take and steal your girl, right? He, he's better off than you are, and so she's going to cheat. And that, that is, well, you're basically saying 100% of men, women are cheaters. 100% of women are dualistic mating strategists. That's cheaters, that. yeah, cheaters. They're looking to cheat. That doesn't necessarily mean that they will. Right. 
But see what I'm saying? They're they've evolved to, but they might not do it. But put it this way: how many how many women went to go see Aquaman when uh, Jason Momoa was in Aquaman? How many were suddenly became like DC comics autos as a result <laughs> of that? Right? Does that mean they're going to go cheat on their boyfriends after they watch Aquaman? Probably right. not. No. But they want to go see Jason Momoa. They, they, that's another reason why we have like say body positivity for women, but we don't have it for men. So mm -hmm. when, when, when we're looking at the, the hot guy that women want, like there's the sexual nature, the visual sexual, nature, visceral, I guess should say sexual nature of women. Does that mean that they can all practice? No, it doesn't. It's like they, they, most women can't do that, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they don't want to do that. See what I'm saying? Well, so it's kind of like, you know, like guys, you know, look at porn or yeah. whatever. It doesn't mean that they're going to cheat on yeah. whoever they're with. Because cheating is a to... practice. That's right. why it's not, the, it's not the, what's the, what's the motivator there, you know? So, so I, let me, let me see if I can understand. So it's like, basically like the idea is like, oh, you know, men like a lot of sexual variety, supposedly. And this is the idea that, you know, supposedly to... sitch, do we well, need okay, a I'm just peer reviewed listen. study on that? Yeah, one? Yeah. Peer -reviewed know, study. Men's, men's innate mating strategy is unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. Right, right, right. And so that's why men, you know, even if they're in a good relationship, maybe they'll still look at porn or whatever, mm -hmm. you know, cause they have this innate desire. That doesn't necessarily mean that the man's going to cheat. It's just that this innate desire. And you're saying that women's version of that is essentially the dual mating strategy. Exactly. That Okay. Exactly. So, okay. so again, like I was saying before, you can say, I, I've heard guys tell me this before, like, well, not in my culture, the women in my culture know they're in control of their hypergamy, whatever. I'm like that doesn't mean they're not still hypergamous it, or dualist mating strategy. Sorry, let's clarify terms here. Um, but it does mean that they, that it doesn't mean that they're all equally capable of doing all that. And then again, as women age, as women age out of that that prime window of their fertility, that prime window of youth and beauty and everything else, they are less able to to work work within the confines of a dualistic mm -hmm. mating strategy. So how does that affect women's ability to go and do those things? So there's all those variables in there that a lot of people who are critics of this don't really take into consideration or the guys who are like the gloom and doomers who are like, oh, I don't know, you know it's a, I, why, the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Well, yeah, maybe when she's 22 and doing OnlyFans, but when she's 32 or she's 42, her priorities are going to change because she's less able to, you know, be marketable on the sexual marketplace. Mm -hmm. Well, it's interesting because, like, you know, when we talk about the the male strategy of just, you know, to fuck everything, essentially, spread your seed as much as you can, like, that's obviously an evolved tendency in males far before humans ever came around. Like, that's, you know, that's been a mating strategies for males in all species for, you know, millions of years. You know, it's funny is people don't have any problem accepting that. Right, but I think that's because it's so... They have a problem so... accepting, like, dualistic mating strategy, but they don't have any problem accepting the fact that men want unlimited access to women. Right. Well, I think there's two reasons. One is obviously because there's this huge pushback against men because of, you know, feminist movement and all this stuff. Um, so there's a lot of one-sided feelings and rhetoric in sexual dynamic relationships uh, because of that. Uh, but so what I was going to say is that, like, with men, I can see this because it's kind of like this evolved trait that seems to, you know, be going back millions of years. But for the dual mating strategy, that would have to be, I think that would have to be specifically something that evolved in humans. That wouldn't be a pre-human evolution. Okay. Would you um, like, okay. I can, I can answer that question with a little bit of evolutionary biology now. Okay, sure. So um, if you, Adam, if you want to go look this up, you can. Um, there's been studies recently within the last, I would say, year or so that, um, that show that a, uh, the, a female human ovum will select different men's sperm at the site of conception. Right. So yeah. There are, so if there are, if there are more than one man's sperm at that, po at that point, eggs will have a, a, uh, an ability to slow down or to speed up the selected sperm at that time. The only reason, the only way you get that adaptation is if there's enough of differing men's sperm at the site of conception <laughs> that that it would be a necessity or be an evolutionary adaptation so what that says it le now there are lots of this, this correlation not causation i understand that mm -hmm. but adaptations like that happen as a result of the fact that there are multiple men's sperm in at the site of conception you could say well that's as a result of forced sexual copulation you could say that as well but the fact of the matter remains is that the female ovum selects sperm, and it might not even be the sperm that the woman herself uh, uh, selects because that's who she wanted to be with. It's not a conscious that process. Happens, that okay. happens because men and women are promiscuous. Well, yeah. okay. So, but I mean, that would, because I remember, 
I didn't remember that. I remember like a while ago, they were talking about how, you know, for years they thought, you know, whatever this, the first sperm reaches the egg, that's the one that fertilizes it. And then they're like, well, actually they realized that the, the egg has some ability to kind of choose, um, it's much more, kind of... much more selective and much more complex than that. There right. Was a, but there used to, be, used to be a book called Sperm Wars, I think is what it was called. And there was this idea that there were like really the fast swimmers and there was the combat sperm and everything else. And then they finally yeah. found out that that's all horse shit. It's actually the ovum that's that or the, the egg that is actually selecting which one by slowing it down or speeding it up. Uh, depending on on which is more, I guess the biological or, or I don't know. I don't pretend to be like an endocrinologist or know any of this stuff. How long? How long do sperm have to get to the egg? Because I mean, I think if you had two different male sperms competing for the same egg, they'd have to be pretty close sexual, you know, proximity. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that would also point. I would strengthen the argument for the fact that adaptations like that occur because that is an innate mating strategy because women are hoes sitch well no it's, just, it's hard that's the takeaway it's hard for me to imagine that in like uh you know humans existed as hunter-gatherer cave people for you know a million years or hundreds of thousands of years long before you know our farming and domesticated animals and like in today's world you know men and women in our society is complex and large enough that i could understand women having amp women and men having ample opportunity to cheat but i feel like for the hundreds of thousands of years that we were living in bands of like 20 to 40 to 50 people, I think cheating in this sorts of promiscuity would be significantly more difficult to pull off. Well, why would you think that? Because Unless everyone today, knows, like everyone's like, oh, where's my wife? We live in smaller oh, groups. where's John? Yeah, you can, like, you, can you know, make the argument that because we lived in smaller groups, like uh, tribes were much smaller, like 100, 150 people, mm -hmm. you can make that argument as well. However, the biology still remains the same. And Adam, to answer your question, it's not it's not just because women are hoes. It's because guys want unlimited access to unlimited sex. Guys are hoes too. Yeah. So I'm how they know. remember? Sometimes men's mating strategy is pretty ugly as well. well. I think the men are the ones doing the dual mating strategy. I think the men are the ones that are trying to cuck other men. I I I'm very yeah, skeptical of the dual mating conclusion? strategy. How do you come to that conclusion? Well, it's the men that are trying to have sex with married women and stuff, right? They're the ones that are trying to send her home with a cuck baby. They're trying to have sex with who the men are, tend to be much more opportunistic breeders, let's just say. Right, yeah. <laughs> Not married. There's a reason why pornography today is free, ubiquitous, 4K streaming online, and, and it's the, the biggest addiction and biggest sedation that we've ever released on mankind mm -hmm. because it works. Well, the dual mating it, strategy it, has it, problems, it, it, though. Look, if, well, if you're if you're a woman and you're practicing the dual mating strategy and you're going for like the alpha Chad, like the alpha Chad could be a dullard. He could not have the brain power to actually become as successful as the person that she's married to. So right. why does she want to raise a a a excellent looking dumbass <laughs> when she's got a super genius at home with great <laughs> DNA? Why does she want to do that? Makes a lot of sense. Makes a lot of reasonable sense. Right. Well, it, it does. Like, it, it does. sounds like the rational look, way of thinking look, about and it. And I think women, when they consider, you know, <laughs> someone that they're going to marry and have children with, they probably factor that in. Probably kindness and intelligence probably factor sure. in. You would think like, that, right? I would think that. <laughs> well, you're saying that these are all these are all unconscious, rational processes, right? Yeah. Well, but, but I'm, I'll throw out a, a couple other terms here as well. Is I think that no, no no guy has ever reasoned or rationalized his way into a woman's bed. Put it that way. <laughs> no, no guy says, you know what, honey, let me give you here. I got a spreadsheet over here. And let's say I've been to college. I make X amount of money. I come from an excellent family. I want kids in the next four to five years. I have, I like puppy Some... dogs, I like rainbows and Disney and all this other crap. And so clearly I'm the best choice to be fucking instead of that hot guy in the phone cannon party on spring break, you were drunk. He was cute. And one thing led to another. Have yeah, you seen, well, have you seen Scott yeah, Adams ex wife? You are right. You're a hundred percent right. But it have, doesn't work that way. Have you well, seen no, 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 Have no, you wait, seen wait, Scott wait. Adams' ex-wife? Because I'm sure a spreadsheet came out at some time <laughs> dur <laughs> during that relationship. That okay, that's yeah. That's, that's, but no, no. So it wouldn't be it wouldn't be a rational process, obviously. But you would think, mm -hmm. you know, if this is an evolved tendency, you know, the it would be selecting for whoever is going to provide the best offspring. And you know, it seems like think. a lot of times when these conversations are talked about. It's only talked about in terms of like, oh, well, the best offspring is going to be like the hottest guy, which I don't think that's true. And I don't think that's ever been true in the human species. There's so many different factors that you think 
uh, mm -hmm. evolution would be selecting for to, to for fitness rather than sure. just you know the guy with the good well, brow ridge let's, or uh, let's we can also go be, we can go back to biology for that as far back as what eight thousand years ago right like pre or post agrarianism um one man for every 17 women reproduced so when we have that because we have the records of genomic records of that and uh, here's just something you probably heard a million times. I hate this, but like here's something you probably heard. Well, many that's, societies I, are polygamous, so obviously that's yeah, the reason obviously. for that. Yeah, yeah. clearly, clearly. Mm -hmm. But so but it, it, in that case, again, it kind of goes back to what I was saying before about like, you know, high value men having multiple. Yeah, but like polygamy, so, I mean, I think doesn't polygamy can only really exist once you have farming. I don't know if it could exist pre-farming. No, it existed pre-farming. Um, you can go, uh, hell, you can go to the Old Testament. Father Abraham, what did he have? He had the, No, but they were, yeah, but they're farming. I mean, that's farming nomadic, and domesticated they're, animals. They're, at that point. They, I, I shouldn't even use that because they, they're kind of switching between the two. That's like just on the cusp of agrarianism. But like, I mean, if you go back and you look at like, what do you have? Two wives and God knows how many maid servants. <laughs> um, there, you know, polygamy has, as a marriage, is a way of uh, organizing society and organizing marriages has been around for quite some time. So you might have a case there that, that the, the fact of the matter is, is that it could be war. Men tend to kill each other far more than 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 women do. Mm -hmm. um, they also tend to take women as spoils of war, too. So there's there's that aspect, too. Uh, so yeah, because like a lot of ways you can sort of you right. you can work, work around that. It's not that the woman is selecting just one guy. But the fact remains is that one man reproduces for every 17 women that reproduce as far now it's it's narrowed down to modern times which is one man for every seven women today so uh if you look at the genomic records you can see that 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 was the case well okay one man for every hmm. yeah because i mean i guess pre-farming the only way to get i mean i think the only way to get another wife would be you know you go to the neighboring tribe of hunter gatherers and you kill the men and you take right. you know you take their one by force you, you sail down the but, uh the coast of uh, the north sea and just well, right. I mean, it's pre, you know, i'm thinking like pre-boats but um mm -hmm. like it but even that i think that'd be a much more dangerous thing because there's no guarantee that the woman you mm -hmm. just killed her husband and her shot and her baby boy that she's not gonna sleep with that, while right? sleeping. That's, that's what's called the war brides dynamic um yeah. they, and again in uh dr hector garcia's book uh, alpha god uh, he explains this like if you go and you look in the Old Testament, for example, God tells the 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 his people of the tribes of Israel, you know, go in and kill this tribe right here, kill all the men, kill all the boys, kill all the women that have known a man, and take the virgins for yourself. Right, dude. Yeah. Sitch, I don't okay. want to interrupt you, but what I still was, have a bunch of questions. That? So sure, sure. Mm -hmm. Sitch, are you, do you want to? Yeah, no, go for it. Okay, the so the Alpha Bucks. The alpha fucks, beta bucks thing. That's like a central idea of the red pill praxology. Mm -hmm. The is, are there other are there other main ideas, or is that like the the main oh, idea? No, there, that's that's one of many. Okay. Um, so as far as understanding women's day, like I would just named one a minute ago, which is the the war brides dynamic, which is is uh, it's almost like Stockholm syndrome. It's mm -hmm. women have had to over the course of history because they've been taken as spoils of war. Um, have had to uh, find ways to adapt to their captors. And one of the ways women do that is they exist in tribe and women have this, what, what I call the sisterhood uberalis, right? Where it's this uh, this solidarity between women because they give birth and they, they uh, nurture the next generation. They're the berry pickers, right? Hunter gatherers, men are the ones that go hunt and women are the ones that stay home and 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 nurture and have have more things like egalitarianism for example is a much more female way of thinking than a men's way of thinking which is much more hierarchical and the reason for that is simply because of biology women are the vulnerable sex and men are the really the disposable or sacrificial sex and so when uh when uh, one tribe goes in kills off the whole tribe takes the women women have two choices they can either go die with their men or they can be integrated into the the conquering tribe so over the course of history, what uh, psychologically what's happened is uh, evolution selects for women who are able, better able, to let go of their 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 old kin, let's just say, and be integrated into a new tribe. This then, of course, comes out as the uh, what we call the um, the war brides dynamic, which is like you can also see this like even as as far back as like say World War II, where we have women who are like say uh, Dutch women or French women who uh got with the the german soldiers at that time because they thought that they were going to be the winning that was going to be the winning tribe so they have kids with them or they have their you know they're having sex with them or they're they're forming relationships with german soldiers because they thought that they would be the the winners in that war turns out they weren't and so what do they do they shave their heads and they shame them 
And of course, they just killed the guys who were the collaborators. But how, how's this? Uh, how's this affect modern culture? Like, what's well, the it, what's okay, the takeaway? So, Women get over it quicker in breakups. Yes. Is that where yeah. we're going? Women have an ability to let go emotionally, especially if the guy is not someone who was like a high value guy in the first place. Mm -hmm. If the guy was more beta or whatever, it's much easier for women to get over relationships than it is for well, guys. It's, I'm sure it's much easier for men to get over relationships too. If the girl is a four and you start dating a 10, I mean, True. Like... It's, also, it's also much easier. Like people say, well, cads have an easier time of getting over situation, but most men aren't that way. But I, I don't think most that's are a, not like a top, top are, are not top, uh, players right Let's i don't think it. it's a predisposition towards getting over it it's a like you went from one circumstance and then you went to a much better circumstance obviously you're going to get over mm -hmm. it quicker i'm not sure that women would just get over it if she's if she goes from like an eight to a two like she's going to be like pining Again. away for her ex well, that's another, that's a, a good, another observation as well as what we call the alpha widows. Okay. Mm -hmm. It's, it's the woman who can't get over. But that's a contradiction to the war brides. No, it's not. I, I can explain. I, I've actually written full, like, like, like a couple of essays on war brides and uh, that how it, how it dovetails in actually with. Uh, well, with, is, uh, is there another one? So we've got the dual mating strategy. We've got the war brides. Women get over it faster. What is uh, what what is some other um, big okay, idea? Okay, so here's you want here's the biggest misnomer I think that I I, I hear from people uh, is the eighty twenty rule. Mm -hmm. Okay, people think that it's um, analogous to the Pareto principle. Now, we call it the Pareto principle, but it's only because it's eighty and twenty. So what it what that describes is this: is that eighty percent of men, roughly, depending on whatever research you're looking at, mm -hmm. roughly eighty percent of men are deemed as unattractive by women, mm -hmm. and and so and not. Not maybe he'll do, not, oh, there might be in the running as unattractive. That leaves 20% of guys who are not necessarily attractive, but they might be acceptable depending on what it is that they do. You said then, this is a misnomer, though. I, I, I'm telling you it's a misnomer because okay. I, I'll, I'm giving you the real answer here first. Because most guys will say this. They'll say, well, uh, those guys in the red pill, they don't know what they're talking about because it's 80% uh, of guys are – or 20% of guys are fucking 80% of the women, and they just completely get it ass backwards because it's in their interest to get it ass backwards. So what I'm saying here is that 80% of guys are unattractive. These are the 80 percenters. These are the guys who have to figure out some way – to become more valuable or to make themselves more attractive so they can at least get into the 20% of guys who are maybe they'll do. Now, then there are the four and a half percent of guys who women are find attractive enough to actually initiate something, at least online or in, in real life. Four and a half percent of guys are attractive enough for women to want to share that guy. Those are the real alpha guys, right? Those are the guys that women will like compete with other women to get with that guy or you know, knowingly or unknowingly share that guy who's in that four and a half percent. That's the, that's the real 80, 20 rule right there. It's not about like 20% of guys are banging 80% of the women or whatever it is. 100% of women want to get with the top 10%, top 20% of guys. It's not about 80, 20 for women. It's about 100. Like again, go back to the, the dual mating strategy. Women want a guy who is above them or like as, as far above them as they can possibly get. So you've got a woman who's like, say, a, a six, and you got a guy who's a six. That guy better bring something else to the table because that woman is looking for a seven or above. She can get something higher than that. But if the guy is a six, he can still form a relationship with her, but he's got to have some money. He's got to have something else going, some sort of value added going for him. Men, on the other hand, as you were describing before, don't have – attraction floors women have an attraction floor and it's usually at whatever they think they deserve on that so sexual market value scale right there so if a guy like i said is like a lateral move for a woman that guy better have some value added and then again that's not static and that's what sort of promotes this idea that guys are just like doomed is they think that this if i'm a six and she's a six we're always going to be that way no over time well, yeah obviously might drop he might go up it just kind of depends he might get, you know, he might get in better shape, whatever the, the criteria ends up being. But the fact of the matter is, is that dualistic mating strategy, whatever you want to call it, there is the woman is, if she's a six, she's looking for a seven, an eight or a nine, if she can possibly get to that. If she's with a guy who's her equal, he's looking for, she's looking for for a guy who has a little bit more value added in it. 
So we uh, maybe I can call this hyper hypergamy because you're saying 100% of women <laughs> okay, want we'll the, call it that. <laughs> want the top want the absolute top 10%. Mm -hmm. So I 20%, just 20% will do four and a half percent is the one that when is those guys are the six foot tall. So what is the modern takeaway? Like, mm -hmm. look, I'm let's just say I'm a six and I'm I just want a wife and a family and I'm looking for a you know a six. I'll go five. Adam, you're if, at least a six point five. Don't sell yourself. I'll go. I'll go five. Well, I'm just hypothetically, you know. <laughs> okay. I'm. I just. I think obviously, the world is better. My perception is the world is better if people you know, separate themselves into couples that are going to, you know, be, that are going to work, that are going to be equally matched because you're going to get the most happiness out of that. Like if you, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're a five and you date, uh, um, you know, a eight and a half or a nine, like we talked, I brought up Scott Adams because Scott, so Scott Adams is this like crotchety old dude and he has a, <laughs> supermodel Instagram wife. And I'm going, well, that can't last forever, obviously, because <laughs> she's way out of his league. This mm -hmm. is insane. Right. So that's yeah, not I, a, that's not a stable relationship. You know that they, you know that they divorced, right? Yes, I do. Yeah, obviously. Right. I, you, I mean, I said that was going to happen a no. year before it ever happened. And you, you, you don't know the connection between her and Andrew Tate, do you? Well, uh, so I've heard that, well, <laughs> I've heard from a lot of from him that that's all made up. So yeah. but, I have the I have the I have the tweets to prove otherwise. Let's well, just I only I only I only <laughs> I only bring it up to to you know make the example that yeah. people would be happier if they hit in their own league. If they were like I, if they had realistic expectations of where they're going in life and who they are and and their abilities and their attractiveness, and they looked for a mate that matched that and tried to form some sort of happy relationship so i understand like there's th there's a lot of stuff that the red pill people say that kind of stands in the way of people taking those sort of realist realistic expectations of life like if you if you live in a world where you think look women are always going to try to be um marrying up and they're literally going to be looking for some alpha chad to fuck behind my back and you say I am a I am a five, I'm a six I will marry a five, you're mm -hmm. still gonna constantly have that doubt in your mind that okay I married a five but she wants an eight or she wants a a ten and a half and not only that she's gonna bring this cuck baby home to my house and I'm gonna be raising them you're creating all of this giant paranoia in people and. That's just going to sabotage their relationships potentially. Okay. One, one. That's not the red pill. That's more like black pill doomers who are. That's really the okay, more extreme okay. end of the MGTOW thing. Remember, men the going their own way. Exactly. The, yes. the red pill describes. So when I talk about like trad cons, when I talk about black pill, when I talk about MGTOW, MRAs, those are all prescriptions. This is how you ought to live your life. They mm -hmm. they draw from the same information that it, that the red pill presents to them right how they interpret that and how they use that to create their own prescriptions that's set apart from from the red from the information that the red pill puts out well, there but at the same time you're saying look i'm asking you for the big ideas in the red pill you're saying the dual mating strategy the mm -hmm. war bride strategy as in mm -hmm. when she leaves you she's going to get over it quicker none of mm -hmm. these are none of these are ideas that are going to you know calm people down in a relationship they're going to turn guys into like mate guarding uh, how you, chastity you, belt buying how you, how you choose to use that data and that information is up to the individual well, whether or not this information though is true is mm -hmm. valuable like if if this is a case where this dual mating strategy is practiced by 0.005% of the population and you believe that it's practiced by 100% of the population you're going into an atmosphere you're going into an environment that's completely different than the one that you're perceiving what I'm saying is that the nature of men and women does the nature of the machine doesn't change how it's applied does. Mm -hmm. So the way that we, the way that that women use that uh, use that dual nature, like for instance, prior well, to the we're arguing though whether or not that's true, whether or not it exists. I understand that. Yeah, but here's the thing: is that even let's just say let's just say for sake of argument right here that that is true. That it does exist. Okay. Prior to the sexual revolution, how was that expressed in women? Well, they couldn't because they were dependent upon men. You want to know why feminism has has taken taken off since the the sexual revolution? It's because now we have changed the game 
in women's advantage with hormonal birth control, really. But prior to that, you had to you had to find your husband through the church. You had to find your husband through through social circles. You had to find your husband through a, a way in a much different fashion. Like for instance, like today we have what is it? Forty two percent of babies are born out of wedlock today. Prior to like say nineteen sixty, that was the greatest sin and shame that you could bring upon a family is to have a have a bastard child. Now it's a a point of pride to have something like that. So what I'm saying is that the the social context and the norms that used to be are no longer around now. The way that you can express the dualistic mating strategy in 1950 is way different than we how you can do it in like say 2015 or 2023. So right. when we're talking about what's best practices, back then, best practices were to to you know find your husband at church and Bible study or whatever you know at work or who knows where maybe probably school right. And the average age of first marriage was what, 19 for women and 22 for men. Now it's uh, 29 for men and 28 for women or uh, like 30 for men and 29 for women. I can't, I, my last numbers were. But the, the the fact of the matter is, is that we've changed the social narrative and changed the context. And in doing so, we've made it so that women can express that uh, that innate nature in a much more and much freer way of doing it. It's an unfettered way. So just, I just I fundamentally disagree with the fact that you can call that nature innate. Like human behavior differs from pe from person to person. So the idea that this strategy is so you don't you don't think that there are any there are any things about our behavior that is you that is like universal that, that this is how humans work. Definitely, there are things, but obviously culture puts a thumb on those things and and tries to modify uh, behaviors so that's, that'll that's, be that's, that's basis on that's a basis on social constructionism. And that's that, I think that's one of the, the like if you go and you knock out the the legs of emotionalism, social constructionism, the blank slate, and probably I don't like, look. I'm not a, I'm not a black blank slater, but you've got to admit that there are like human institutions are all cultural constructions. Like the whole idea behind marriage and monogamy culture, is, culture a, is a cultural down, construction. Cultural is a cultural influences society. Culture exists downstream from human nature. Right, but, but culture serves serves the genes in a very evolutionary way. Like, Does obviously. It? Yeah, yeah. You, okay, we don't have to argue about that. I was going to say, well, say the machine stays the same. We were just, we were just at a minute ago. It's but like no, we, we, there's for like 200,000 years. We're not. We're still the same critters that we're. There on the are site, polygamous societies, though, and there are there are polygamous societies, and there are monogamous societies. Obviously, those are different cultural conventions, and those cultural conventions produce a certain type of society that has a certain mm -hmm. crime rate, a certain con level of conflict, a certain type of politics. Like these are. Uh, our cultural constructions. So, Sitch, you want to say something? Well, I was going to say, um, I mean, obviously, you know, neither me nor Adam are blank slaters or social constructionists. I mean, we argue against leftists who put these theories, you know, all the time. Um, but, I mean, I'd assume that you agree that, yeah, I mean, culture is downstream of biology. I wouldn't disagree with that. But that, I mean, I think the way that we look at it is that essentially successful societies seem to offload moral questions that are not necessarily rooted in biology into culture to sort of either curb or generally more sublimate kind of anti-social behaviors into pro-social behaviors. And that seems to be what successful societies do is they kind of like, you yeah. know, I think that's why capitalism and liberalism kind of works is it's able to channel a lot of negative selfishness and negative human innate behaviors into things that end up being, you know, overall productive and good for society. I would, I would agree with that depending on the environment in which they're, they're cultivated or of curated, course. just of say, course, right. Um, of simply course. because like, um, I, and again, I hate to keep, well, no, I think it was, uh, uh Steve Stewart Williams. He has a really great book called the ape that understood the universe. Yeah. And it's a great book. Section, yeah. yeah. There's, so you were, you know, the section about the, um, uh, where he talks about memetics and how how memes evolved, and by mm -hmm. memes I mean like not like the memes you see on online. Yeah, like Dawkins. You know. Yeah, ideas, yeah. Um, ideologies. It could be it could be something as simple as a song or something that's passed on from generation to generation, or it could be an idea or a religion or a concept or philosophy um, that's passed on. And the more successful ideas stick around, and the right. the, the ones that are dead memes usually kill the host. So, <laughs> <laughs> sure. yeah, exactly. Well, for example, like I think they use this one. I think it was like when the British or the French were invading like uh, 
colonizing, I should say, of, of uh, Africa. And there were tribes in Africa who believed that if they prayed to their God hard enough that the bullets would pass right through them because they didn't have they didn't have guns back then. Not a good culture. That yeah. meme died out with the people who got killed as a result of that. So there's right. uh, there's an idea that was a cultural idea that was very bad for the culture that believed in it at that time. So but you're making the you're making the argument though, obviously. If the if that cultural idea served the genes, it would have lived on though. Yes, but the, the again the idea the whole the whole point of that is survival though. So what is the what is the the root I said the latent purpose of that ideal that idea or that meme or that ideology to right. begin with. Is it to serve uh survival? Is it to serve reproduction? Uh you can really Both. kind of break it down into into those those things but again those memes that culture is downstream from the basic need of the machine to reproduce find food you know and stay alive of course but as you, you know in the example you brought forward with the people crying for the bolts to pass through them i mean you, culture it can be significantly powerful enough in certain situations that it you know can seeming to override even basic survival mm -hmm. instincts or trick people into you know doing things that are incredibly dangerous mm -hmm. so I mean, I think a lot more people, I, I guess what I'm, I'm trying to get at here is that I feel like the red pill, I know that you're saying it's kind of just descriptive, but it mm -hmm. feels like, at least from people not in the red pill, at least who we see, maybe this is the bias of kind of the anti-red pill movement, but I feel like we just get you know inculcated with this, uh, people that are not just saying, oh, this is like a descriptive reality. People are saying, oh, this is the way it is. Women engage in these dual mating strategies. So therefore, you know, fuck women, you know, they suck. We should be able to fuck whoever we want. We have to make guard super hard. It seems like the red pill movement's kind of, from what my perception is, it's just kind of filled with people making these negative prescriptions based off of these descriptions, as opposed to what I think would be more beneficial would be going back to a more conservative morality of saying, Yes, humans have these, you know, innate desires, both men and women. Men want to fuck everything. Women want to do the dual mating strategy. And so we need to go back to a time, kind of what you were suggesting, like mm -hmm. in the 1950s, where we're more culturally engaged in shaming, you know, men and women for engaging in these extramarital or even premarital mm -hmm. affairs. Right. So, like, if you look at the idea right now that Adam was talking about here with the the idea that women will just cuck one guy and they'll they'll bring the baby home to the beta provider okay that conversation was not something you were having say prior to the sexual revolution or if you did it certainly wasn't as as prevalent as it is today mm -hmm. so again it's also about the environment it's also about the social situation it's also about the fact that we've got like a lot of you know we've got we it's unignorable i mean everybody go look at tiktok right now just go look at uh, Instagram right now, and you can look at, at women's innate nature on display, whereas you couldn't really do that prior to any of this time. So what happens when we give when we give women this ability to advertise their sexuality? What happens when we give women this sort of unfettered, shameless uh, way of, of sort of uh, live, you know, existing or put, putting themselves out there? Well, now we're finding out about that. So I would I would definitely agree that there are a lot of guys who will take the red pill and they will use it in terms of like, OK, it's all gloom and doom. Fuck women. I'm not of that. I'm not cut from that cloth. So let's just I want to point that out. I've been married for coming up on 27 years right now. Clearly, I'm not against marriage. Clearly, I'm not against what women. Clearly, I think I would been married be, for 27 years. Is that what you just said? In, well, in July, it'll be 27. Wow. Years. Congratulations. Congratulations. Yeah. Well, thank you very much. And then so a lot of people don't know that. Right. Like they're like they'll say or the, if they do. Here's a here's a before you congratulate me, Adam. Here's what happens is uh -oh. I get this from guys. It'll be like Rolo can't be red pill. He's married. You know? And then. <laughs> I'll get the other guys who'll go, well, Rolo can't be red pill you know, or Rolo can't be married because he's red pill. Like right. I, I can't, I, I can't serve both masters at the same time, but I, I have, you, you can find this in any of my books. I have said it a million times is that men and women are innate compliments to one another. Mm -hmm. Problem is how we're doing that right now. So when people ask me, how can you be married and say the things that you do? I said, well, I am 100% on board for marriage and, and monogamy and all this other great stuff, like closed on her end, closed on my end. That's awesome. But the problem is, is like getting, getting to that point right now is next to impossible because we live in a different societal uh, conditions. We live in different environment, but men and women are innate complements to one another. We are not equals, but we are complements with one another and we are better together than we are apart.
heart. So how do you how do you sort of square that circle? It's really difficult for me to do when people are saying the red pill says that you should hate women all the time. That's right. like, no, that's not what it says because it's about what well, is, it, not what ought to be. It paints, but it paints a picture of the world that lets you infer that pretty easily. Uh, I mean, I, w- I would, crux, well, no, I would compare it to like this, obviously the 1619 project, they would say, oh, look, mm-hmm. we're just, you know, descriptively describing the world mm-hmm. as it relates to slavery. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like the whole point of the 1619 project is for you to understand a world where white people are terrible, oppressive racists. Mm-hmm. Like that's the whole point of describing the world this way. And if is you're describing the world. So what did I say at the beginning of this, of this podcast? Mm-hmm. I said, you can't tell people facts without telling them how to feel about it. Because if you don't, they will, they will find a way to infer what you think they well, ought where's, to. Where's, okay, it. look, I've got three mm-hmm. things. Are there, are, I'm hoping, like, is there, is there mm-hmm. more? Where's the big idea that women can be honest and keep their legs well, closed well, and not well, every wait, woman wait, 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 wait. has an Instagram. Before account. before we move on away from that point, um, I, you know, and I think you're right. I think it's very difficult for people to absorb just descriptive knowledge. Um, but that's why I was saying, I think the red pill would have a much better public uh, or there'd be a much better public attitude about it. If the, if the prescription about the red pill was we need to go back to sort of conservative moral values as opposed to, to this, you know, fuck boy strategy. Mm-hmm. Well, it depends. I mean, do you on... feel like the red pill movement again, is kind of dominated by the you know black pill doom and gloom okay, types? So here's the reason why I, I posted. I, I've written about this quite a bit. It's the reason why I've said that the the red pill should remain amoral, a political, a religious, a mm-hmm. racial, whatever, is because that the as soon as you pair it up with an ideology, that's why I insist on saying it's a praxeology. It's not an ideology, not a philosophy, because the minute you pair it with conservative ideology or whatever. Mm-hmm. Then it becomes, oh, that's what those guys believe. That's alt right. That's uh, the if you're red pill, you vote for Trump. You believe in this bullshit, and you're and, and so it's just a new tag, or it's a new way of categorizing people. Where and what it does is it's a disservice to the actual objective understanding of men's nature and women's nature. In fact, I I lock horns more often right now these days with traditional conservatives than I do with like liberals or feminists. They just don't even bother with me. But like when I'm talking to guys like uh, when I'm you know watching guys make clips of say whatever podcast and it's Michael Knowles or it's Amala from Prager U or it's mm-hmm. uh, you know or Candace Owens and the shit that's going on with like Stephen Crowder right now. Those are traditional conservatives. I'm not about to like pair up red pill ideology whatever they want to say it is with that because that's not what it is they all yeah, no, distract like, from like understanding the objective factual absolutism that should be the red pill right right and i i mean and i agree that i mean this is kind of why i don't like critical theory you know whenever you attach a moral prescription to some sort of something that's supposed to be a descriptive science or a descriptive version of reality it's going to not only do what you're saying but it's going to uh, push people that are studying it into trying to prove something mm-hmm. based on the moral claim as opposed to the descriptive claim. But I feel I, like the problem I, is that what mm-hmm. you're worried about with the red pill, I mean, that already has happened. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Well, you know, and everyone does way, view it as a moral claim about, you know, being there's a fuckboy. No way around it either, unfortunately. And, and maybe Adam will probably like get a little something out of this too. Is that um, if you're online, as you guys know, where you your account, your channel is just about as we're online people, so, man. You're so, speaking yeah. to the tribe. So, so <laughs> if you if you go online, if you have an Instagram presence, if you have a Twitter presence, if you are in any way a quote unquote influencer, uh-huh. there's no there's no way not to get taken as like, oh, he's giving me advice, and I don't give. But, but we. We want to give advice, so that's the well, thing. I Everyone do, always wants. I'm sure you do, but like the red pill in its purest form shouldn't be about telling you what you ought to it's, do. The whole movement, right now, it right, seems no, like an advice movement, though. It does seem like helping young boys make decisions yeah, in life because people have taken it and they've used they've used the red pill and they've used the info here to tell people how they should feel about that info. Mm-hmm. Not, not that why I keep saying I'm not in the business 
of making men better men. I'm in the business of helping men become better men themselves who use this to equip and educate these guys so that they can make the decisions for themselves. What happens is then you've got a, this whole movement of guys who come in and say, you ought to do this. It ought to be about conservative. It ought to be about Islam. It ought to be about Christianity. It ought to be about this. It ought to be about that. I don't deal in oughts. I don't right. deal in shoulds. I don't deal in prescriptions. I deal in descriptions. Does it, does it bother you that from my perception, I don't know, maybe you disagree from my perception, the red pill movement has basically become dominated by the Tates, the Pearlies and, and Sneakos, and yeah. the people that are front loading it with all these prescriptions. I mean, does yes. that bother you that like that's what's going right. on? So well, you want, I've been doing this. I told you guys for 20 some odd years. Right, right. How come I'm, I'm at, what, 211,000 subs right now on YouTube? Not that sub, subs are Because you talk about boring descriptive studies. That's why. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah, boring descriptive. Boring. I know. It's sad. but I mean, I, I, play, I man. You. If I went, fuck these bitches. They ain't nothing. Yeah. No. <laughs> then I, right. Everybody's all about that. True. Right. Well, if we're selling, like monogamy is a tough sell when it's standing next to you're going to have a harem. Like there's mm -hmm. just, there's no competition. Yeah, because that's what, yeah. because that's what, okay. So let me explain, let me explain something to you. Like here's, now we get to these sort of technical aspects of all this. And you probably know this as well, of uh, being on YouTube as well. If you, if you put certain words in the titles, you're going to get more play than you are in other ones. So if you put oh, of course. Heated debate yeah. in all caps in the title, people are going to click on that. If you put delusional woman in title, it in you know, caps or otherwise, you're going to get more play out of that. Or feminist does X, Y, or Z instantly regrets that that's going to end up being more because guys want to have that comeuppance they want to see somebody say yeah finally somebody's saying what i would have mm -hmm. said to these bitches face to face but i'm too fucking much of a pussy to do so so right. you see that and it's especially when it's all of like i don't know five minutes eight minute video yeah well, everybody's got time for that yeah of course they do and so what happens is people see this and they go oh that's the red pill no no it's not not in, its, not in its purest form, not in the way it's, it was intended to be, at least as far as I'm concerned, the way that it's intended to be. But mm -hmm. you, as I was saying, Adam, you can't go online without people say, if you go online and you relate this information, well, Rolla must be giving advice. I'm not giving advice. I'm giving you information. What you do with that is up to you. I mean, God forbid you take my advice. I mean, I'll, I'll be happy to do counseling and analytics for you, but I am definitely not going to tell you what you ought to and ought not to do. But people want to be told that. They want to be they told do. that. They, they want, want advice from experienced individuals who have, you know, made a marriage work for 27 years. So yeah, they want to know guys, how that so what happens. Do they say? So what do they say, well, he wouldn't be relating this information to me if I wasn't supposed to do X, Y, and Z. It's like, no, you go and do, I've, I've got, probably got probably a dozen different emails right now. I, every morning I have guys tell me, Hey, this is what I did. Here's how, I, here's how I'm at. Should, did I make the right decision? Did I do this? Did I do that? Um, or they'll tell me, yeah, hey, if it wasn't for you, I would have had a noose around my neck. My sons are alive or my uh, my kids have a father because of the information and what you spelled out for me. I've mm -hmm. always thought these things were true, but I've never had it articulated before. And now I understand and I get it. And so they've changed their lives and they move in a different direction. Those those success stories you don't hear about from critics. You only hear uh, people saying, oh, well, the, the red pill is all about just, uh, you know, cheating on your wife and everything else. It's like, no, that's not it at all. So it's yeah. it's much more beneficial than I think a lot of people want to give it credit for. But those videos, you can't put heated debate in. <laughs> you can't put, a, like you said, uh, like 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 Citra was saying, they're, they're boring and dry. But well, that, this, this has that's... sort of been a heated debate, so I might change the title. <laughs> I mean... This I is you you'll get more play. But I, you have my permission, please do. This is this has been this has been a screaming this, match. Trust me, I've been on Access Vegas. This is not a heated debate. No, this know. well, no. This has this has been a spirited discussion, and I do appreciate you participating. I do I do have a few more questions. We've been going sure. like an hour and a half though. We never really discussed an out time. We we stream like pretty much all day on on Tuesday. So I just, I do five hours every, well, let me stop. Yeah. Four or five hours on Sundays. Well, we nice. don't, we don't want to take up your whole day, but I do have a few more questions. So the, um, the, the you made a video about David bus. That's the video that I watched to do like re basically research for our, our talk. Cause I'm a giant Davis, David bus fan. Obviously I've read all his books. It seems like you've read all his books. So you, you, in the video you say has Evo psychology sold out. 
I'm just, mm -hmm. what do you mean by, by selling out? Like what is selling out the red pill okay. movement? Okay. So the reason I did that video is because I see guys who are sort of like the rock stars of evolutionary psychology um, are becoming a little bit more concerned with public image than they are about actual research at this point. Um, I don't think a lot of people realize that Dr. David Buss, when right about the time that he was just about, I think it might have been right after he published uh, Men Behaving Badly, uh, he was also working, and I don't know if it's come to fruition or, at, or not yet, but he was working on a dating site or working on some sort of dating program uh, that in, that he was putting his name to. I don't know who the women involved were, but if you just go and do a Google search of Dr. David Buss uh, dating, there's, there's a, a title to it. It's still there. And they were taking like pre-orders for it, or they were taking, um, uh, if you want to get involved here, you will give you the, the pre-order emails. And it was as far back, so I think it's like three years old, and nothing ever became of it. And I'm like, why is this, why is he putting his name on this? And you got like some, some big names, like Alex Hormozzi was, was uh, putting his name on that. And some other people were, and nothing really came of it. Okay. I'm like, oh, why is it that, why, why is he changing his tune as far as like ovulatory shift and the mate switching hypothesis? Well, here's, here's my, my basic point is this is. How long does it take you to go through, uh, I don't know, four, eight years of college to get your master's degree? Maybe you get a doctorate in psychology. Uh, you could spend a lot of money and a lot of time in that. And then let's just say you want to be a clinical psychologist. And how much does it cost you to get a private practice, to get malpractice insurance, to do all the things that you have to do to become a quote unquote clinical psychologist, maybe write books, whatever. And then you have to also in this day and age have a blog have an online presence, be in some way, you know, visible because the guys who are out there sort of giving this positivity, motivational hustle kind of thing, they're making way in the time it took you to get your doctorate degree in clinical psychology. These guys have been making, in some cases, millions for a long time. And that's got to be something where you kind of you have to take into consideration that if I'm going to be if I'm going to make some money, or I'm going to make an impact in this field then I I also have to be a quote unquote influencer. And so now you've got a guy like David Buss and I hate to use the term. I hate to, I love God side. God side is the only guy I would be starstruck by. I would really like to get him on, on access Vegas. God side, uh, Rob Henderson, uh, Steve Stewart Williams. I guess I could throw Hector Garcia and, and, uh, and uh, Marty Hazelton in there as well, but you've got, people who are genuine, like they've been in the field for 25, 30, in some cases, maybe even 50 years. Mm -hmm. And, and now they have to sort of get into this hustle. They have to get into the hustle economy. They have to get into the influencer economy to be relevant and to stay on top of their game. Now, why does a guy like Dr. David Buss uh, do what, you know, have a dating program or go off and write books and go to podcast after podcast after podcast at 70 some odd years old? Um, what, why is that? What is it about him as a celeb, celeb Avo psych guy? And what is he saying that's going to be more palatable to a larger audience? If you look at like men behaving, are, are you saying that he's he's adapting his research to some influencer? I think a lot goal? of people are, and not just, I, I don't want to just point at Dr. David Buss because it's more than just that. I think a lot of, a lot of guys are doing that. You also have to understand that for the last like 15 or 18 years, there has been nothing but females in the uh, in the site in all branches of psychology. And you can go and find that on the APA if you'd like. So uh, I'm just I'm unclear here. Like how that how. OK, there's the issue of having a dating site, which you could be saying, you know, he's selling out because he's making money off of his research. But I, I mean, if, if the dating site is more towards, you know, eHarmony, we're going to use science to get you matched, you know, you're an eight, she's an eight, you're a four, she's a four. We're going to match you to, to have long lasting relationships. And I'm not necessarily, I mean, I'm not against that. Like that would be a good use of his research. So yeah, but he's also got to appeal to a larger audience as well. So who's he appealing? Just like, it's kind of like, have you ever watched um, anything by Matt Hussey no. or uh, even Mark Manson, for example? So but if, if he's to, adjusting the research, if the, if he's, playing with the numbers to appeal to that wider audience. I could see where that's selling out. Is that the accusation that you're making? I would, I, I would, accusations. One thing I would say, I'm, I'm looking at the, let's just say the, uh, the tendencies and the, uh, like the, the difference in the material that is in men behaving badly is, it is an entirely different animal than what he wrote when he was, uh, uh, why, why we have, so why women have sex, right. Or if you look at any of his prior work, 
the the book, the, his most recent book, which I think was like two years ago. Well, so the, he changed his opinion on that because other mm -hmm. new research came out. Like there yeah, was well, there so was that, a literature that came the, out that showed women. But again, but what's the research, right? Uh, we're also talking about the research is on wh wh why women have affairs. Right. OK, so. But we're also saying that he's so here's what one of the reasons that I sort of picked this apart is, as I said before, women's innate mating strategy versus when they're already mated. So he's going to talk about, well, mate switching strategy. OK, I might even give you I might even give him that. But if you're going to say this replaces the other one, that's where I'm going to draw the line, because he doesn't say that in the book, though. No, he does. He does say that he has said that in several in the, the interview. The question is, like, what is the prevalence like on average? What is happening? Obviously, we want to know if it's if, you know, obviously there are so many affairs that take place each year that are initiated by women. Right. Um, we want to know how many of those affairs are this dual mating strategy and how many of these affairs are the woman fell in love and this she's going for this mate switching strategy, right? That's what we right. want to know. Well, if you look at especially in that video that, that I did about this, he has an interview with Joe Rogan saying mm -hmm. exactly that. Like he has given up on the idea of ovulatory shift and all the stuff that he's like was promoting for a very long time with Marty. Had given up because new evidence came to light and he was forced yes. to give up by the but, new evidence. But he's, also, but he's also has doesn't make the distinction of the fact that what happens prior to this, like what is the mating strike? He's what he's trying to do too is apply the mate switching infidelity side of things to the overall mating strategy of women. Is a dual mating well, wait, strategy wait, wait. indispensable to red pill? Wait, 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 wait. How, how does dual yes. mating strategy operate before you're in a relationship? I don't understand that. Dual mating because it's alpha fucks, beta bucks. Before you're in a relationship, it's is, is he hot? Do I want to fuck him? Or is he a, is he boyfriend material, or is he one night stand material? Is it cads for cads versus dads? And there are there is robust research on this from as far back as the late '90s. If you go to look at Marty Hazelton's work. And suddenly, right around 2018, 2015, 2018, that's when all this, oh, well, you know, um, we're going to uh, we're going to do some meta studies and see if we can disprove this. And it's coming right at the same time where we're looking at the crisis of replicability. And I don't know if you're familiar with the crisis. Of replicability, right, right. But, but it's like relating... all of these very old, very well replicated experiments suddenly don't become replicable anymore in this new environment. And again, it, you could. Some people have said it's because of commercial interests. Some people have said it's because it's the woke. Because there are too many women in these fields now, it just depends. But the, what you do, what you can't argue is the fact is that these these well replicated studies now are unreplicated. Right, but relating to these past so, studies, so, so you're telling me that a guy with with the kind of reputation and the kind of background that David Buss has in all of this, you know, from, gosh, going on like 50 years. Suddenly, because these haven't been replicated in the crisis of replicability, now he's going to write a book and say, well, now I've, I've got a new idea. So, he's doing it to get laid. Yeah, there you go. So it's it's no books, but no, so but related to, to these, to related to these past studies, I now, and I'm sure you've looked into more than I have. I thought my understanding was that the past studies would show that both men and women, when they would interact with someone, if they're not, if they're not in a relationship and they interact with a, a potential mate, they would put in their mind something like, oh, this is someone that I might have sex with versus this is someone I might date long term. Mm -hmm. But that's a different than suggesting that this is someone saying, oh, I might want to have this person's baby and then have someone else raise it. Yeah, that's Those a are two giant, different concepts. That's a giant. You're mixing, you're mixing, two, you're mixing two concepts. It's proximate, mm -hmm. proximate goals and ultimate goals. Okay. Proximate goals are this. I've been married to my wife for coming up on 27 years. But when I met her, the night that I met her, I didn't go, she'd be a great mom for my kids. And I th really would like to reproduce with this. Of course. Right. You know, I saw but that. But you also didn't think you're going to pump ass. and dump her, right? <laughs> like, yeah. Well, you know, it's like at that point. <laughs> oh, <maybe he> <laughs> no, 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 no. Seriously, seriously. This no, is I'm, Tomasi. I don't I don't, know her. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. Wait, see, you're, 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 you're laughing from the benefit of 27 years, Of right? course. Sure. Of course. Time, right. At that time, I don't know that. So I'm Look, looking. This at is why you've been now. married for 27 years. Wait, it sounds like it was lust after. at first sight. So. If you really don't, don't wait, but wait, if you don't know that, then I still don't, then I don't understand how dual mating strategy plays in if, if it's undecided okay, because, at the time. Because, because you're mixing proximate cause with ultimate cause. Ultimate cause is re reproduction. 
Okay. Mm -hmm. Proximate causes. I really want to tap that ass. Sure. Right. <laughs> so those are, that's those, those are two different things. So, so if the ultimate cause or the ultimate goal, let's just say is marriage, family, monogamy, whatever, you know, happily ever after whatever the tradcon dream is, if that is the ultimate cause is beta buck side, well, what's the proximate cause? Well, maybe it's like, I really want to tap that ass. So you're mixing that you put it, you're putting two of them or putting one in one category and one in the other. Category. Well, no, cause okay. To me, the argument that I said earlier, which is that women are, women seek higher status males. And that's like a general, that's the general drive. And so that can lead to situations where dual mating strategy manifests, right? To me, that makes sense in terms of a woman that's not dating someone, a woman that's dating something, someone, et cetera, et cetera. But I, I just, I'm still troubling to understand how if a woman is not in a relationship and she sees a guy and she's attracted to the guy, like, and as you're saying, there's not, she's not thinking necessarily in terms of, you know, these long-term ultimate goal things, mm -hmm. how the dual mating strategy is there. She's not thinking like, oh, this is a guy that I want to have sex with and then mm -hmm. have someone else raise their child. Like the fact that they don't have that should go That's, against the dual mating okay. strategy. So, so here's the thing is you're, you're presuming that women have the presence of mind in the moment to go and say, hmm, I think I'm going to cut this guy. That's not that's not what happens right then and there. Mm -hmm. so as I said, proximate goal is, well, I was drunk. He was cute. And one thing led to another. He was hot and I wanted to fuck him. You also right. brought up the fact that uh, that uh, the uh, the long term relationship side of things. You got to remember at that point and at that moment, it's not about hmm, I think I want to have babies with this guy. Hmm, I want to I want to have some sort of future with this guy. It's is he hot or is he not? And that's a problem that a lot of a lot of uh, evolutionary psychologists, not just not not just David Buss, but like mm -hmm. Dr. Jordan Peterson, name the guy, and all they think of is that the only thing that matters is the long term, is the long term security, and that's how women make their decisions rationally and reasonably, and they don't. Right. That's why. Well, why do you think that forty two percent of babies are born out of wedlock today? That's why right. they were bad decisions. Why is it that women will fight tooth and nail to keep abortion safe and legal? Because it's a fail safe against bad reproductive decisions Sure. because they're not thinking about, oh, well, it's not that they're maliciously saying, oh, hmm, malice and forethought. I want to make sure that I cuck this guy with this guy's baby. That's not what's happening. It's, it's retroactive, if anything, because more women will have babies before and they'll become single mothers and wonder why they can't get a guy to, to you know, to get on board with them and marry them. Well, the problem is, is that's retroactive cuckoldry is what it is. It's not pro proactive cuckoldry was, would be like, I'm married to this guy, yeah, and I another guy and bring a baby into the thing. Yeah. It's retroactively happening. It's still cuckoldry. But if it's if just all happening, it's happening before the point, right? But if all that's happening is that you know you have men and women who are in a relationship, and they're at a party, they're at some function away from their partner, they mm -hmm. see someone who's attractive, you know, they get horny and they have sex with them. Like I don't see why do we need a sort of a more complicated evolutionary theory to explain the behavior rather than just they got horny. The you know the chemicals when you get horny you be basically enter an altered state of mind that I would argue is more powerful than being drunk for a lot of people, mm -hmm. and that leads them to do this behavior. I don't know if we need like an evolutionary theory, dual mating or whatever strategy to explain. How is that, that not evolutionary? Like this guy looks like somebody I want to breed with. This guy looks like somebody I want to fuck. They don't. Think no, no. What I'm what I'm saying is like obviously the process that makes someone horny is an evolved process. But I'm saying mm -hmm. that's all to me. That could just simply be all it is. That they look at the person. They get sexually excited by them, and mm -hmm. that's it. You know, it doesn't need something more complicated than that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, well. they did. I, and I'm just going to say is like, there's not any like, like I said, I think people maybe it's because of the the way that the red pill has been sort of portrayed recently, mm -hmm. but. I think a lot of people think that women are like these malicious bitches who like plot this stuff out in advance. I'm like, no, that's not not at all. It's not even necessarily you know malice or forethought. It's just it happens. That was it was available. It was it was opportunism at that particular no, time. right? But I guess what I'm saying is like I feel like in I feel like sometimes in Evo psych, even among Evo psych, uh, you know, professors and people that that are you know have doctors in the fields, I feel like there's a tendency to look at every single specific behavior. And try to say this specific behavior must have evolved for some specific process as opposed to well there could be general behaviors that evolve like obviously the power of, over being horny on a human's mind obviously we evolved to have that because you know having children is a massive time constraint and a massive energy constraint 
And if we were all logical Vulcans, most people would not want to have children because it's a fucking big hassle. So we need this like massive biological motivator to basically force us essentially or to control our minds into making us want to you know, have sex and do all these things. And so to me, it's like, well, when you have men and women in these situations where they just get horny because they see someone that's visually attractive, to me, it's like, well, why is that not just simply those those processes, you know, coming to fruition as opposed to a dual mating strategy specifically being the thing that's at play here? Well, again, you I think the dual mating strategy doesn't have to be all at one time. So like you could have like the alpha fuck side is preempts the beta buck side of things. So mm -hmm. when a woman is say between the ages like 18 and 28, the alpha fuck side might be the might be the, the side that she goes with and she, suddenly she hits 28, 29 years old like Tommy Lahren for example. And then you get they get panicky, they go through what I call the epiphany phase and they decide, you know what? I need to get right with God. I need to find a man. I need to where are all the good guys? Where are, how, how come they can't find a, you know, they're all threatened by powerful women like me and, and they don't understand the situation that they're in at 28, 29 years old because they're they're cashing out of the sexual marketplace. So now they lean more towards the beta buck side of things and, and, and the long term. And that sounds better than I just wanted to have fun on OnlyFans or I just want to have fun in Aruba or Tulum or whatever when I'm, you know, 22 years old. As I said before, they, I mean, the joke is this, is like, you know, they call the store forever 21, not forever 41. It's because at some point women realize, hey, I better get serious. I better get on top mm -hmm. of things. So perhaps it is between 18 and 28 when women can capitalize on the alpha fuck side of things way more than they could say when they are, they're post 30 and they got to get serious and they got to find some way to find a guy who wants to go with them and have babies with them and be much more uh, proactive about the long-term beta buck side of things. That's that's a red. You want a red pill principle? There's there's one right well, there. I mean, to to me, that seems more the, what's going on in these situations is that as people are younger, I mean, I, we all I assume we've all experienced this. When you're younger, you know the the forces of hormones and horniness on your brain seems to have a much stronger grip. And as you're older, that kind of really? seems to to ebb a little bit and kind of go away. Maybe not for all of us. <laughs> not for all of us. Maybe not for 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 all of us. But it definitely it definitely changes. You know, I would argue it definitely changes biologically in both men and women. And I'd say that you know women are just probably you know they go from being oh I'm super horny to just like okay I could think a little bit more rational about the process yeah. here. Yeah, it's also you know? part, uh, it's also part of the menstrual cycle too. So like when women are like right before ovulation, that's when they're looking to go after. That's when it's girls' night out. Sure. That's when it's time to have a week. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> it's time to have a weekend in no, but, Vegas. And then I, after after ovulation in the luteal phase, that's when <laughs> like, I want to call my friends and I want to have Ben and Jerry's. Right. And so you know, talk to me, please. I, I'm I'm sympathetic to what you're saying about you know you're trying to focus on a on a description of reality as opposed to a moral prescription. Mm -hmm. I think that labeling it alpha fucks and beta bucks front loads it with so much <laughs> moral <laughs> language. Like that, it's sort of you're you're kind of putting a big like target on your back. How would you like to have it delivered? I, I I like that's the thing is I could I could say well, I, I I've tried to use the non swear word version of it for years now, which is mm -hmm. alpha speed and beta need. But the, the well, the just ba saying beta not, though, an yeah, alpha is a moral is a moral claim. It's not the delivery; it's the information itself. I've had women, no, but I mean, like guys tell me this before. It's like if you just change your tone, if you just so said it in a different way then people will be more open to it or more accepting of it or whatever. And it's like, if anything, it would make it, I wouldn't have 211,000. Sure. No, I listen. You know, I, I have 10,000 subs. I understand we're on YouTube. Okay. <laughs> I get it. But I'm just saying, and I'm not saying anything about tone. I'm not one of these, you know, oh my God, you're yeah. too aggressive. Police, you know, I don't care about that. I'm just saying that actually, alpha, I shouldn't I'm just say saying that, that using alpha, the terms alpha and beta and, and by today's standards has a moral claim to it. No one wants to be a beta. Yeah, well, that, and again, we've been using that terminology, at least I have, for the last 21, 22 years now. And I've also, I should also point this out, is like I've tried my damnedest to tell people that when I use the term alpha, beta, whatever, it is a an abstract for a term that it's like a placeholder term for an idea. Because people will come up to me and they'll say, well, Rolo, you use alpha in the wrong way. You think of it as like silverback gorillas or, or you know, wolves on the Arctic tundra or some shit mm -hmm. like that. I'm like, no, dude, it's just an app. It's just a. Yeah, we all everyone knows what you mean. Right? Place yeah. for an idea. We all know, we all know something what better comes along. I'm happy to use it. I, sure, I, sure. But... I have one more question, but I do. I, I don't want to move on. 
if we've missed something, we've got the dual mating okay. strategy, we've got the war brides, we've got the hyper hypergamy. Is there any like big ideas in red pill? It sounds like the dual mating strategy is like the biggest idea. That's the one that most people, most words are expended in the red pill community on that idea. Well, I, I've, in the red pill, we've called it hypergamy for a while. We've just simply, the dualistic mating strategy is hypergamy. Right, just, I understand. It's yeah. inclusive of the alpha fuck side of the whole thing. That's all. Um, so the dualistic mating strategy is hypergamy. But uh, I'm trying to think of like if there's any other core ideas that, that I've missed. Um, certainly the 80-20 rules, one, we've got that we covered that. Um, I mean, I've, I've written books on how women's... Um, priorities change throughout uh their 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 phases of maturity so as i was just telling such a little while ago it's like between 18 and 28 it's like what's called the you know the hoe phase right or the party mm -hmm. years as i put it and it's when women can capitalize the most on uh using their sexual agency to find a guy in you know to eventually hopefully take into the future and have babies with and you know go into perpetuity with um, and then there's the epiphany phase, which is for those women who haven't done that, they realize right around 28, 29, which, by the way, is the first the average age of first marriage. It's also about the average age of first baby as well, that they better get themselves right with God or get themselves right with, you know, do the do the right thing and find a guy who is a good dad rather than the good cads that they've been, been you know, enjoying themselves with, let's just say, for for 18 from 18 to 28 now. Does every woman do that? No, but the the opportunity, the window of opportunity between 18 and 28 years old is common across cultures. So when we're looking at uh, the peak sexual market value ages of men and women, for women, it's right around 22 years old. And there's lots of studies that show this. Um, and then there's also for men, men tend to hit their sexual market value peak years right around their mid-30s, 36, 37 years old, because they have what is most attractive to women at that time, the complete package. If they maximize their potential, men between the ages of, say, 36, 37, 38 years old, if they maximize their potential, they've made partner in the law firm, they've, it takes longer for men to mature into what makes them maximally attractive to women than it does for what women have to do to be maximally attractive to men, which is just be hot and available at that time. So it's youth, fertility, and beauty is what gets you gets your foot in the door with the guy. So when I've done, I've, uh, this is a real controversial thing that I've I brought up uh, like as far back as 2014, and it's the idea that there are peak sexual market value years for both men and women. It's more accepted now. Back then, people were like, oh, prove this to me, show me the stats and everything. Today, it's almost a given that like women, that when they reach their maximum sexual market value, per, you know, potential, it's right around 23 years old, 22, 23. For men, it's right around 33 or 36 or 37 years old because it takes longer for men to mature into what makes them maximally attractive. So, right. That's, Se that's sexual market value is doing. probably a big one that we didn't really mm -hmm. talk about. So, um, well, and then the, the reason why it's a big deal is because women tend to conflate sexual market value with their personal worth you could be a very very great good wonderful humanitarian you might have right. a doctor whatever but that doesn't mean that that's going to make you attractive enough for a man to want to get down with you right so the last question i have is it, and we talked a little bit about this but i'm curious like your perspective on it is the red pill a conservative movement no, I don't think so. I don't think it's a movement to begin with. Well, I, I know a lot of people perceive it, though. There's like this left-right thing, and a lot of people look at Andrew Tate and these various content creators that are associated with the Red Pill movement. They look at Sneeko, and they think, oh, that guy's MAGA. That guy's conservative. So, mm -hmm. Yeah, he's a Trump supporter because he's... Well, and you have to remember that I've been in this... I've been doing this for 20-some-odd years now. I've seen this come in cycles. This was the, the question you're asking me right now. I was asked in 2016, right before the Trump, the, the Trump elections. I was asked this, uh, as, as, I think as late as 2019, 2020, right before the, Bi the Biden elections. When we get into like election cycles or there's like some sort of social, uh, let's say upheaval, there's some social movement that goes on at the time. That's when people tend to want to conflate the red pill with like political ideology for sure. But just uh, basically, or, or religious ideology for that matter. 
Um, if you look as far back as I think 2015 and you look at Candace Owens, her old handle for, uh, for her Twitter handle was red pill black. Yeah. I remember and all that. So, so there's the alt right and all that, all the, all that good stuff that was going on. Everybody said that they were red pill. And so back then, People were trying to sort of rebrand the red pill because they knew that it was well it represented a demographic that they wanted to be a part of, and you'll see this happen. They wanted to be a part of, or they wanted to distance they, themselves. No, from well, they wanted to they wanted to appropriate the okay. term red pill to mean their particular pet ideology at that time. So the, so the conservatives were trying to appropriate the red pill movement for themselves. Oh yeah. And okay. still do to this day when it, when it serves their interests. Also, I shouldn't just say, it's not just like we're uh, Republicans and, and Democrats. It's also religion tries to appropriate the red pill. Uh, there's a, you name the ideology and people will say, well, uh, you know, this is the real red pill. And right. she's using the term red pill in a sense of like, this is the truth. Yeah. And they, whether it like, for instance, <laughs> for instance, uh, myself and Michael Sartain had this, uh, uh, I guess, debate with Gary, the numbers guy last week on an access Vegas, this numerologist, astrology guy, the real red pill is numerology and astrology. No, okay. no it's not. <laughs> uh, yeah, I'm a little doubtful of that one. Of, yeah. But it's all it is, is it's, it's a, it's a brand, it's an easy brand to appropriate and say, well, you know, we're the red pill here. And, yeah. and or it's an easy brand to say to demonize someone with. So if you say if, if the left says, oh, those red pill guys, fuck those guys like it's it's this it either it's easy to hate these guys or it's easy to like sort of have it as a tribal affinity for whatever pet ideology. That's why I keep saying it is not an ideology. It is not a philosophy. It is not a movement. And it I, is an I appreciate that. I do. We're, we try to be anti-tribal as well. So I do. I understand like it's just a convenient well, I'm, I'm thing to call it a movement. So and I have heard other yeah. people call it a movement. So, yeah. Oh, yeah. Of course they will. They, and, and, and I was on Dr. Phil's show and Dr. Phil referred to it as an ideology in a movement. I said, no, dude, let me let me correct you right here. I'm on national television right now. I got to check that out. I saw when I was doing the thumbnail that you were on Dr. Phil, but I didn't watch it before the show. So. Yeah, how did that, how did that go? It was actually a very good show. I was I was kind of it was supposed to be a two part show, but he quit. <laughs> oh, he did. Like, literally, he, he he retired like the uh, the week after uh, my show aired. You broke him. Yeah, that's what everybody said. They're like, oh, <laughs> he found out his wife was practicing this dual mating strategy, and he was like, oh my god, I've been raising a cuck baby my whole yeah. life. I uh, there's there was a, the running joke is this is I, 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 I pissed off Dr. Phil because I had mentioned that uh, today women view men as being superfluous. Right. They're nice to have around. They don't need a man. They want a man. And that men are basically just they're 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 easy to to blame like society's ills on. But women don't need a man. They want a man. And so men effectively become superfluous. I had to explain what the word superfluous meant to Dr. Phil. No way. Really? <laughs> That's show, crazy. Yeah. Isn't, isn't that um, how men view women like already? <laughs> For, like, no, as superfluous? I mean, I, yeah. I lived I lived in New York and it seemed like every single woman had a, a boyfriend that was you know, basically like down on his luck, sleeping on their couch. That just seemed like they did seem superfluous. They seemed like a handbag, like a well, that like, was their fix fixer upper project. Interesting. The reason I the reason I started writing about that and talking about that, I used even using the word superfluous was because the, I run into this all the time. You probably see this on like Fresh and Fit and these other shows where it's like I don't need a man, but I want a man. Right. And the reason you don't need a man is because they have that beta buck side of the hypergamous dual mating strategy equation already settled for themselves because they can't trust. They they've been taught that. You can't, men are untrustworthy. They're, they can't provide you with that security. And so therefore you've got to provide it for yourself. So you've got to go to four years of college. You've got to get a, a some kind of middle management career if not, or, or own your own business, get educated, get in, get political, get whatever it is, and, and essentially provide your own long-term security because you can never trust a man to provide that for you. And God forbid you would ever want to be dependent because you're a strong, independent woman on a man for you know, money for emotional support because security is not just about finances, right? It's also an emotional security. God forbid you're ever dependent on a guy because you don't know if that guy gets successful and then he wants to divorce you and go fuck his trophy wife's secretary. And so you got to be able to hit the ground running. And it's, it's a, I've written quite a bit about this, how 
society sort of feeds women this idea that men can't be trusted, certainly not for long-term security. And so therefore they have to be boss babes. They have to be alpha females. They have to find some way to have that, have that side hustle or whatever, just in case things go sideways with the guy. And as a result of that, what they're doing is when we talk about dual mating strategy, they're effectively taking care of provisioning, protection, and parental investment on that sub the beta buck side of, of uh, dual mating strategy. So what's left? The alpha fuck side. So they don't need man. They want a man. Well, what kind of man do they want? Jason. Right. Mo Jason Momoa. That's who they I want. just It's like, you know, we've talked about when, you know, the, when the sex robots come out, you know, I think yeah. most people are going to. You know, I think a lot of relationships are going to fall apart because both men and women, I think, do view each other as superfluous and yeah. would prefer to just have the sex robot that looks exactly what they want it to look like. Mm -hmm. will do everything they say, essentially, and just be, you know, 100 percent supportive. Yeah, well, well, that's why guys get addicted to porn, because the vicarious exactly, right. pleasure is more real to them than real pleasure. Well, so, it's just easier. I don't know it's if it's escape. more well, it's escapism is what it is. It's like, it does, and it doesn't necessarily have to be porn. It could be like online games. It could be like prescription drugs. It could be alcohol, mm -hmm. it could be weed, whatever. Sure. Things that sure. we have effectively done to the, in this aside, maybe you guys all agree with this. We've done to our sort of lost boys generation is we've effectively sedated them with porn, with weed, with, with, with instant dopamine hits like that. Sure. Yeah. And in, in doing so that also contributes to the fact that they're superfluous and then women become superfluous to them as well, because why the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Why would I deal with some, some bitch who's got a headache and nagging and I got to do all this work for what, when I can just go and jerk off the porn at any time I want to. Right. Right. Unlimited access, unlimited sexuality, vicarious. But if you're, if your escape life is better than your shitty real life, which, where you, which one are you going to spend more time in? What, what's mm -hmm. that mean? You've said it several times. The juice isn't worth the squeeze. Oh, that's a common uh, refrain from the black pill doomer uh, uh, crowd, I guess. That's the big towel. The juice isn't worth the squeeze, meaning that like even if – even if they did everything, like they they became the best versions of themselves, they could find some way to magically make themselves, you know, six feet tall and get a six pack abs and get the chiseled jawline and have bulletproof game and have a, you know, six figure bank account that even if they had all of that, it still wouldn't be worth it because the women today are so low quality and they're so run through and so entitled that the juice isn't worth the squeeze. Meaning like, why would I go through all this trouble to improve myself when the women who I'd be doing it for aren't worth doing it for. Right. Mm. Sitch, there's a, some super chats. Should we read? Uh, sure. There's yeah. some yeah. nice we'll ones read, for Rolo. Read your super chats. <laughs> well, there's some yeah. nice ones for you, Rolo. The first one but, was uh, pretty well, before cool. the, the last question I want to ask was, um, you know, we, you know, here we spend a lot of time kind of going over, you know, woke ideology and the mm. roots of it and, you know, how it relates to cultural Marxism and all these things. And we, mm. can, you know, break it down and do all this stuff. Um, but, like there is a movement. I don't think it's the majority of the movement, but there is a movement that kind of tries to use, you know, wokeness and, and cultural Marxism to advocate for things that I don't like, such as, you know, uh, you know, Christian nationalism mm -hmm. or, you know, bringing back monarchy or, you know, bringing some kind of authoritarian fascistic government. To Neo feudalism, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right, right. And I mean, I guess I would feel personally, I would feel responsible if, you know, if those people were using my, mm -hmm. you know, work essentially, or my, you know, going over this stuff or to, to kind of further these political causes, I kind of, you know, really disagree with, or really to, to push forward these moral prescriptions, I really disagree with. And mm -hmm. I was wondering, do you feel, I mean, do you feel the same sense of responsibility if people Every are kind of using your I descriptions do. for like things you disagree with morally? Yeah. Well, I'll, uh, since you didn't, Adam, since you didn't see the Dr. Phil thing in the very beginning, when I finally sit down one on one with with Dr. Phil, um, he was asking me about like, so you your book is like sort of the source source material for all these, uh, you know, for these red pill guys. I go, yeah. And I said, but I said, it's been bastardized to such a point and such a degree right now that I kind of have to clean up other people's messes. And so I said so much so that I have to come on Dr. Phil and be an apologist for <laughs> Andrew Tate which I'm not going to do because that's, that's not about not anything that I've ever been about. But mm -hmm. again, if somebody, if somebody in the manosphere, whether it's uh, you know, they've got a popular podcast or they're writers or whatever, sometimes they're throwing rocks at me. Sometimes they love me, but if they shit the bed, I'm the one that has to always go and clean up the shit. 
because people come back to me and like you guys wanted to talk to me because Pearl suggested that you talk to me, right? Which I, I'm appreciative of for sure. But like, I have to come on this show and tell you, this is why we say what we say. This is why, this is how we come to these conclusions. This is how we, you know, you want to know why there's these buzz terms that, that Andrew Tate throws out like, oh, high value men should cheat. Like I have to go and explain why that's not necessarily what the red pill is about. That's a prescription and not necessarily a description. But I have to, I'm usually the one that people come to, to get like clarification on this stuff. And again, I do it for 210, 211,000 subs on YouTube. Whereas how many people is Pearl reaching? How many people right. is Christian Fit reaching? How many people, some are better representatives than others. Like Myron from Fresh and Fit is like, I give him my full 100% endorsement. Other people, maybe they get 80%. Maybe they get, it just sort of depends. A lot of guys, I can tell who the, the the real grifters are in this because they can't defend a point. So if somebody pushes back on them and they don't know what to say, it's usually because they haven't memorized, you know, it's like if then logic. If they ask me this, then I say this, right? And they don't know what to say. That's how I know they're not about the actual red pill. They're just about their brand, their own personal brand of me. And so, again, I have to be the one to sort of clean up everyone's mess. So, yes, I to answer your question, I am very much concerned about that because it's not necessarily a personal reflection on me. It's just that I'm trying to aim for, for accuracy and clarity, and I can't be the one to gatekeep all of this all the time because if I go and I – I go, okay, hey, that's not necessarily true. Destiny doesn't know what he's talking about when he said this or some or Sneeko said this and Destiny came back at him and they think that that's the red pill. And it's like, Daddy Rolo has to come in here and like, no, no, go. you children go to either side of your, you know, your room and let me explain something to you. I hate that shit, but it's become more and more common that I have to do that. And again, it's just... It's like playing whack-a-mole. <laughs> it's like which one, which fire do I have to put out today? Mm -hmm. And but that's I, good content, I, though. I mean, Rolo. Yeah. <laughs> this oh yeah. Is like, well, that's the thing. Is this like is the, the game and, we play. Yes, and then but you go look at this. If you go and you look at Red Pill content today, it it, it focuses around like three three or four different kind of like uh, content schemes. One of them is reaction videos. Everybody's reacting to somebody else. So Rolo said this, someone said, I'm a dickhead and fuck, fuck Rolo. And then that guy does it is gets a reaction video from another guy who gets a reaction video from another guy. And it's like the movie inception, right? You have to get down to the inception of like, which one, where, where's the original thought in all of this. So there's this reaction video thing. Then there's the TikTok, what what I call, uh, it's like revenge, revenge, uh, pro revenge, pro revenge porn kind of thing where it's, you want to see the girl get her comeuppance. Right. Whether TikTok is just rife with this shit, right? Mm -hmm. There'll be man on the street kind of thing where it's, uh, um, you know, go and say, well, what do you think about this? And it's like this gotcha question that the the guy on the street is asking these girls and they don't know what to say. And it doesn't matter because it's over in 30 seconds and that's all that matters. And you got a million and a half viral, you know, TikTok right there. That's another one. Then there's the, um, the what do we say? The Gen Z dating shows where it's like get a bunch of girls around a table and and talk about stuff. Uh, sometimes that's a little more salacious than others. If you watch uh, Brian from whatever podcast, which I'll be on this coming Sunday. Oh, really? Uh, that's in yeah. Santa Barbara. Yeah. Um, he uh, like recently had this this transgender uh, male to f female, and she just looked like a, a Marvel character, I, like like oh, the, no. or the juggernaut or something. Like, I mean, just oh, like, I know, yeah, I know your time. Like, in yeah. between, like some you know, pretty big, cute, cute girls. He usually sources from UCSB, right? Mm -hmm. And I'm like. What the fuck am Sounds I like good content. <laughs> yeah. like, Holy shit. And you know what? It's it shoots at a million, two million views because you got Gorlock the destroyer over here in between all these girls at the table kind of thing. And that's there was a dream that was the red pill, and that ain't it. <laughs> well, what was it? What is the dream that was the red pill? I, I objective factual absolutism, like educating, equipping, at least that's uh, educating I, 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 men. I I've thought about this for a long time. It's like, what is there a mission statement? Is there something other? Yes, than there you I go. Have, That's what have, we're after. I usually say this is, uh, and I'm I'm quoting. I'm lifting this like wholesale from God's side, but I have a an obligation to objective truth, mm -hmm. and that's uh, God's side would say the same thing, right? So if there's a, if there is a mission statement, I think that ought to be for the red pill praxeology. It should be an obligation and a dedication to objective truth, factual absolutism. That ought to be 
what it is. Now, I know that that's next to impossible because there's no such thing as true objectivity in anything. But um, but the idea is that it is understanding men's nature, understanding women's nature, and understanding the confluence between those two so that you can live a better life according to accurate information. But men, men and women that, both have a range of nature, though, obviously, right? Well, what I'm saying is they're basic evolved natures, okay? A lot of people, right. I, you, you'll get this too, is, uh, it's what I call the, the fallacy of individuation, which is we're all special snowflakes. You guys go against the woke all the time because it's... No, no, I, look, like, yeah. there are certain things that are just, I mean, it's undeniable. Like men like variety. Like that is... Uh, undeniable way more than like, way more than women but yeah i mean it's that's splitting hairs but if variety i think we use the term variety because we think of uh in terms of like guys just want to fuck anything on two legs i think the uh, by calling it but variety, what, what diversity I, that we don't really understand the nature of men's like sexual strategy unlimited what i what i'm saying true. though is there is a range like there's a range of men men who are more monogamous and men who are more likely to cheat like there's a yeah. giant range there Right, because their natures of those two guys are such that one of them was well, the, the guy that can cheat, the guy who's the quote unquote high value guy, the guy who has more sexual opportunity is going to have a different like methodology <laughs> to affect that strategy. If you took a guy, and I'm going to I'm going to quote Justin Waller here for a second. If you took I mean, a there guy, are guys though that have lots of opportunities that are more monogamous. They, yeah, uh, they David Buss gives examples of those in the book because the because the meme because the social condition maybe it's they're afraid of god i don't know but for it some reason some cultural be. influence for some reason behavior. they're more that monogamous even though they have women throwing themselves at them well right? i mean look at look okay so here's the here's the i'll, I'll use myself as an example. i hate to do this but i'll use myself as an example. i have been monogamous with my wife for well technically 20 28 years 28 and a half um and it's a higher number not a lower <laughs> yeah, right i have a notch count of 42 I have a my rock star past, right? So I was very promiscuous when I was in my twenties. I've been monogamous. I've been faithful, and with one, I have a, a, a twenty five year old daughter right now. Um, she's you know got a master's degree. I think I did pretty well. I'm actually the trad con dream. Not that anybody's gonna you know re reference that. They won't go. They won't do that kind of background check on me. Mm -hmm. uh, but so it's closed on my wife's end, and it's closed on my end. Am I a high value guy? I make a good chunk of change. I'm in uh, for 55. I'm in pretty decent shape, right? And I, you know, from money, muscles, and game, I'm doing pretty well for myself. Why am I a cuck? Am I a simp? Am I a beta for not having cheated on my wife in the last 28 some odd years? That's the whole thing. It's like I I understand what you're saying, Adam. And I'm, well, I, no, I, this I is this is you. why I'm saying there's a range. Like there are guys that are you know promiscuous mm -hmm. that would say yes, of course, you should have been cheating the whole time because that's their well, wait, proclivity. Why, that's her personality. That's pers that, but that's the prescription, though. Why so. don't you cheat? Why don't I cheat? Because yeah. I, well, first of all, it's because I have built a relationship up over the course of 27 years, so I understand the value that has that I've put into. The lifestyle, it's, just, it's a lifestyle choice is basically what it is. But mm -hmm. I, I, I respect my wife and I respect the value that I have put into the relationship over the years. So that's number one. Number two is that when you're, when, then Dr. David Buss, if you're watching, if <laughs> when, when guys cheat, it's usually because of two things. There has to be a reason and there has to be an opportunity. I have plenty of opportunity to cheat. I have no reason to cheat. Because my wife takes care of me sexually and and in in uh, relationship wise and love and intimacy and everything else, I have no reason to cheat. Plenty of guys have a reason to cheat, but they have no opportunity to cheat because they simply don't they don't have access to to any kind of uh, any kind of women that they will want to get with unless they manufacture it themselves and they go see a, a prostitute or an escort or mm -hmm. something like that. So when those if there's those two things have to be a, there has to be an opportunity and there also has to be a reason right there. Most guys can't find some way to bring those two together so they'll live in they'll live it out in a tough it out in a sexless marriage for as long as they can until it just gets too much for them or else they'll jerk off the porn when they're married and so right. why do i so why do i stick around what's well, a lifestyle choice first of all and then second of all it's like that's it's not like it's not something that's necessarily innate it's just something that this is how i've decided to you know live my life well, so but do, do you think so let me you... ask you this though. So if I was, if I suddenly, God forbid, I find myself single tomorrow, would mm -hmm. I get married again? Probably not. Well, but do you think that it was a 
cultural influence that kind of made oh, you sure. feel this way about cheating or do you think Certainly that you were able to partially yes. oh, wait, or do you think you're able to sort of like rationalize out of these kind of biological urges for yourself um it, it could be it could be uh that those are uh, go hand in hand with each other mm-hmm. so it could be like oh well i don't want to cheat because if i do then look at all i don't want to it'll be tough on the kids i don't want to break up the family i i, I do counseling for or consults with guys who are in that situation right I, I, I'm in a sexless marriage. What do I do? How do I get her to have sex with me again? They don't want to cheat. They just want to get their wives to fuck them again. Right. And they're trying to figure out how to do that because they're of the conviction, not necessarily religious, but it might be a practical decision on their part too. They don't want to lose, you know, half of their stuff in a, in a nasty divorce. They don't want to have it be tough on the kids, but they still can't live in a sexless manner. So it just again, it, it could be a cultural influence. It could be a personal thing. It could be a combination of both, and how guys rationalize that, or how guys, um, you know, just sort of come to the conclusions of their behavior in the practice. But it's kind of up to the individual at that point. But the nature of that guy doesn't change. He still needs to get laid. He still needs yeah, sure. needs sure. met. You know, those needs. That's the machine. That's the biology. That's the right. Culture. No, no, no. I mean, I agree with everything you're saying. It's just like when when we have these conversations about you know, dual mating strategies and things of that nature. I think it's easy to kind of fall into the pit of of the way we're discussing it sounds like we're just saying everything is this inevitable biological reality that you can't really fight against, which no, is obviously you're, not the You're case. thinking that it's deterministic. Like yeah, mechanism. as opposed yeah. to just being influential. No, uh, clearly we can, clearly we have control over that evolved nature. It doesn't change the operative state though. Yeah, so of, course, of course. You can lose weight. Right. You can not you can put the fork down and not be a fat ass. You can get to the gym and work right. out. You're predisposed to eat garbage. Yeah. Even though your innate, you know, like biology says, I want to eat that burrito supreme. Right? <laughs> right. You can go do that. And it's easy. You want to know why what is 75 percent of the population is overweight? It's because it's it's easy. Go, you don't have to kill your food anymore. You just go drive down to the drive through and they'll throw it in your mouth if you want to. Mm-hmm. It's a. Uh, but the, that dopamine hit is there when it comes to other pleasures. But like when it's food, that you want to know why people are fat. Go walk through any major airport and you'll see what I mean. <laughs> right. Um, but it's it's uh that's again that's a biological evolvedness. We we like we like uh starchy foods. We like mm-hmm. sugar foods. We like salt. We like sugar. We love that stuff. And when it's available, we'll eat it. Can we avoid it because uh, because we have the the cognitive ability to do so? Absolutely, we do. I think that's a problem that a lot of people think is that the red pill is very like sort of biological determinism. It's yeah. not. You you don't have to fuck a lot of women. You could like, you could very you could be right. celibate. You could be a high value celibate if you want to be. Well, I, I think be, and the the reason for that is because when we do hear a lot of the big, you know, uh, people that are at least claiming to advocate for the red pill, whether they're actually doing it or not. It, when I hear them talk, they use these arguments to basically justify, uh, you know, male behavior that I would say is immoral. And so it kind of leads to this perception that there's this, oh, biological determinism mm-hmm. for why it's okay to do all this stuff. And by the way, that has been going on for quite some time. There used to be as, as far back as the PUA seduction community, it was no longer the devil made me do it. It's the, uh, my selfish gene made me do it. Right. right. I do this because I'm just programmed to do this. It's biological determinism and it's it's supposed to be sort of like a uh, carte blanche to do whatever the hell you want to. It's like a license to sin kind of thing. And it's not, it's, I'm not, I, I'm not throwing out ethics or morals or anything like i wrote a whole but my fourth book is about the confluence of red pill and religion and and what's uh, you know what's going on in you know churches and 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 beliefs and everything else but that doesn't preclude the fact that like i don't i'm not saying don't be emotional i'm not saying don't be uh unethical or don't be ethical you know don't be immoral i'm just saying here's here's the nuts and bolts Here's why you here's here's why you have this propensity to want to overeat. Here's the why right. you have the propensity to want to get laid, right? How you go and do that, the practice of that is up to the individual, and sometimes that's modified by their belief set. It could be the religious, it could be their political, it could be their family, whatever it is. Um, Javier Hernandez for twenty dollars says, "Rolo, I love the Rational Mel series. I like who I am today. I have a great girlfriend and I have a great life. The understanding your books provided was a consequential part of these things. Thank you, Rolo. Thank you. Thank you back." See, that's what I like. I like I like hearing from guys like what they've done, what they built mm-hmm. as a result of it. Uh, dialogue always for two dollars says, "Are you guys and you guys say leftist Mott and Bailey?" LOL. <laughs> I think um, I know Mott I like, Bailey. 
<laughs> dialogue and always well, dialogue like always was a yeah. has a very love hate relationship with us. <laughs> <laughs> I think he's suggesting that he thinks that um I think I'm assuming what he's accusing you of is like someone will make an argument where they criticize a red pill person making a prescriptive claim. And then that red pill person will kind of like fade away into the darkness and then you'll emerge and kind of say, oh, I'm just making a descriptive claim. I think I'm assuming that's what he's trying to accuse you of here. Mm. Well, it's uh, it's presenting fact. It's the Mott and Bailey argument. I, 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 Ryan Stone used to uh, we did shows on this before, but it's the maybe I'm going to be wrong in this, but it's the idea that you you throw something out there as if like, here's the, here's the, the facts, but I'm not telling you how to think about it, but I'm really telling you how to think about it. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Yeah, of course. Because right. the very fact of the, the very act of me telling you this implies my decision or my ideology or my ethics. Sure. Um, fondue for five hours says, I don't get the gene argument. I figure genes are just markers for a reliable provider. If the beta mm. is the provider, then why have a dual strategy? Hello, fondue. It is primarily due to the fact that your your women are looking for uh, at different times in their menstrual cycle. They're looking for different features in a guy. So when a guy is like high testosterone, they're looking for a guy like with a, a chiseled jaw and a V taper and everything else. It tends to be um, women look for more masculinized features in men and find ways to to avoid. By the way, avoid their fathers and their family and their brothers and everything at that time. Uh, well, they are <laughs> ovul it's ovulation because like, they again, can't control themselves. They'll just have sex with dad. Okay. It's not. No, you want to know why? That's it's just point. ridiculous. It's how is how is it ridiculous though? Because it's just... because because men like fathers. I'm a father myself of a daughter. Um, men, fathers and brothers mm -hmm. want to look after. And you, you say, well, it's it's mate guarding. Oh, I so, I got you guarding. for mate guarding reasons. I thought yeah, you were. I thought guarding. you were insinuating that they couldn't. Like they were going to th fall into bed with whoever was available. No, 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 not at all. But like okay, the thing is, there might be, there might be. That like, makes much uh, more sense. Suitors from outside the tribe right. that need to be. The brother's going to put the kibosh on. Killed by, yeah. by brother okay. or by, the, you know, nephew or by father or whatever. That mm -hmm. makes sense. Mm -hmm. There is that weird story in the Bible where, um, is it Moses' daughters try to have get him drunk and have sex with him? That always made Noah. me very I think Noah. Yeah, yeah. That always Noah. made me very uncomfortable. Well, everyone else was dead, so you know. Yeah. What the they hell? Hate the world. <laughs> uh, Jen Happy for twenty dollars says it's not true that men want to marry down. I know from experience that guys want to know if a girl has opportunities for career advancements. It's only natural an ambitious guy would want to date a girl who is also highly educated. True. Hey. It depends, though. So I think a lot of guys use that. We didn't. We didn't get into um, the strategic pluralism theory, which is guys who have less um, sexual opportunities will have a different uh, methodology or different strategy. Okay, so it's it's sort of like the putting all of your eggs and all of your effort into one basket theory, meaning that the guys who are the eighty percent or the guys who are like the have less fewer opportunities to get with women will put all of their focus into that one woman. And therefore that then that expands into you should all be a monogamous and you should all be this is the way you should all think um, because I it's such a rare occasion for me to get with a woman that you should love and cherish her and do everything and put her on a pedestal and 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 uh, just be her sort of like indentured servant because you never know when you're when she's going to leave you or you never know when um, you know you're going to get another opportunity like this so you have to treat them like they're queens and special and everything and then there's the guys who have a lot of sexual opportunity who are like I'm just you know I'm playing the field I'm spinning plates I'm going to have uh, I'm going to date not exclusively the strategic pluralism theory means that the guys who don't have that the guys who are not the cads they're the ones who will put more effort and energy into one woman that also relates to what this guy is saying right here in that like okay well i want a girl who's smart and i don't care if she's fat and i don't care if she's like it's it's opportunism because they don't know when they're going to get their next meal if that makes a sense if that makes well, sense well i mean from from the research i've seen that you know it's it seems like men will we talk about dating down. I mean, and as kind of you said, what exactly does that mean? I don't. I don't think most men will date down in terms of no. looks, but they might date down in terms of career or have money. Have you heard the old? Have you heard the old she, saying, "No one's ugly after two a.m." Well, of course, yeah. Okay, but I'm saying that that's the difference between the fucking. You're not marrying and, like, them, though. Married, yeah. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. Um, I'm for long term relationship. Sure. 
But like, I mean, this is, I don't think you're going to see a lot of like, you know, beautiful millionaires dating ugly women. We don't really, I mean, that are men. We don't really, I don't really see that. Now we see the opposite of that sometimes. Well, but, and then there's, well, okay. I guess you could, yeah, you could definitely see the opposite. I I mean, that's arguable. I I have a, uh, like I've used, for example, I've used Jeff Bezos. I've used um, uh, Elon Musk, for example. Elon yeah. Musk just breeds. That's all he does. He doesn't right. just marry him, just have babies with them, random girls. But uh, if you look at a guy like, say, um, uh, Jeff Bezos, when Jeff Bezos got divorced from Mackenzie Bezos, he didn't like Jeff Bezos is rich enough. He could have a new chick every freaking weekend if he wanted to. He could have like like threesomes whenever he wanted to. He's the, one of the richest dudes in the world. And who does he choose to be with? Lauren Sanchez, Lauren Dirty Sanchez <laughs> has a history of being a predatory female and he's still sticking it out with this one. Why he's like that? Probably because it's because that's his mentality. That's where he's at. He could have lots of chicks. So it's like uh, Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods figured out he's Tiger Woods. He can go and nail porn stars and and you know have threesomes and whatever he wants to. Yeah. But he's married to a Swedish bikini model well, with kids, right? I mean, and also, I mean, it's just you know, not every guy. You know, I know there's some you know a biological mating strategy to just fuck a lot of women, but not every guy wants that. For whatever reason, there's like, eh, it's too much work, too and, much hassle. And yet, pornography yeah. is a multi-bazillion dollar juggernaut. Yeah, but there's a big, so that's like saying, because first person shooters are a massive part of the gaming industry, that every kid wants to pick up a gun and start like mowing people down. No, right? because you're, 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 you're reversing motive with behavior. So if the guy, I, I've, I've argued this, is that, uh, that uh, pornography has prolonged more marriages than it has destroyed. Because, yeah, I agree with that. because yeah. if you look at if you look statistically, this is out of my fourth book, 68 percent of Christian men um, admit to being addicted to pornography, even though they are in committed relationships and have been so for a long time sure. because unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. They can't practice that either because of conviction or lack of opportunity or they're just fat asses or whatever else. They can't actually go out and do that. The argument that you'll hear from like guys like Andrew Tate or or Kevin Samuels or even Justin Waller is that. You know, men are only as uh, what, faithful as their options, which I don't happen to agree with, but I understand the reasoning behind that because unlimited access to unlimited sexuality, whether that's done vicariously or that's done in actuality, it's kind of up to the guy and his ability to pull that off. Well, no, but what I'm, what I'm saying is I don't, you know, I don't buy in the whole a guy is only as limited by his options because I was saying like with Jeff Bezos, for whatever reason, mm -hmm. he has a mentality that he doesn't want to do this. He has unlimited options. And just because guys look at porn a lot, like, again, there's a big difference between, you know, the fantasy of looking at porn, the fantasy of playing a first person shooter game and actually going out and committing the act for whatever mm -hmm. reason. And it's a lot of there's a, there's a qualifiable difference between going out and killing people and, and going out and fucking people. So. <laughs> no, I under obviously the actions are different, but I'm just saying that just because people engage in this fantasy version of the behavior doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they would engage in the real version of it if they had the ability to do yeah. so. But what I'm saying is that the desire is still there. Not, not sure, necessarily just, yeah, I go out and kill people, but I'm just saying like they right. They, but well, like with you know first person shooters, you're you know you're sublimating some sort of tribal desire to you know conquer other people. And yeah, be that's why that's why you get clans, and that's why you get like people who like sort of mob up and in in role playing games and first person shooters. Of course, right. Everything is you know sublimating some sort of evolved. By the way, I have nothing against tribalism. I think people like think that I'm like against tribal. I'm, I'm not at all. Tribalism is is a feature of human nature, not a bug. It's one of the reasons. Of course, I, but it, I'm, but it, you guys, you guys yourself are a tribe, a tribe of two right now. <laughs> right. But tri tribalism, yeah, tribalism is what allowed humans to basically, I mean, I've argued that I think tribalism is the basis of morality yeah. at all. Oh, yeah. um, but it's just, you have to be aware of that because then it's very easy to fall into the mindset of, well, mm. this person's outside my tribe. So therefore, I extend to them no morality. Yeah. And I think that's what we mean when we say we're anti tribal, anti tribal is just to be aware of this. Be aware of it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, watermelon for twenty dollars says my biggest complaint with red pill red with red pill movement is it looks like a repackage of twenties dating gurus the game book with a monthly subscription plan. In some cases, I would agree. I would actually agree with that. I would say that there's a lot of guys out there who've got a a knowledge product of some kind. It's a it's a some of them are better, some of them are honest, some of them are not. Most of them are not. And the, the thing about like funnel marketing right now, and if you guys are familiar with like Jeff Walker and product launch formula and, 
and he has a book called launch. And it's like, you get these guys who are sort of motivational hustlers who want to jump into the manosphere because they see it as sort of fertile grounds for a new market. Hmm. I would absolutely agree with that. I think that that's the, one of the things I've been trying to do is make a distinction between the guys who are really about it or the guys who are just sort of about their own personal brands. And it's becoming harder and harder to make that distinction because as I said before, people want to be told how to feel. And if you can, if you can line up with tribalistically line up with what their ideology is, then you can make a whole shit ton of money off of that. And I, I would, I would actually agree with, with this guy. I think it's, I think it's, it does the red pill a disservice, mm -hmm. but uh, I would definitely agree that that's certainly yeah. the way it's going. Rolo, I saw this tweet that Shuan had did a screen cap of yours and we were <laughs> looking at this tweet and we couldn't figure out if it was a joke or not, if it was serious. So you got to let us in. Okay. It's the, the quickest path to becoming a high value male or man. <laughs> One, do not get married. Well, obviously you fucked up there. Um, avoid family I creation. Did. Look, you fucked up again. Rollo. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Come on, I'll read the three, rest. Get a vasectomy. <laughs> vasectomy in your twenties. Look, are we Keep going. Come isn't on, it get bad enough going. that get we have out. Look, isn't it bad enough that we have the trans activists trying to get everyone to sterilize themselves? Now you Keep gotta going. come out. More. Uh, lift constantly is number four. Five is eliminate all sedate sedations. Uh, six is learn game and networking. Seven is play to your strengths, build wealth. Eight is resist eating up all of your focus. I, I mean, look, I think eight could be number one <laughs> on this list. Easing up on your focus, yes. So what is this? Was this a joke or is this real? Um, no, it's uh, it's it's. Let's put it this way: it's halfway serious. Okay. Uh, the reason I okay. So here's. Would you like to know the story behind? Sure, that? let's um, hear it. Okay. So the the reason I put this out there is because yesterday, um, I didn't do anything online yesterday. I was uh, moving my mother in law into <laughs> her new apartment, which I pay for. <laughs> And um, I pay for I'm paying for a wedding with my my daughter right now. Very expensive wedding. Thank you very much. Um, I have they a like of, that. The daughters do. They really yeah. do. <laughs> oh, yeah. yeah. You know, <laughs> make it res again. <laughs> Nothing on strippers, man. Let me tell you. Um, but uh, I have a lot of people that are dependent upon me and, right. uh, and not just my family, but I have a lot of people who are dependent on me. So I was thinking about this the whole time and I'm like, man, I have to do a lot of shit. <laughs> Meanwhile, I'm losing money as I'm doing this stuff. Right. And I'm thinking to myself, and I, so the reason why I put this out there is because I also happened to watch um, Fresh and Fit last night and Brandon Carter is on there and he's on there with Derek Moneyberg. And I, you probably have no idea who I'm talking about, but uh, Brandon Carter is kind of like a positivity fitness kind of guru. He, he's very funny. He could be a, a stand up comedian if he really wanted to. And one of the things he always talks about, and a lot of guys, this is a similar message, is that to be successful, you have to love money. You have to you have to have single minded focus on just your success and just your your money, because if you don't, you're going to get lapped in the in the in the game of life. Right. And this is a guy who um, who does not have a car. He lives in Brickle. So what are you going to do? But like he doesn't have a car. He doesn't have uh, doesn't go grocery shopping, doesn't go do his laundry, he has a laundry service, do his laundry, anything that would take him away from his doing what he does to make money. He just sort of either delegates it or uh, he has somebody else do it for him. Or if like he needs to get somewhere, takes an Uber or whatever he has to do, uh, flies all very fit, very well done, has a huge following. And basically his whole, no fan. Well, I don't know if you, I know he has a son, but no family to really speak of nothing is nothing that could possibly take you away from your mission or your focus to make money, to do whatever. Everything is pushed off to the side. You want to be a, that's why I put this out there half semi seriously to be a successful guy today. If you want to be a real high value guy, forget about family. Cause I play this game with guys like Justin Waller and Tate and everybody else with my one hand and tied one hand and one leg tied behind my back because I have to take care of two dogs. I've got my wife, I've got my kids, I've got my in-laws, I've got family liabilities and, and I've, got all, I've got all kinds of different responsibilities and liabilities. And yet I'm still trying to play at the same level as the rest of these guys. So when, so people say, well, yeah, that's, that's what, a, what a meaningless existence. And I agree that that's the, the joke part of it is like, nobody's really gonna do that. But I see these guys who we were just talking about a minute ago, who are like creating these online programs and these knowledge products and everything else. And they're in their 30s, 
And they're like, oh, yeah, someday I want to have a family. Someday I want to have a, a good wife who's going to, like, take care of, you know, <laughs> the kid who can cook. Mm-hmm. You know, that's that's value added, right? Who's going to have babies and be deferential and, like, know that I'm the man. I'm a high-value guy and appreciate that and yada, yada, yada. And meanwhile, year after year, click, 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 click. And I keep thinking about, like, what was I doing when I was 37 years old like these guys or 30 or in some cases 40, whatever. And it's like I my experience, my lived experience is completely different. Because I had a wife, I had responsibilities, I had my daughter, I saw her, I raised a daughter from infancy all the way up to adulthood. And that's not a flex. I'm just saying that those things, if you really are going to maximize yourself, if you really want to be the highest value guy you can be, you've got to forget about, you've got to sacrifice family. You've got to sacrifice uh, pretty much everything that you would normally say, this is what a normal human being would do, and just follow that to its ultimate extreme. So like I said, that's halfway semi-serious. But it's also not serious. It's or it is serious in the sense that that's what a lot of these guys think. That's a lot what a lot of these guys are doing. So they sacrifice the family experience. They sacrifice relationships. They sacrifice. Uh, I mean, ultimately, well, women do the same thing though, and obviously, oh, yeah. oh, a yeah. lot of women Absolutely. come to regret that. Absolutely, yeah. they do. But well, like, high value is deceptive to be high because value enough look, to be high value the, enough. To you, get the fact that from? you say high value is deceptive because it you like you you're basically describing rich, but high, uh, like a lot of people would argue that a uh, that a too. good husband is a high value man. Like a well, good a lot of women would argue a good husband is the highest value man. Yeah, and meanwhile they don't want to have anything to do with those guys because the guys who's monogamy minded isn't the kind of guy that she wants to get with until it's it's convenient for her to want to get with that guy. Yes. So, it's at a certain time at this at depends on what it is like you go and you look at here's the thing you can't say that about all women though like if you go and you look here's and i yeah, i'm not saying 100 percent of women aren't in the hoe phase I, yeah i yeah i i agree 100 percent. but the thing right. is, is like, to say well a high value guy is um is, look, if these guys are going gotta, out to nightclubs to find the church lady they're it's doing not the just, wrong it's not thing just, it's, not, it's not just that though even the guys at, at bible study there are guys who are low quality guys and there are guys who are high quality guys at Bible sure, study. Sure, sure, sure. But like are all the hoes at Bible study? I mean, so I guess, maybe. I don't know. Do they have to be hoes? They don't have to be hoes. I'm just well, saying. You're, look, you're filtering out. You no, you're look, you're trying to avoid the hoes. We're all trying to avoid the hoes here. Like that's what you're well, trying to do. On certain nights, you're trying to avoid the hoes. Sometimes, Sometimes you won't. Please come on Access Vegas. I need you. <laughs> that's my bread and brother. Please come on. But the um the 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 long and the short of it is this is that when when you're going to those extremes, I don't think enough guys realize that to be the quote unquote high value man that all these women on all these shows are saying that they want, he's got to make, he's got to have, it's the six, 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 right? It's six figure income, six foot tall, uh, you know, uh, was it six pack abs, you know, over a six inch dick, whatever it is, you know, and have all these things. What women to the average women today do not want to get with average men. And to be average, you've got to make sac- to be above average to go from ordinary to extraordinary. You've got to make sacrifices. Now, do you have to go to those extremes? No, that's the joke in all of this. Right. In fact, I'm saying this to raise awareness to the fact that this is where this all goes. So when you say I'm going to give up, I don't want a family. I'm not going to have a wife. I'm not going to. Ha- I'm just going to have a maid come in and clean my house. I'm going to have. I don't need a car because I just have Uber take me everywhere I want to go. I don't have to go shopping because I'll just have. I'll just go eat at Moxie's all day long and whatever. Or have Uber Eats drop off some food. So anything that is a distraction away from what I do, my purpose, making money, then that's pushed off to the side to the point one soul. You know, one soul. That's, that's a difference right there. Like well, you're no, saying a high value man is a man no, that makes no, money. No religion, no nothing. That's, a, that's right. all you are is just that. Now, can people effectively do that? No. Everyone in the chat is well, saying that all women are hoes. So I just want to well, okay, well, make that the interesting, known. The interesting thing about that guy that you were describing and kind of, you know, the thing that you're kind of mocking in your tweet mm-hmm. is that, I mean, that's a, that's a great, that's a great example of someone who basically lacks free will, who has been so, it's a good example of, evolution run amok because you have like this evolutionary that's process loser talk. that's loser talk only, only well no no let me finish like let me finish i'll explain why <laughs> it's it's evolution run amok because essentially what you have here is you know it's an evolutionary process that you know men you know compete and try to gain status and all this stuff and that's what this guy is doing he's just single-minded focused on gaining status and gaining money but there's a reason for that the yeah point of gaining status and the point of gaining money 
is to get married, is mm -hmm. to have children, is to have a family, is to do all Does these things. And, and especially, and he's basically so focused on just the gaining of the status part that he's going to die alone, you know, with no family that loves him. And he's complete, yeah. like, you forgot that's the whole point of gaining the status. Mm -hmm. So he's is just been so? consumed by the process as opposed is to what that, the goal is. Is that actually the point, though? Because you go, okay, well, let's... from an evolutionary perspective, that's obviously the point. Well, evolution doesn't care about marriage, it cares about reproduction. Like you can yeah, but as you said, this guy—you said this guy has one son. He, he got a vasectomy at twenty. <laughs> is, Elon, is, right. is Elon Musk a an evolutionary success? Yes, of he's course. From an evolutionary perspective, yeah. well, he's having—he's—he's uh, he's a baby had, daddy of had, like all these women. Is, is like, Nick is Nick guy, Cannon a? Uh, <laughs> so, okay, well, but wait a minute. So from, from from two perspectives, from the guy that you were talking about, okay, if he doesn't have, a, if he doesn't even have kids, then he's going to be an evolutionary failure. But then from a personal perspective, okay, when this guy's in, you know, 50, 60, when he's 40, however, you know, if he's sitting alone in his giant house and he can't, you know, get a family, I mean, he's going to be very unhappy and realize he's wasted most of his life for what? But I mean, what is the point of gaining all this money and status if you don't, what's the point space. of gaining all this money and status if you're not going to be happy? At the if end you of don't the day? spend it. Yeah. yeah. All right. So, um, there's a, there's a lot to unpack there, and it will probably take me a long time to explain this to you, but I think a lot of people's idea of what is happiness is completely fallacious. It's a product that we sell, well, mostly women, but the idea of a permanent happiness, a permanent contentment is a pipe dream. Of course. Uh, because the human condition is defined by discontent, not by contentment. Well, it's de well we it's defined by, we have to define everything by what it's not. So you can't be in a perfect state of happiness you have mm -hmm. to have the unhappiness to understand and feel what happiness so, is. So, so from an evolutionary psychology perspective, um, happiness is something is a process. It's what we're it, what we do things that make us happy. There's no, it's not a goal state. It's not like, oh, I'm gonna get my degree and then I'll be happy. I'm gonna get a well, what? no, no, wait, wait. From evolutionary happy. perspective, it's, happiness no. would be a chemical that we evolved to basically motivate mm, us to do yes, things that would help also, us. Yes, it's something that is intrinsically rewarding. So uh, there's a really great book, and I forget the name of the author, but it's called Positive Evolutionary Psychology, and I suggest anybody to read it. It was really good. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a there's a section or a whole chapter on happiness there. Em emotions, human emotions are meant to be behavioral prompts, behavioral. Uh, of course, that's why I say this so, on so, every stream. So, yeah. so, for instance, to be happy is not actually to get to happiness. It's what you're doing is making you happy. So right. if you are if you are depressed, what that is, is that's that's your biology and your 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 brain saying, get out of this fucked up situation. So when like Andrew Tate says something like, oh, there's no such thing as as depression. No, there is. And it's meant to motivate you to get out of one condition and into another. And it's usually survival or it's reproduction. And so when it's happiness, happiness isn't like, oh, I want to be happy. I'm going to take uh, SSRIs or, you know, antidepressants and, and I'll be happy as a result of that. No, it, because it's the reason why those are popular is because of this misbelief that happiness is a state that you can endure, that you can you can like maintain and sustain indefinitely. And it's not because happiness is an emotion meant for you to get from one position to another position. So if something is intrinsically rewarding, if you're doing something that makes you happy, it's the doing of it that makes you happy, not the end result. Right. So I understand you're saying that that this guy gains happiness or contentment simply from acquiring money and status. And therefore he will be fulfilled on some level. Let's just say it suggesting. could be. It could. Right, could right. It could be, but obviously you it's know, intrinsically that, rewarding for him to do that, and ergo, it makes him happy. Well, that's why he is doing it, presumably. But so, but what I'm saying, I think, still is is still holds up. Is that to me, that is the evolutionary process run amok, because essentially he is doing something that doesn't necessarily behoove him evolutionarily. At the end of the day, if he's not having children, if he's not having a family. What if he's all. happy doing what he does, and he has he's Elon? Oh, well, I guess you know. Can and he has a lot. But but it's weird because essentially. <laughs> Like if, yeah, you could say if he's happy doing what he does and that's all that matters, I guess. But then that's essentially what is the difference between doing that and just sitting at home alone, masturbating all day, as long as mm -hmm. you feel happy doing it, right? right. The juice ain't worth the squeeze, right? Okay. <laughs> uh, William Stanley for $20 says, remember yeah, the end, says, remember the end of Titanic? Where was the ghost? The man she spent 60 years with had right. a beautiful family with and loved until her own death. True. Good point. I did a um, I did a comparison once. It was the comparison between the end of Titanic versus the end of Saving Private Ryan. And mm -hmm. the 
the what like from a female perspective you got rose who's like she's an alpha widow essentially is what she is right and she uh she's pining for jack who's dead at the bottom of the ocean right and yet you see all these pictures of her she's like amelia Earhart. she's riding english horses and she has this like lavish like rich lifestyle yep. on behalf of some guy who married her and that the heart of the sea or the diamond she just that's her heart down to what a hoe and so so you look at that and then you look at the end of saving private ryan and uh i forget is it captain miller who says you know earn this and so he's there at, at the very end of Cap uh, saving private ryan he's at captain uh, miller's grave and the first thing he asks uh his wife and he's you could tell he's old he's very elderly he's about to die right he asks his wife you know tell me i'm a good man tell me i earned this tell me i did i did the right thing tell me that my performance was satisfactory because he's like agonizing over the fact that everybody in that movie basically dies so that he can they have can the life that, so he can have the life of you know english horses and being a millionaire like having having mm -hmm. a family and having grandchildren and everything else at the expense of other people or other men who sacrificed for his on his behalf so he could have that and i made that comparison in a it's it's actually called i think it was love story or something like that i'd say essay old essay i wrote mm -hmm. but when you compare those two endings and by the way within those two movies within a year of each other one's 97 and one's 98. yeah no i think that's a great comparison and sort of gender or sex dynamics uh, and how we view the worth and the goals of men and women. I mean, the, comparing those two endings is a great example. And, and the yeah. fact that kind of like from an evolutionary perspective, men are more disposable than women is a good example of why it's bad to lay moral prescriptions at the feet of evolutionary processes. So well, it's sacrifice is what it is. Yeah. Uh, J Mac. Our surrogate father, J-Mac, for $20, says, look, we all end up as old and wrinkly farts. Only the dim-witted look for lifetime satisfaction and instant gratification. Focus on finding a partner with similar values, not a quick lay. Work on yourself and people will notice. True. Thank you. Spoken like a guy who is part of strategic pluralism. <laughs> well, no, when you don't have opportunities like that. You, what did you just say? You Thing about how like J Mac has many opportunities. Ra <laughs> rationalizing, rationalizing your position. So yeah, but saying, see, this is the this that's is the hilarious. That you're that saying so hilarious. You're, you're oh, saying that you're not laying out a prescription, but you just did right there. What I'm saying is this: is that it's the rationalization of that prescription. Like, do these things, and this is what will make you happy. In everything's in a rationalization, and on the way that you're using the term, it can be. But it's also the fact that there's there's also an ultimate outcome for it. Like, why would marriage and why would any of that make you uh, make for a better quality life than the guy like brandon carter right so he, he, he's he's reproduced no but like so him. so using j mac right so he <laughs> you know he I has a family he has a wife he's married mm -hmm. he has children okay this if this provides him with real happiness real contentment it's not a rationalization it's an actual thing that's happening to him just as this other guy who's gaining contentment from just seeking status and money yeah but that works for him Right, but I'm saying it's not a rationalization. Then it's just a, it's a real process. Well, how, okay. Here's the other thing: is like if if he didn't have all that, would he have a different rationalization? Would he have a different? I don't know. He maybe he would, or maybe he'd be miserable. Right. I don't know who he is, though. So. Well, no, but I'm saying it's you can't. This is the problem: is that you're saying that you're not laying out a prescription, but to hear someone who's married and kind of living this life and to assume that it's a rationalization, you are throwing a moral prescription on it. Not only that, it's a rationalization because they're, they failed basically. Like they couldn't have the life where they'd be the millionaire playboy. Oh, think right. about it, think about it in this terms, like as I was saying before, is you limit yourself from opportunities. You limit yourself from being able to maneuver in different ways. What would his life look like if he didn't have all of that? Would he be miserable? I don't know. We don't, we don't actually know. No, no one knows. But the fact, yeah, we don't, but the, the 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 at the end of that it's we have to convince people to reaffirm our own ideology our own convictions about what about the choices that we made of course so when you've got a guy as i was saying before strategic pluralism theory um when you've got guys like the 80 percenters have to find rationalizations to believe in what their methodology is and that that's the right thing to do. No, but like you asked, you asked me earlier, you asked me earlier about, about uh, Jeff Bezos. How come Jeff Bezos, who's like one of the richest guys on planet earth sticks with Lauren Sanchez and doesn't have a new chick every single day. Okay. He said, well, he must know something because he, he's happy. Isn't he? That's the way he is. Well, yes, 
maybe that's where it's at, but how does, like, how do we know that he wouldn't be happier in a different situation? And is that the result of a lifetime of believing that this is the right thing to do? The, the right thing to do, the, the best way to live is to have a wife and have a kids and to uh, have somebody there on your deathbed at the assisted living facility when you, when you check out. And the, the, uh, th that whole mentality itself ends up becoming a rationalization for the fact that you don't have the opportunity to live any other way. Okay, but first of all, the assumption that you that there's that you don't have the opportunity is is it first of all is an assumption with, with J Mac, it's an assumption with Jeff Bezos, it's all these things. And then it you're sort of it's weird because you are you said you weren't, but you are inherently advocating for a biological deterministic position here because you're saying that That's if someone is not I'm living just, according I'm, I'm to this a having a harem of women sort of stable strategy that they are just rationalizing away their happiness. That's not what real. Would, what would evolutionarily speaking, what would behoove a man to spread his genes? And to, like, when you look at, uh, when you look at, uh, what is it? It's not memetics, but it's like, when you look at genetics, the only stab at immortality that a guy has is to pass on his genes to the next generation. The only part of you that stays on this planet is your DNA. So, you want to know why men want variety or diversity or whatever it is. You want to know why it's unlimited access to unlimited sexuality. It's a K, 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 uh, K methodology, our, our K mating strategy is spreading the seed is because that's what men can do. Why is it that, why is it that powerful men over the course of history have had harems of preferably virginic women who are fertile and he can uh, like Genghis Khan, right? He can go and uh, have, what is it? One in every two hundred men. This, this, this doesn't address what I'm saying. Of, King, of Genghis Khan, right? Is this he, doesn't address what I'm saying. I no, it does though, because it, it does though, because here's the thing: is well, we we think that the the key to happiness or the key to some sort of contentment in life is to be married and to have kids and to have this like sort of nuclear family, when that. The, the very idea of that comes from the idea that we've been conditioned to think that monogamy is the key to all of that happiness. So, right. But so what you're, okay. But what you're saying is that essentially this cultural conditioning about monogamy, it's not producing real happiness. You're, you're saying it's producing some level of fake well, I, happiness. I just told you what happiness was all about. It's not contentment. The, the I understand that. Is just, is just, you just said it. Like the human condition is described or defined by discontent. It's not contentment. There's always another. Well, I wouldn't say it's defined by discontent. I'd say it's defined by you have to keep experiencing the opposite of something to understand what something no, I, is. Here's, okay, so hey, let me let's see if I can explain this to you. There's no such thing as contentment for. Okay, wait, wait, wait. Before, okay, we're getting bogged down. We don't need to get bogged down in the definition of contentment or happiness. Like you understand the concept of happiness and content and contentment in the way that I'm using it in this conversation. I right? do, and I think it's okay. false. I think it's I think it's an error. That's why I'm trying to, to, to explain to you the difference between like like contentment and discontent. Like the human condition is defined by discontent. Okay. What it's, term well, I, can I, I use the term satisfied with your life? Is what like what term would you like to use for this? Well, no, I was saying is you have to understand that the, the the human condition being defined with by discontent is that like that's a feature, not a bug, by the way. It's there's nothing wrong with that. It's how you how you how you get to that how you deal with that discontent, like creatively or destructively. Most people choose destructively, right? Some people choose creatively, but the fact that you're not satisfied with something or you get satisfied with something for a few months, you get your degree or whatever. And then three months later, you're like, okay, now I need my master's. Okay. Now I'll be happier if I got my doctorate. Now I'll be happy if I get to this level of the mountain and I'll keep going. Yeah, sure. It's a See, continual that happiness process. is that right. the next tier is is motivates you to keep going on and no, keep moving. No, I, listen, no, 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 I get it. It's a continual process. I don't disagree with any of this. But the problem I have is like when we were talking about the guy that you were talking about who is just so obsessed with status seeking, you said, well, if those things are bringing him contentment or happiness, even if he's not having children, you know, mm -hmm. then, you know, fine. Well, who are we to sort of criticize that? And I'm like, okay, that's, I mean, that's fair enough. But then when we talk about someone who could be doing all those same things, getting that same level of continual goal achieving of happiness and contentment, but they're doing it through in a stable monogamous relationship with a family, you label it automatically as being like low tier status. So you're throwing a moral prescription. I'm, saying, I'm saying that it's a it, it is a rationalization or it, it is an idea. That well, we're ra rationalizing your low status too. though okay well so let's let's think about it this way if i'm a guy who has lots of opportunity if i'm like an andrew tate and i have i can have unlimited access to unlimited sexuality and i don't is it better for me to live monogamously with one woman and have kids with that one woman or that is, is a moral prescription you just said better, better. 
It, okay. Well, okay. Is it more advantageous? It's a better practice for me to live That's with That's still a moral woman. prescription. According to what? Okay. According is, to what lens? I I, guess. Exactly, okay. They, my point exactly, by the way, is, is it, why do we look down on one guy who is, who has this opportunity? Looking down again, another moral prescription. <laughs> How do, the we, whole... how do we judge the difference between the quality of life of one of these <laughs> quality. guys and the other guy? Jesus Christ. It has to, it has to be. Wait, hear me so, out. No, hear me out for a it second. It has to be it's through not a moral descriptive. You can't hear, me not out. descriptive. hear me out through this. Be. Okay, let me see if I can make this in as, as Mr. Okay. Spock terms as possible, okay? You've got a guy who has opportunity to go and have sex with many women and spread his seed. No mm -hmm. problem. Anytime he's a he's a, a an emperor of, of you know Rome. Whatever. Or, Doesn't right matter. Right Genghis okay. Khan, whatever. Okay. What is better practices? What is more advantageous? And this is a I'll give you the judgment call on this. What's better for him to do? To stick with one woman and and just have one woman and have just his kids, or is it better for him to spread his seed better at according to quote what? unquote high quality guy? Better according to what? That's that's my point right there. That's but it's but no rationalization. So Guys who don't have the opportunity to do that say this is the best way to do things. That doesn't necessarily mean that they are the best way to do no, things. No, no, no. It's the best way for him to do it because he doesn't have the opportunity that a guy like Andrew Tate or Genghis Khan or – That's, Abraham not, what, that's not what you're saying. You are attributing in, in, that, in that comment you made, you're attributing that the biological imperative of spreading your DNA as far as possible – is the better option. You are making a moral prescription when you I'm say asking, that. I'm asking the question. What you, is the, you did not ask a question. What is, you made what is, okay, so what is more advantageous to society? What is more advantageous to himself? What is more advantageous to his children and his progeny? What will be a better way to do that? Now, well, when, when, I would argue it's more advantageous for society and his children for him to be in a stable monogamous well, relationship. He has been the bedrock and the foundation of Western society. No, you yes. always want to be like the twentieth kid to the to the tenth yeah. wife. That's that's right, where the sweet spot is. Yeah, well, from a from a genetic perspective, Genghis Khan. That's where you get the most parental investment. Is a more prolific male than this guy is. <laughs> okay. So, 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 depending on what your perspective is of this, is is Genghis Khan more more of a genetic success than say somebody like that sticks with one woman? And Obviously. It. So it all de depends on how you're defining success. Yes, exactly. What, that's, where the, that's, that's where that's where the, the moral, moral component comes, comes in comes into the equation. And when you don't have the options to be Genghis Khan, you will find ways to cope with that by telling <laughs> everyone. Cope? They no. See, so, so you, but you don't it's believe just cope. when when you say that you're saying you don't believe that cultural influences are real. That it's just all a version of cope. That everyone is just the biologically deterministic. Uh, well, I'm not necessarily biologically deterministic, but the the uh, the machine doesn't change. So the 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 desire for Elon Musk or Nick Cannon to spread the seed is still there no matter whether he was taught that it's right or it's wrong to have more than one woman or to play. Yeah, but like, okay, so if you, okay, so the machine doesn't change. I'm not disagreeing with that. But if we have people that grow up, you know, and say like, okay, men have some desire to fuck a lot of women, right? But if you grow up in a society where it tells you that to do that action is a bad thing, mm -hmm. and then someone does, you know, so that when someone does sleep around, they don't feel pleasure from it outside of the actual moment of the act. They feel shame from it. Okay. Mm -hmm. That's a real feeling. It's not a cope. It's a real emotional sensation that they're real feeling. feeling Culture that has, has shaped their behavior and influences after that point. Exactly. A real feeling that has been engendered by memes from whatever your right. religious convictions are and whatever else, else is there. Right. Therefore, so it, does that make it accurate? Does that make it not accurate? It makes, well, you're feeling it, so it's accurate. No, no, it's not. Feelings don't fuck your feelings, basically. Well, no, I'm saying it's accurate in terms of how you the feeling of shame or pleasure is is accurate to you as an individual. Yes, but I can mold the way you feel. I can change. I can put. I can pump testosterone in your bloodstream and make you feel aggression. Of course. Does that mean it's legitimate? Does that mean there's a purpose and a function to it? Well, that's not what I'm asking though. Well, what I'm what I'm saying is that people get drunk and they and they behave differently or they act differently. Can I can change your feelings with chemicals? Of course, no one. There's no such thing as like a pure, real person because we are all influenced by chemicals, by our environment, by all the million things that happen to us. 
So that's not my point. I obviously that's what's going on here. What my point is that when you say that someone engaged in a monogamous strategy or monogamous relationship is cope, you are by design or by ne or by necessity throwing in a moral prescription there saying that well, it's better to instead of doing this monogamous relationship to instead engage in the Genghis Khan relationship. That's what you're saying when you say that. Otherwise there's nothing to cope with. Yeah. All right. So, let's just say this. A a intersexual com combat right intersexual uh intrasexual um like fighting like combat between men and women an intrasexual way of limiting other men is to limit them from reproducing would you say that i could be sure to disqualify them from reproducing so if it were let's just say in the sense from a from a memes perspective here if I were a, a, a low value guy and I and there's more of me than there are of the high value guy, and by high value, I mean like the guys who have more opportunity of, of the, the Andrew Tates of the world, the guys mm -hmm. who have more sexual opportunity, right. would it not behoove me and my brothers who don't have that kind of ex, that, that kind of sexual opportunity to convince the high opportunity guys that it is their moral imperative to stick with one woman? Of course it would. I mean, this is yeah, you when know, we talk about how great. Like, when that, yeah, that there's an the idea code. that, that polygamy, the there's an idea that polygamy was like massively uh, against women. When in reality, like getting rid of polygamy helps men more yes. than it ever helps women. Of course. Yes, because it, what it does is it opens up a, the broader pool of men to solve their reproductive problems. Correct. Right. Yes. Oh, yeah. One so, man, one wife. So if so, it's if egalitarian, I am, if I am a quote unquote beta male, again, an abstract term. If I'm a beta male. And I have, and I'm part of the 80% of guys who are also beta males, and we have to bust our ass every day to make these to 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 reproduce, to figure out some clever way to reproduce. Would it not be in our best interests to convince the guys who have more sexual opportunity than ourselves to believe that they are also in the same boat, and it, it is that God said that you're mm -hmm. supposed to have one woman and one man. Would I think it, it's, would yeah, that it's not better be, for would that not benefit the group of guys. Who are the eighty percenters? It's, it's better. I think it, it, yeah. Obviously, it's better for those guys, but I think it's better overall for society. Yeah, be, I think for it causes the same more reason. stability. Yeah. And it may be that might that all that might be a byproduct of that. Right. But yeah, the that's why gravity, it's lasted. The intrasexual competition is to gaslight guys who have more opportunity. To <laughs> gaslighting. That's well, no, see, look, like, I make no moral prescriptions. You're gaslighting well, those wait, guys. Here, here's I mean, here's a the giant problem. moral okay. prescription. Okay. Let's look at it. Let's let look at let it from explain, a... and, and let me explain something to you. You can actually have conversations about shit that you don't agree with. Uh -huh. You can have thought experiments without endorsing those thought experiments. Okay, right. but but here, you know, here, here's the... to wrap your head around that. But that's the, the uh, uh, that's one of my biggest pet peeves of online social uh, online society right now is like everybody's fucking literal about every goddamn thing to the mm -hmm. point where you can't you can't say look, I, we can consider these concepts without actually agreeing or endorsing these concepts. Right. So you agree with it, that? Is that the, not the bench? Well, I just the, I like keystone of critical thought. I mean, you could you could phrase it as like it's a cultural apparatus that we all. Okay. You know, buy like, into you know, that cre evolutionary ad adaptation for beta but but as soon as but as soon as you call it gaslighting that they don't have the opportunity. So, but, okay, but, but as soon as you call it gaslighting, you opportunities is immoral. I I feel like there's too much of I mean, and maybe you don't buy into group selection at all because I feel like the way this is framed is purely from an individual evolutionary perspective. Because I would argue if you have two cultures, two societies, one which is highly polygamous, where like you know the top ten percent of men you know, have all the resources and have all the women and they have to compete with a, a more, you know, Western modern society that's more pro-monogamy. I think the the, the monogamous society is going to out-compete and eventually either destroy or take over the polygamous yeah, society. And, I, and you would be correct in that, but what prompts that well, Doesn't that mean that that's the evolutionary that advantage thing to do then? There's still, yeah. I mean, there are still societies right now that where, where poly polygyny is... Is, is how it, are they competing in the yeah, and, yeah, exactly and they are they're war-torn countries yes. and the economist did a brilliant breakdown of this a while back yeah. but and you that might be the side benefit of the intrasexual competition of 80 percenters 80 beta males convincing alpha males that god said that they should only have one woman even though they could have 12 15 20 whatever yeah, but doesn't that mean that the evolutionary advantage is then in favor of the monogamy, not the polygamy? Yes, but that's then? not – but distilled down to the bottom of it, it's not about whether or not the society benefits. It's about whether or not the the guys who are at the bottom of the heap benefit. 
Here's no, the, but I'm saying like so if if you're getting, you're yeah, polygamous, to, uh, see you're you're what you're I think what you're arguing is like the extra uh, the expansion of the original idea or the original concept is that intersexual competition it's more ad it's evolutionarily advantageous is that neutral enough for you for the eighty percenters to convince the twenty percenters or the four and a half percenters that they are going to go to hell if they don't stay faithful to their wives to that one woman because if they don't that means he's pulling more women out of the potential pool for the 80 percenters to get with that's the whole reason why monogamous societies outdo uh polygynous societies well, you're, because you're, you can more men can can solve their reproductive problem right and it will and that part of the issue is that it's kind of like you know when you had the example of the the guys who would that they thought if they prayed hard enough that they could you know the bolts would pass through them now obviously whatever was going on there culturally was advantageous to that society until it wasn't. And you can kind of have the same thing with polygamy. It's like, yeah, polygamy can be culturally advantageous to the men that are reproducing until the 80 to 90% of the men that don't have wives rise up and murder all of them and their right. children. And suddenly their entire genetic line is gone. Mm -hmm. And it's kind of like this kind of what I'm getting at here is that you're fixating on the way that you're describing this, I guess, is that you're only doing it from the end of like, oh, well, the beta males, the 80% of guys are the ones that are like tricking or convincing the top people into doing this. And, and you're saying it's like it's against their interest to do it, but it's not really against their interest if then that creates a society where they're safer, they're wealthier, their society is going to prosper longer and longer in the future. That's actually to their benefit. Right. Yeah, this this is the selfishness happens. beats altruism within groups. Altruistic groups beat selfish groups. Everything else is commentary. Mm -hmm. Well, so, but what is the base motivation for that? It is intrasexual competition is what it comes down to. Yeah, but so that's within can, groups. Well, if I can disqualify my mm -hmm. competitor by convincing him that he shouldn't compete, I've already won. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think like, you know, well, okay, we're, so, we're talking so about like that's, monogamy. That's, so that's the methodology. That whether or not the side benefit is like complete societal chaos or like a better way of life for the society itself is irrelevant from the beginning where it's like, I better convince all these people or, you know, collectively over the years, convince guys who have more sexual opportunity. Mm -hmm. It is immoral for them to have more than one wife. Right. Well, I, I don't think. Because I'm just you know, like the sexual marketplace or I, I don't, I don't, I, should say. I don't think a lot of these cultural attitudes or shifts are intentional processes that are created, you know, kind of like the, you know, the feminists always, you know, they kind of go on and on about like the patriarchy, like some sort of intention to do all these things. I don't think that's how it works. I think culture kind of works the same way that machine learning works, where just a bunch of random shit happening and whatever happens, the work ends up, you know, getting passed on kind of the same way evolution uh, functions. And it's kind of like, I don't think, you know, we've had monogamy and monogamy has been part of, you know, the Bible and, well, I guess it wasn't really part of the Bible because people have multiple wives, but we've had monogamy be part of cultural situations for, you know, hundreds of years, if not thousands of years. And I don't think when it started, when that meme, that cultural meme started, I don't think it started because a bunch of guys said, hey, let's trick, you know, rich guys no, into not fucking not. taking no, all the women. No, no, like, I, it's, it's just, it's, it's something it's that not, started for whatever reason and it ended up producing pro-social results. Yes. And then it's, it's, it's malice report, but the, the, it's adaptive. Okay. I don't yeah. think enough. I don't think guys said, "Hey, okay, all you beta males, come in here, and we're going to get into the sweat lodge, and we're going to talk about how we're going to limit these uh, right. exactly. our women." Uh, that uh, that didn't happen. But right. from a biological perspective, from a just a, a nuts and bolts pragmatism perspective, it is smarter for guys who have less sexual access to convince guys who have more sexual access sure. right. that they shouldn't be having that access because if mm -hmm. they they put they limit the pool of women that we as being beta males ha can can go and reproduce with. Of course. That's essentially that's well, you want to know why polygynous societies are more war torn. It's because enough guys can't measure up to get the wives that they want to get. And what well, they see this other guy over here who's the high value male with seven or eight wives until the point where they all get together and they they form a coalition and they bring that guy down by killing him or whatever, and then they take his wives, and that's how it works. So that's essentially an adaptive mating strategy. Same thing as like going and pillage, raping and pillaging the, you know, the coastal villages along the North Sea, right? Well, we got to go get some more women into the tribe. Let's go kill all these dudes and we'll take their women as, as you know, spoils of war. It's a, it, it's how it, it comes out to being either an intrasexual competition or it's, it's in some way a mating strategy. 
And so, so again, let me, mm -hmm. let me see if I can come full circle here. When guys say the key to happiness or the, the, the way to, the best way to live is to have a wife and have these kids and, and only have one wife and be monogamous and everything, and which I do, I agree with him. I 100% agree with him, but I also have to have the presence of mind to be able to say, well, that's not always the case. So if a guy has more sexual access and I'm still to this day trying to convince guys that this is the best way of life, yes, a judgment call, um, then to me anyways, that sounds like a cope or it sounds to me like it is intrasexual competition. Think like I do so that all the other guys who think like I do will have more access to ask. Well, you, I would assume you'd agree that from a social utility perspective, it's much better that society's Put if, that meme out there, right? If the conversation is about social, like, cohesion, then yes, I would 100% agree about that. But I'm just okay. saying it didn't originate in social cohesion. It originated in intersexual competition. Well, for, for wherever, regardless of where it originated, it just, it's weird because, as you know, we agree this is, we, we agree that society should be putting this message out there. I assume mm -hmm. we agree that putting that message out there makes people feel it or can make a lot of people feel it that they wouldn't feel it if society was putting out a different message. That's so, one of the reasons why guys like Tate aggravate so much because, or, or guys who will say, what is it? Oh, open on my end, closed, closed on her end, which again, I don't happen to. Well, that goes against the egalitarian ideas that have been kind of being pushed forward for the last 50 years. That's why Tate. Well, it does, like but that. it also, but it also goes against the monogamy that you just described. Yeah, but and well, what I, I, get, mean, I get to have all the pussy I want. And if you guys are, if you guys don't do what I do, then you're that's a judgment call right there. Yeah, uh, but but what Tate is, well, first of all, it's hilarious because to me, Tate is obviously uh, supreme. Uh, let's I just say the, let's just is the say right say word. The He's character, like the, the character that is Tate. Let's just go with that. <laughs> the character, well, yeah, I, the, he's like the supreme uh, con artist, the supreme salesman, essentially. Um, what is he? he makes what is the character his, selling you? Well, I mean, he made his money, you know, tricking males into giving him money and through through women. And now he's making his money by or he was before he got arrested, tricking males into giving him his money directly without through women. So it's just the whole thing is kind of funny to me. And but yet there's, And yet there's he, millions of guys worldwide. Yeah. Lining up to, to do it. Yeah. Well, so what is it about that message about that? Even if let's just say for sake of argument, it is a care. It, it's a con. Even if it is, why is that message so attractive to them? Because that? people are they're, looking for meaning in their life that they're not fulfilling. I don't think they're looking for meaning at all. They're looking for ways to solve their problems. They want a harem. They want well. That's part of it for sure. They want success. They want a purpose. It's really. I, I think meaning, there's meaning, a, is a, meaning is what's called a, a container word. You can put whatever you want to in of that. Of course, of but course. Purpose is something different. People, well, what people are looking for meaning. They're looking for a purpose. I think there's a big problem that's happened within Western societies where. There's been a big push in feminism to have like you need to respect the women, you need to, you know, no means no. And it's kind of like basically put a lot of guys in a situation where they are waiting for women to act relationshiply and sexually, and then women don't. And thus a lot of shitty guys or a lot of alpha people or whatever you want to call them, you know, more aggressive sexually guys will then scoop up all the women. And there's a bunch of guys standing around like, what the fuck? I followed all the rules of feminism and now I'm out in the cold. And mm -hmm. so, you know, the ideas of kind of the Tate are very appealing to them. Yeah, you just you've just defined the red pill. Everything I've been told was the, I've been doing everything the right way, but you're telling me that women don't actually respond to this, and that's you want that, that's how we had to come to this in the first place. Well, so, it's because yeah. there was a level of social conditioning that only was given to men, and there was no social conditioning that was given to women to say, well, you need to be more aggressive in terms of you know your relationship stuff you need to be take you know you need to be more forthright with your stuff it was just all one-sided towards to curbing the negative behaviors of males and it was easier to do that when women were dependent upon men it was right. easier to say it was easier to say here's what uh, here's how to make yourself more uh acceptable more attractive more uh you know, value added, let's just say to men, when men were the ones who had the advantage of being the ones that were going to be dependent on by women. Well, what I'm suggesting of, I don't think it has to do with dependency. It just has to do with more of the feminist movement viewed it as men were the problem and mm -hmm. women were not. So there was all the focus on changing men's behavior. And actually the only focus, and I yeah. think this is the, one of the biggest flaws of feminism. Feminism didn't, at least in like the sixties and seventies, it didn't raise up. The feminist argument was not, Hey, as a society, 
we should value female characteristics the same level that we value male characteristics. It was, it was a blank slate idea of just females should be men. Yeah. You know, women should women just should fuck, you know, the men sleep that they around as much as men do. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's not going to work. Yeah, because there's a, there was this misguided belief in human nature at that time that we we're just blank slates and that women were just right. oppressed and, and you know, beat down by the quote unquote patriarchy. When in fact, patriarchy was actually the more balanced of the system. Like right now we have gynocentrism, which is essentially all authority and 0% responsibility for women. If you look at androcentrism, that's tyranny as well. So if it's like one man, if it's all, if it's all authority for a man and it's all responsibility for women, then you get like what the handmaiden's tale, right? <laughs> That's it. But when you look at patriarchy, patriarchy is actually a much more balanced system because it is responsibility that is tempered and buffered by authority. So well, man has the authority to affect the responsibility that we ex expect of him. Right. Well, anyway, moving on. Uh, CT for two Canadians says six, Adam, don't be modest. You're a 10. Well, thank you, CT. That's very nice yeah. of you. And uh, J Mac for another twenty dollars says Adam is a sexy mofo, a sensitive artist, and has a ni a nice bassy voice. Ten out of ten. Look at this. Go. Everyone's giving me a ten. This is great for my ego. I, I like it. There you go. It's I can use it like to filter. when I need the cope later tonight that I don't have a harem. I'll look back to these super <laughs> chats. Hey man, welcome to my world, man. People tell me the same shit. Like, oh, if he was a high value guy, he wouldn't just be with one girl. That's true. You are okay. coping. That is. True. I don't. I have. Had had the opposite experience as the war maidens thing that you talk about i've had some women pine after me far too long than they should <laughs> so do they come looking for you on yes it's like very uncomfortable later on yes mm -hmm. it can be very very oh you made something of yourself <laughs> uh calvin pafford for five dollars says cad versus dad isn't two different isn't two different types of men men are all cads to almost all women and then they become get dads to get higher enough value women Okay. Um, Caleb B for five says, "Why entertain these nerds? The whole business model is fostering a fear of being cuckolded. Nobody who hasn't been cucked writes essays on war crimes." Ouch. Okay. Wow. Oh, jeez. Um, I'll be here for you when you need me. There you go. <laughs> Jan Habby for five dollars says, "I 100% agree with Adam. A relationship should be between equals. On all women are looking to marry up, and not all men are looking to marry down." I would disagree uh, with that. I think that from a, an evolutionary perspective, women are looking for more dominant men. That's why one of the reasons I have a problem with this egalitarian model, w women want a guy who is bigger than them, taller than them, makes more money than them. And, but, you know, the, I, but wants to, but believes he's an equal to her. And I've, I've, I've always said this is that women cannot look up to a guy who is her equal. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, Matrix 07012 for 50, because Arkazark says people are having less relationships in general, not just men. The hyper promiscuous women you see everywhere are a minority. I think uh, I, I, they are in a minority, but uh, this kind of goes back to one of the questions you guys asked me earlier was, um, I, I think it was, was it Destiny who said that he was on, on, on Martin and Fresh's show and he said something like, what, what percentage of co-eds do you think like believe that they can be like flown out to a yacht party by Drake or something like that? And, and it was like flown to Dubai and they, or something. Yeah, and, yeah. So, and, I, and God damn it, Fresh. Fresh was like, oh, oh, probably like 30%. I'm like, Jesus Christ. Like, and that, it's a fraction of 1% is really what it is. Right. But that's not the point. The point he should have been making is this, is that the perception of women online is that it could happen like they well, that, that mm -hmm. they could be flown out or they could and it doesn't have to be drake right i mean they could be flown out they could be worthy of the attention of like an nba an apple leader or, or whatever else so it's not so much the actuality of it as the perception of it and so therefore what happens is those women end up limiting themselves from meeting guys who are like at their school or wherever in their social circles mm -hmm. that they might actually be a really good match with but because of social media and because of, you know, Instagram being the number one dating, you know, uh, app on planet Earth right now, it's the perception that it might happen and that they're going to hold out for something better. That's what he should have been focusing on. But right. No, it's I, the, percent. the clip I saw, I don't I, it might be talking about different clips. The clip I saw was the question was something like, how many women do you think are flown out to Dubai yeah. Yeah. Or some place to like Miami, engage in yeah. high class prostitution or something, and they gave you know like fifty yeah. percent or something Crazy. outrageously high number. Crazy, like, but like, but then again, you got to remember it's a global sexual marketplace, so it's not just the girls at you know universities; it's all over the planet. 
Yeah, but that's still a tiny fraction. Of oh, it is. Oh, the actual, I, and I agree with you. The, the actuality of it is a tiny fraction. Yes. The perception that it could happen to them is is the uh, creates a different like social narrative for women. Well, also, I, I think there's a perception here for men, uh, which is like, oh, you know, why do I like it's like it's an anger towards women in terms of that, you know, it's like having having to to a large extent you know having a relationship with someone is an illogical process that evolution has kind of forced upon us and made us feel this way that we want these things because if you look at it from a just a a purely you know logical you know vulcan perspective it's like you know oh are you really gonna waste all your time and energy doing all this shit just to like stick your dick in a vagina and have a you know kid that is going to cost you money and energy it seems like such a hassle and i feel like a lot of men kind of have that in the back of their mind floating around nowadays. And so there's sort of this kind of anger towards the idea that like, oh, I have to put up with women because I'm kind of forced to by biology. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, that's uh, and that's a, that's a primary tenet of the black pill, right? Where it's yeah. like, don't even bother with women anymore. Just get yourself a dog and a sex doll. There you go. You satisfy all your sex needs. Only robots. Increase with okay. the sex robots. Uh, yeah, sorry, I got to <laughs> update my software here. It's only going to increase, yeah. Look, she's got to clean the kitchen while I'm not fucking her. Yes. There you go. Uh, yes. Why can't you do both? What's that? Oh, yeah, that's a great idea. <laughs> Multitasking. Go down into the dispensary and get me some weed, too. Yeah. Uh, fondue for five dollars says, if we understand these feminist ideas collapse women's trust in men, is the red pill not destroying men's trust in women? Um, I think from the perspective of that, it's turned into a commercial enterprise. I would say yes. I think mm -hmm. in its purest form, it's again, it's the red pill is meant to educate and equip. So it's it again, it's not that the red pill doesn't exist. So you will hate women. It exists so you won't hate them for what they can't be to you. You you have to admit though, that, like how you educate does create kind of a narrative. That, well, there's no way to avoid that. I can just, right. I can't even turn on the camera without somebody going, he's giving advice. Well, I mean, I think like, you know, it's we can talk Bailey about thing, right. If I, if I, if I give you some like sort of information, it could be the most innocuous shit. And people will say, oh, he really means this, right? Because he's giving you that, that it's like, what is it? A, the observer effect, right? Observing a process. Well, if, if, if 100% of women engage in the dual mating strategy or you know, 0.05% per of women engage in, engage in the dual mating strategy. That's going to create a far different level of trust in the opposite sex. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How are you going to deal with it? What are you going to do about it? Well, I are just, I don't know that we have, I don't, I'm not comfortable saying 100% of women do this dual mating strategy because I don't know that that's true. Okay. That's true. So, that's factually so think, correct. Think of it like this. Dual mating strategy is like a subroutine that's going on in the background all the right. time. Right, I understand how that women, you're saying it, it's happening women, subconsciously. How, use, how women can turn that to advantage, or how they exploit I that. I still or don't know that that's true. I mean, you're explaining the motivation is unconscious. I don't think that changes the what the the reality well, of the situation of the so numbers. What would it, so what would the what's the, I'm open to the ideas. What would, would the opposite be? What would be the other thing that would that would be running? Well, the, the thing the thing that convinced David Buss was when when women have affairs and the, evidently they've taken statements from these women that have affairs that that, uh, you know, basically write out the reason for the affair, that it wasn't mm -hmm. this dual mating strategy. It was I want to leave the guy that I'm with. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But she has to be with the guy in the first place. Right. What motivated her to want to get with that guy? Well, so you're saying she was doing this dual mating strategy. Well, I can also we can also point out this too. Like, what about the very rich women who's who are with married rich, super rich guys, and they fuck the pool boy? Did she not with the look, pool boy? He can't. He can't possibly outmatch the all the spending all, power. These are the guys. All of human jealousy evolved in men to solve the cuck problem. Every bit of human jealousy exists because of the cuck problem. So I mate just, guard. yeah, um, mate guarding exists because of the cuck problem. Yes. Uh, so I just, I'm saying people want to know what the, le you know, what the opposite sex is doing to them uh, in the cuck realm. And so they can develop a contingency against. Right. Them. And if you're living in a society where, you know, 100% of women are trying to cuck you, that's going to give you a different kind of <laughs> strategy than if you're living in a situation where you're like, oh, only the super whores on Instagram cucking, are trying to cuck a guy, you. Cucking, cucking a guy is the methodology, 
I'm gonna. This is how I'm going to solve my reproductive problem. I need to get the best genetics. Right. I know. I, I understand. Best, I totally best, understand it. Look, I security. totally understand it. I understand. I understand the strategy. But this methodology still come from the same root, which is the dualistic mating strategy. Right. Right. I just, you know, on average, I want to know, like, how many women are. This is their main strategy. So, I think the. I mean, I obviously I'm nice. biased. Okay. I would I like to that. think that it's not 100%. What about the what about the woman who has three kids by two fathers and then she expects Well, she, I, I don't deny that some title. women are doing this. Like I don't deny that it is a strategy. Like well, men men have a men have a dual a different methodology. Though. Men have a dual mating strategy too. It's it's long-term monogamy or fuck and run, right? I mean they're Sometimes doing it. Both. <laughs> yeah, sure, sure, sure. I'm just saying, I'm sure women want to know, you know, how many guys are practicing fucking run and they're going to um, tailor their mating strategy according to about, that. We're talking about two different things. The first okay. one, is, one of is the methodology. Cucking is a methodology. But the basis of that is the dualistic mating strategy, the, the principle, meaning I need to get the best genetics I can with the guy who is also can provide parental investment, protection and, pro and provision. Right. So, how do I so, go and do that? Sometimes it might be marriage is the best way to do that. You're still looking for the best option. You're still hypergamous or, or <laughs> dualistic right? in the sense that you're like, looking for the guy. It doesn't matter if it's Bible study or not. You're still looking for the guy who's the alpha of the fucking Bible study. Look, uh, every, so the chat is basically saying Adam wants to believe. Every, like we don't know. <laughs> we we don't on we don't know what the numbers are. Like right now, there's there's so many women in the world, right? And you know, there's a there, there is an objective reality to how many of these women are practicing this dual mating strategy and how many are just practicing a monogamous mating strategy where when they commit affairs, they sw are switching partners. Look, you admitted it. People people's mate value uh, oscillates throughout their life, obviously. So you're trying to keep your mate value and your mate's mate value in sync unless you're just out of it and you're like uh mm. i don't care <laughs> like if this person leaves me um mm -hmm. so the this obviously would change the mate value of women dramatically right mm -hmm. well let me ask you something you just said a minute ago that you had like uh women were like like old flames would come up to you and mm -hmm. say well that you knew knew before and they now suddenly they want to suddenly like reconnect with you. I, I've had like I, none are pursuing me now, but I've had it happen in the past, and it does. It is kind of uncomfortable. Yeah, you're familiar with what? Sure, of course. I'm sure you're familiar with. Yeah, of course. Okay. So, but are these women who didn't want to give you the time of day before? No, obviously not. Friends, yeah. and suddenly now they want to reconnect with you. Or were you? Were they old girlfriends that you broke up with? Old in the girlfriends, past? yes. Yeah. Okay, and then you, but you broke. She broke up with you. You broke up with her something happens normally right. it's i'm breaking up with them yeah. if they're continuing to pursue me right okay but but so now suddenly what what's different about you now that will make you more attractive than you were when you broke up and then it would prompt them to want to like rekindle something with you well i don't know it's just uh, maybe are you in a better place now than you were when you broke up with them you're married now that's the difference yeah that could be, <laughs> i like, guess that's definitely a, that's a force multiplier for sure but yeah Oh, it is? Okay. But are you, you're in a better place financially, physically, mentally, judgment-wise, maturity-wise? Are you in a better place now? I mean, he likes to think remember? so, but I'm I, sure. Yeah, totally. <laughs> I'm not sure I've changed much. But. Have you have you increased your value, like, whether it's, like, Hypothetically, sure. <laughs> so would that not be a woman looking for something that's looking for, like, really, really the sure thing, because she's already familiar with you, but... Would that not be her looking for a bigger and better deal than she's getting? Sure, but I just everybody is like looking for. Well, not better. I guess. I guess it it just it, it. I think people are looking for a better deal if you get in a relationship, and I think this is this is good advice. And if the red pill guys are giving this advice, I think it it's something people should listen to. Like you can't your relationship can't be on autopilot, right? You have to be conscious of the fact that, you know, you're you're sharing a life together, so that you want 
you you know you want to keep your mate value in check with your partner's mate value. So if you're going to, you know, gain 500 pounds and yeah. decide, you know, you're going to quit your job and not do anything, uh your mate value is going to drop dramatically and that's probably mm-hmm. going to make this person think, "Oh, you've done, you know, you've done something that I never sign up for, I never agreed to." So I I don't know like uh a lot of people, you know, this this de- till death do us part, and people want to strain the relationship to the point where they really want to test that till death do us part. So I think keeping keeping track of uh, your relationships and your mate value, I think that's a good strategy. But obviously, hmm. unfortunately, a- unfortunately, only one sex is rewarded for not doing that in modern marriage. Women, sure, yeah. yeah. I mean, there isn't enough pressure, like you know, women who are like, I don't want to have sex anymore, right? That's true. That's that's like essentially at some level. That's the guy like gaining five hundred pounds, right? Let's say you get body fat acceptance, right? It's your. That's why I keep saying it's like responsibility and authority, right? Men have the responsibility; they have no authority in it. But one, but men would if look the not wanting to have sex anymore is a change in mate value. Obviously, like bringing home a cuck baby is a change in mate value. Um, (laughs) they're just what I'm. Just that's the dual mating strategy is a thing that I don't necessarily know is true. And I think it could be sabotaging what could be decent, healthy relationships by causing an undue level of paranoia. And I'm, I'm, look, I've been, I don't want people to be happy and married. I believe in the buddy system. Like, I think people need someone that they can share their life with, it, it, whether it be, you know, a friend and, and, or, potentially a, a partner. I, it's so many, so many times people get in these loveless marriages and I just, I feel sorry for those people. I really do. So I'm, I'm team, like find yourself a partner and, and fall in love and, and have a, a good relationship. So I just, I know the thing that often stands in the way of good relationships is conflict and jealousy is a hu- always a huge conflict in relationships. And if some guy goes to the internet and thinks you know, 100% of women are, are want to bring home a cuck baby, then that's probably going to damage their, if he believes that, that's going to damage their relationship. He's going to be hyper vigilant about his woman. And even if his woman is completely innocent, you know, look, I love you. You know, your mate value is two notches above me. Why would I ever leave you? It's still going to be a, con- a consistent conflict in their relationship. Do you disagree? I think that the idea of jealousy and the idea it's really rude for for men, but you gotta remember men and women get jealous for different reasons. Of so course. Women, I, I yeah. fidelity. Okay, so let me I'm gonna throw a few things out here too uh, that, that might maybe this will uh, help you like get a better idea of the difference between what I'm saying and what Dave Buss has decided his his new grift. Um That's so yeah. sad. Come on. <laughs> Well, the, so the, but the idea is this is, first of all, I, I already pointed out the fact that, you know, female ovum, just, you know, chooses sperm. So there's already, there's the biological aspect of that. But when we look at jealousy and we look at uh, infidelity, especially in a case of infidelity, first of all, men make guard for different reasons than women make guard. Women make guard because they're ensuring the long term, they're ensuring long term security. Women get far less uh, upset at like uh, se- uh, infidelity when it comes to just Please. sex. That when that when there's infidelity occurs between men and women, women ask, "Are you in love with her? Do you have an emotional attachment to her?" We uh, we understand, Rolo. I hate to interrupt, but we understand the the aspects of mate guarding. Mm-hmm. We both understand that. Like the question that I have is about unnecessary paranoia. Like there is a time to be paranoid, but the, I think you agree. Sometimes paranoia can go too far. If you are literally paranoid that your wife is fucking the office boy or the pool boy, and that's the furthest thing from her mind, that could damage your relationship. Right. If you allow it to get to the point of paranoia. So when a guy is suspicious of his wife, Mm -hmm. guy has that gut instinct. It's generally because his subconscious is picking up on cues like behavioral inconsistencies with that woman, whether it's his girlfriend, his wife, or whatever. Mm -hmm. She doesn't usually act like this. Or yeah. perhaps she's with another guy and suddenly she takes an interest in Swedish death metal because the guy that she's with has an interest in that as well. Right. Certain things change. In, in some cases, like even your conscious mind 
doesn't register those, but there's something where you go, maybe I should go look through her phone, right? I've had guys ask me that. They go, I think she's cheating on me. Should I snoop through her her, her DMs or her, her texts or whatever like that? Not so much anymore because women just put it out there for, for the world to see as it is these days. But I'm like saying, I'm telling them, look, is that just instinct? Because the instinct to make guard, that's where I was going with this. The reason to you get jealous, the reason you make guard is because there's an instinct in that guy to want to do that. So again, studies will show you that that when men tend to mate guard most is when that woman is ovulating, when she's wearing the red dress, when she's got the hoop earrings on, when she says, hey, I want to go out with my girlfriends to Vegas this weekend. Is it okay with you? Those okay. incidences, <laughs> and they're just, hey, they're imperceptible. I know. And it seems innocuous, right? But don't if get you're, look, paranoid. If your wife you're is like your... having sleepovers with her guy friends, I think maybe a little paranoia okay. is yeah, justified. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'm just, I'm just talking about this idea that 100% of women want the alpha fucks, beta bucks, reproductive strategy. Like people, even people in the chat are dropping statistics about how many paternity tests come back of some other guy. So that like, obviously they're using some form of evidence to make the argument that no, you are correct. You know, 100% of women do this strategy. And what, what's the statistic they were dropping in the chat? Like 30 to 40% of women, the child is not, does not really even belong to the father and the father doesn't know that is tough for me to buy. What about 42% of children being born out of wedlock? Well, no, that's a different situation because no, it's, it's, it's a relationship because, though, because, because the expectation you know, is that they're going to find the, the dad who stepped up. No, I, and I, I, I but this moment. is a voluntary situation though, obviously. And, the, and I would like, that is an example of perhaps the, um, this dual mating strategy. But I, the, I think if we looked the, closer at the evidence, we would think, you know, what happened was they got in a relationship and then there was some discrepancy in mate value and someone wanted out of the relationship. So that's a possibility. The other possibility is this, is that women have sex with other guys, have their babies and then have other men marry them later. It's yeah, but that's a voluntary a thing. The guy is not literally not a cuck because he's volunteering to be look, a cuck situation is where you don't know you're raising another guy's kid. Is it? Well, I mean, or is the term comes from. Let me explain. So, is is it that is the definition of cuckoldry, a man taking care of and investing parentally, provisionally, and protection wise? Is is it his responsibility to take that uh, uh, the child of another man, the offspring of another man, and raise it as his own? Is that you think it's the definition of cuckoldry? Well, if it's under nefarious circumstances where he doesn't know, it is. So, you, so, yes. you're, so again, we're, we're you're applying the, functionally. It's the same thing. Whether well, no, you, 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 I know. I understand. Has, you could say a stepdad is a cuck. Like, sure, but I don't. Wait, wait, wait. It's wait. It's no. Wait, 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 wait. Definitionally, well, cuck for. has always meant that it's an unknown thing. True. From yes. the beginning. So, okay. yeah, I mean, but you can re want to redefine it, but right, that's what so it always meant. Right, so we're going to talk about, okay, so semantics aside. It's, well, it's, wait, wait, wait. It's not semantics. It because is semantics. When you, wait, whoa, wait, wait, wait. No, 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 wait, 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 wait. <laughs> it's not semantics. It is not semantics. Because by saying someone is a cuck, it's, we all know what that means. There's an obvious moral claim embedded in that term. Nobody wants to be a cuck. So to attribute that, to someone who gets into a relationship, say, with someone that already has a child and say that they are a cuck, you're attributing a moral claim to that action. Well, and a lot of times they just have kids is with other parents too. The so they're like, is uh, the outcome the same? No, it could be entirely different because you can get in a relationship with a woman who you know has a child and you mm -hmm. agree, you're like, okay, and you can have children of your own with them or you could be fine raising mm -hmm. the child. It's very different than well, I'm with a woman. She's raising a bunch of children that aren't my own. You have no idea. Maybe you don't even have your own children at that point. Are you responsible for that man's children? Uh, are you, are you, you, are if you if you take the responsibility the as your own, yeah. Are the resources that you will be directing towards your own children mm -hmm. being compromised by another man's child? Who you 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 are now taking responsibility? Well, for. if Is you view it, it as compromised, you're sharing your resources with someone that doesn't share your DNA. Sure. Okay. Is that not the definition of being cuckolded? I mean, I share my resources. No, it's not. With Sitch it's literally not the definition. The outcome <laughs> as being cuckolded. What is the difference between rape and sex? Consent. Consent. Yeah. Are, are they the same action? Of course not. Okay, but the same outcome. 
is there. You can get pregnant from being raped and you can be pregnant from getting sex. Yeah, but it's not, There's you no, can, but that doesn't mean it's the same thing. Okay, it's the same thing in this in the respect that you still have to direct your protection, your resources, your provisioning, everything else to a, to another man's child. That's okay. paternity. Look a lot. Know, like, so so here's the thing. So why is it that men are so? Why do we have mate guarding instincts? Why do we have jealousy? Why do we have? Why do men fixate on the act of sex itself? So when a woman is has in, is, cheats on her husband, his number one priority is where'd you fuck? Was it in the kitchen? Did, was he have a bigger dick? Where did it go? Did he get off? What was it? It's all this visceral want to know like the details of the sex. Whereas women are more concerned. Answer, because yeah. it's paternity. That is the number one priority that men need to ascertain. Is the kid my kid? That's why when we talk another uh, red pill thing is one of the reasons why guys talk about women's notch count in a different term and in, in different contexts than they do for their own is because men want to know that a woman is a good bet for his long-term paternity. They want to know that the child is his. That's why effectively, functionally, whether that woman has kids with someone else and he voluntarily signs up to be a cuckold or he gets cuckold proactively, the effect is the same. He is taking care. He's find some, found some way to sublimate his, whether through deception or through his own acceptance, he's found a way to sublimate his jealousy and his mate guarding instinct for the fact that he, maybe he's going to have a kid with her later or something. But what he's done is he's taking over the response, the parental investment responsibilities of another man. Right. That's so difference. But, that's right. that in, in my book, that is cuckoldry. That the, okay. the, 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 the end result is the same. So, so putting aside that, obviously, you know, uh, a person, a parent or an adult can form a, you know, a relationship, a loving relationship with a child that's not their own, mm -hmm. whether there, there's a step parent or they have adopted a child. Or I'm something sure they like love that. it. Yeah. You know, extent, putting all that aside, right? When you're talking about like getting in a relationship with someone that already has children, uh, which, you know, for a lot of people is definitely a factor. It could be a deal breaker. It could be something that influences the relationship. So it's, that's, a male, you know, it's a significant. A male, it's a male adaptive strategy. For yeah, it's a, yeah, well, it's, it's just it's a significant factor in relationship, right? But but a man, say, because we're talking about kind of men in this situation, mm -hmm. a man could very easily find a woman who is, you know, for him, the perfect woman in terms of looks and personality. And mm -hmm. she already has a child. And he could say, well, you know, I'm making the calculation that this is going to bring me, or at least I believe it's going to bring me, you know, more long-term happiness or contentment or whatever we want to call it, satisfaction with my life, even though that this person has a child that's not my own. And that, I mean, that's just a calculation you make. And you don't have that calculation. If someone's doing this behind your back, none of that's weighing into any of this stuff. So mm -hmm. to me, to just call it cuckoldry is essentially you're saying that it's immoral for a man or wrong for a man to, A, get into a relationship with a woman mm -hmm. that already has a kid, or B, you can even extrapolate it out to say it's wrong for people to even adopt children. Well, I'm saying it's point. right or it's wrong. I'm saying it's the the end result is functionally the same. So it well, no, just, saying it's cuckoldry is saying okay, it's wrong. You, okay, nobody so, okay. wants to be a cuck. Think of think of, like try to dissociate your your understanding of cuckoldry as a bad thing or a good thing. It is. That's impo it's literally it's impossible. It's literally impossible. All right, then then let's just say. Well, we we don't call stepdads cucks, so okay. we call them stepdads well, because it's like. There's no moral component to being Cuckle a Cuckoldry by definition the is a negative thing. The very fact that you want to make that distinction is a moral judgment. The very fact that you want to say, well, they're stepdads, so they're better than being called a cuck. See what yes. it is? Yes. Yeah. yeah, it's a moral claim, yeah. Okay. So, but what's the difference in the end result of the cuck or the stepdad? I already explained <laughs> Explained it. The well, you're, you're looking at it from like this so, this moral perspective of like the heel. Well, you're looking at it from like a weird. You're looking from a consequential perspective. Do you which think I don't buy into doing the same thing? Do Do you hold on? If you're in a situation where certain aspects of the situation are hidden from you, you can't do any sort of realistic cost benefit analysis. Mm -hmm. So the cuck is in a situation where he can't do that cost benefit well, analysis. Mm -hmm. Wait. No, that's the, the person, the person that is dating a woman knows that she has a kid. Understand, like understands, she knows the father of the child, or he knows the father of the child. Like he can do that cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. and come to whatever conclusion he wants. That's the difference. Yes, but effectively he's doing the same thing. Well, no, you yeah, the, 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 when you wait, bring wait, in wait, Cuck, wait, wait. you're basically saying he's coming to the wrong conclusion because it's a conclusion that you disagree with. I don't necessarily. I didn't say I agreed or disagreed with it. I'm just pointing out the fact that the cuckold and the stepfather are doing the same thing. Okay, but by you 
so when you say they're doing the yeah. same no when when you say they're doing the same thing what you're what you're saying is you're kind of taking this end game biological consequentialist approach mm -hmm. you're saying well from a purely strictly biological perspective you know from an evolutionary perspective a man is raising another man's child so it's the same action right <laughs> where you're putting your focus on how to determine an action is a moral claim that you're making when you do it so you can't say that you're just making a descriptive claim because you're not. You're making a moral prescription by the, what you're how you're framing this. Making a descriptive say that's the thing is you can't open your mouth without somebody telling you how to how to feel about it. Okay, what I'm saying is that functionally speaking, it's the same thing. It's the same outcome. No, but do, that, do you understand what I do? You understand what I'm saying that you're by focusing on what aspect of this complicated situation is going to be the end goal here for to describe the action. That's a moral claim. Again, I can't I can't open my mouth and describe the situation without it coming off as a moral. It's not no, it's not coming off. You're doing it. It's <laughs> that's what you're doing. In what way? By saying that a cuckold is by, by saying that the cuckold and a stepdad are effectively the same thing. By def okay, so I'll go back to the sex rape example. We do not classify rape and sex as the same thing, mm -hmm. even though they can have the same outcome. Mm -hmm. right? right? Okay. So obviously we're saying, well, so the that's way a, that we're going to categorize that's a moral that's a moral call right there exactly exactly it's a moral I call say, right i can also say this okay uh during wartime there are more incidents of rape during wartime than there are when we're not at war okay why is that well functionally speaking men need to solve their reproductive problem before they get shot because tomorrow's not a guarantee when the bullets start flying so is it a is it a phenomenon amongst human beings that Rape increases during times when men's existence or the, the whether or not they're going to take a bullet the next day increases because they are either immoral or are they trying to solve a reproductive problem before they get killed? Well, I'm, first of all, I'm, this is kind of irrelevant to what I'm talking about, but I would no, it's, it I would think because, that 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 making, action we're making it, what I'm doing is I'm observing a, a I, I don't think it's a process. Yeah, I, I don't think it's the well, I don't think it's the fear of death is making like, oh, I have to reproduce before I die. I think it's more just that when you're in that hyper adrenalized aggressive state of mind, you're going to be more likely to commit you know an action. And right? it's time of war. There's no consequences. I mean, yeah, I, I think there's a lot of factors that go into that. I don't think you can narrow it down. Why don't we? More. Then why don't we go eat spaghetti instead? Why don't we go uh, do do other acts instead of that? Well, well I I would bet you that if I would bet you that rape is the is the default and not going and doing something completely. Well, no, but wait a minute. I would bet you if you study men in war who are worried that they're going to die, they engage in an entire host. Of oh, yeah. actions that are unhealthier and and less safe and less moral than they Smoking, would engage in normal drinking drugs. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Right, because you kind of have this live fast, die young attitude when you're in that nice. situation. <laughs> so yeah, no. Do but, all the cocaine my, tonight. Right. We may be dead. But, but my point, no. But going back to what I was saying, like we can talk about, like someone could say, "Oh, I'm an evolutionary biologist." And they can talk about evolution mm -hmm. on a descriptive level and not put any moral prescriptions to. The process of evolution but if that person started to describe say say that they were like talking about human relationships and they started saying like oh these people are unfit these people are producing unfit children and they kept saying that and you're like well wait a minute you keep calling their children unfit you're really should we be engaged in eugenics and they say well wait a minute no 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 i just mean unfit in like an evolutionary biological descriptive sense like well no that's not what's happening by using that language and saying it they are making moral claims based off of something biological and you know kids, if they hear you say there's it, like a stepdad and a cuck are indistinguishable from one another, they're going to think, I don't want to be a stepdad. Of like course. that's going to go into the the cost benefit analysis. And okay. that's it's just sad um, if they could actually well, have just, like let's a. Take, let's take the moral judgment out of the whole thing here. OK, so if we go and say, don't worry, you're not a stepdad. You're the dad who stepped up. You're you're solving your reproductive problem because you got with a good single mom and you decided to take over the um, the parental investment responsibilities of another man's child, and therefore you are a better individual for doing that rather than the guy who doesn't do that or or the deadbeat dad who we presume left mom and you had to come in and step up and take over his responsibilities because he's a son of a bitch. And you are the noble guy who, who swept in and took over the responsibility because that's the right thing to do. 
I don't. I don't think you need to lionize them. I just don't think you need to demonize See, that's, them that's either. That's exactly what we. That's exactly Wait, what no, we do. I, I understand, but why? Look, we're right. talking about not making it a moral judgment. Like we shouldn't lionize or right. demonize. Right. So whether or not that guy is a knight in shining armor, or he's not, the effect is the same. It is a guy who is taking on the parental investment responsibilities of another man, whether he's a noble knight on shining armor or he's just an average Joe who has a regular day job, he's still doing the same thing. And then I should also add this is that if a guy is doing that, and let's just say for sake of argument, he gets with a single mom who has two or three kids. She doesn't want to have any more kids. And he, he's like, okay, well, I guess I'm taking care of these kids. I'm now their stepdad. And that's good enough for me. He's actually participating in his own extinction because right. now he's going to take over the responsibilities of another man or maybe even two men's child children at the expense of him reproducing with another woman. Do, do you understand my sex rape argument? I do understand your sex rape okay. argument. I also understand that. The, well, wait, wait, what, what is it? Cause I'm not sure you do. It's, it's a moral, it's a moral judgment card. It's a moral imperative right there. Yes. Is it wrong to rape? Yes, absolutely. No, wrong. no, 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 no. I'm saying, okay. You're saying in relation to the cuck stepfather thing, that you're determining the action, you're defining the action based on the end biological consequence. And I'm saying that you choosing to make that the defining trait of the action is you making a prescriptive moral judgment. The same way, is it, or is the it same not way we the do. Same effect. Whether or not it's a good to be a cuck or bad to be a cuck, is the, is the outcome the same? <laughs> And you say, and what you're you, saying? So okay, I just, I just you, you understand. Do you understand that no one wants to be a cuck? I don't. Just, I don't understand why we're arguing this. You understand, no one wants to be a cuck, right? So, so, but, but no, you're. We're is it is it better to be a rapist hands. or? A... This is like with who is was it Dawkins? Who was the feminist that said all penetrative sex was rape? Right. Gloria Gloria Stein. Yeah, one of these no. fucking. Yeah, of course. It's it's a it's an absurd thing that they're doing. Because they're trying to label an action as a negative. Yeah. Now they might Consensual make some sort of argument like, rape. well, technically from a biological perspective, it's, it's like, no, 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 no. You know what you're doing. You're using a loaded language to describe a process. You're making a moral weight here, right? So I don't, I mean, we don't have to argue. Everyone here knows. No one wants to be a cuck, right? We don't have to argue this. Once again, if you are a stepdad, you are effectively. <laughs> oh the same God, he keeps doing it. I guess we're just going in circles. Okay. Well, no, we're going we'll in circles on. because because by me even saying, here's the thing, by me even saying that you are effectively taking over the same responsibilities that a cuck would, you're presuming that I'm making a moral call based you on are. Me revealing <laughs> that thing. It's the mock thing. Once so again. you think so? If so, if someone called you a cuck, you'd be like, yeah, that's fine. I'm, I'm you're fine with being a cuck. No, I wouldn't be because I don't. I'm not a cuck. I don't. I'm not taking. I'm not taking the responsibility of another man's children. Couldn't yeah, Andrea you, Dorkin call you a rapist because you've had consensual sex with your she wife? She can call me whatever the fuck she wants. I don't care. Does that mean that the effect? But is, is she the, the question though? Is is she making is a she moral right? judgment when she yeah. says well, it, you're she, a rapist? Absolutely, she's making a moral judgment when she does that because she, well, then the, why are you making a moral <laughs> judgment? Oh, am I making a moral judgment by explaining to you that it has the same okay. outcome either way? We need to move on, yeah. Sitch. I think. Yeah. No, I, I know we're just looping. That's okay. Um, it's a spirit. Look. I want you to promise, Rolo, that you're going to come back and talk to us again. This oh, has good. been a, this has been a spirited discussion. This is the kind of shit I live for. You I don't want. I don't want. I'd much look, rather do this than talk to drunk bitches. Don't we don't want to. Wanna, like That's we don't. True. We yeah. look. We like to argue. We don't like to burn bridges. So just promise me you'll come oh. back and. Okay, um, we're good then. John Watts for five dollars says, Rolo, talk about the convention in Orlando that should not be named. Oh God, the twenty one convention. Just don't don't even go there. Okay. I give that guy press. Uh anonymous cop for twenty dollars says I've been in both of these spaces for years. I admit red pill is hard to navigate due to red meat content creators, but help me gain a relationship in my thirties. My advice is to steel man the OG writings, seek an a seek an action oriented content. Well that's good. That's good. See, I told you we have some red, red meat too. Yeah, I'm 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 not above red meat. Let's just be let's I'll be honest. But like I eat I tend to uh, there's got to if you're gonna do sizzle, there's got to be steak with the sizzle. If and you're talking, everybody's look, all sizzle these days. I think the stuff about sexual market value. I think that could be that that can be helpful for people definitely. So, um, Calvin Pafford says this might be a big ask, but you guys should try to interview Lewis Perry to balance out Rolo. 
Who's Louise Perry? Oh, Louise Perry. Yeah. Who is that? She a, um, she's a former fem- I don't know, maybe she still is a feminist. She um, she now has some book about how the the sexual revolution was a mistake. Oh, I saw her talk to Jordan Peterson. Yeah, yeah. she was, a, and she also talked to that guy. Um, where are the British guys? Uh, I forget the name now. There's a, there's a pair of guys in, the, in in Great Britain who did an interview of her not too long ago. But yeah, I know she, I know you're talking. I'm, please, I would love to talk to her. Uh, post not authoritarian. <laughs> just always, just a great name for six months. Says question for Rolo. Before Kevin Samuel passed away, he suggested that young men pay to play until he reaches his sexual prime. What are your thoughts on that? Uh, my 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 take on prostitution, which is what he's talking, paid for box is you can you can you buy a man a hooker and you get him laid for a night. If you teach a man game, you'll get him laid for a life. <laughs> there you go. Well, it's true. Uh, I mean, you don't learn it. Like, I, that's why I, I think that like guys who like flex on their notch count, I'm like, that means nothing to me because it's like, I live in Nevada, man. Prostitution's legal here. You want to come and increase your notch count? I can do it right over here. Up in the <laughs> state in Nevada, this, And you take you right up there and suddenly you're up one, right? right? Does that mean you're good at game or no, no, it doesn't. Look, I got no. a bunch of crazy vegan friends. Now this game, <laughs> it's all ethically sourced game, right? I mean, ethically, there's yes. no, there's ethically no dishonesty game. that goes on in this or anything. There's no deception. Nope. Nope. In fact, you know, there's no such thing as an incel either, by the way. No one is, no guy is involuntarily celibate today. And you are celibate because you want to be celibate. Because you're oh, you like, mean because technically anyone can go pay for it. Exactly. You want right. to, you want to be in, you want to be, you want to lose your V card. You come to, come to Reno, get, bring $500 with oh, you. That's so sad though. And I will get you laid. I 100% guarantee you, you will get laid. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Fondue for $10 says, in my mind, there are two sides to knowledge, the info and how it spreads. The red pill needs a, ve- a vehicle to pass info around. I find it hard to believe that it doesn't have a prescriptive element. Well, again, you can't go on. I can't turn on the camera without somebody saying you're giving advice. You're giving Brazil. Rolo's ideology is this. The prescription is that blah, blah. Again, you, like I was saying before, it's like, it's impossible to like present information without telling people how to feel about that information and what to do with that information. And it's the prescription is implied in the description. Right. Yeah. Uh, J Mac for twenty dollars says, uh, "I assume he signed out if he hadn't got married." He said, "I probably would have Minecraft myself or died of alcohol." <laughs> <laughs> you, you Minecraft go. yourself. That's good. There now, Minecrafting go. is a verb. <laughs> yes, yes. Women do and, uh, civilize men. That's one of the advantages of monogamy. True. And uh, thank you so much, J Mac, for the fifty gifted memberships. Yeah, and the, welcome the, to members. Being domesticated. <laughs> Uh, John A for eight months says ideas and values, even ideologies last far longer than genes spanning nations, even whole continents. Mm, true. Yeah. Depends on if they're accurate or not. You know, you said, you know, you're talking about was a, we're talking about Marxism or something like that. Not too long ago. Um, cultural Marxism, cultural Marxism. Right. Yeah. And I, I love it when I hear, uh, cause this is completely out of my wheelhouse, but it, it really kind of comes down to memetics because when you think about communism and socialism and Marxism, those are dead memes. Those are dead ideologies that are they're mm-hmm. dead, yet We're still like entertaining them today. Right. But they were based like Marxism, uh, you know, Karl Marx, his ideology was based on an understanding of human nature. That was from what, like 1848, <laughs> Mm-hmm. You know, and, under, and like with no benefit of like what we have as far as like the, uh, you know, evolutionary psychology, anthropology, sociology, everything that we've had since then up to where we're at right now. But yet the meme will not fucking die because people still think that it could be a, it could work if we just tweaked it this way. If we just sure. did that the fundamental flaw of communism, socialism, Marxism, all that stuff is the fact that it's based on a failed understanding or bad understanding of human nature. True. Right. That's a big part of it. Yeah. A blank slate idea. Well, we'll try it again. Yep. It doesn't take into account natural need for competition. We've never and done hierarchy. real Marxism. No. Yep. Yeah. Because maybe it's just a bad idea. <laughs> uh, Dung is fun for $2 says, should I feel shame for snapping my radish? <laughs> yes, that a... yes. 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 That's one of my guys. <laughs> Sna- what is that? Is that like a weird word of saying like masturbating or something? Yes. Snapping your radish. Hmm. Huh. Ever heard that before? Maybe that's no. a way of saying. <laughs> I fi- I figured it out. Sitch. It's a regional. It's a regional colloquialism. <laughs> or uh, polishing the bishop. Got it. There you go. 
Uh, Static for $10 says, this whole conversation assumes that feelings didn't predate the culture. Suggests in jealousy over sexual behavior gave rise to the cultural practices around romance, marriage, sex, etc. True. Good point. Downstream okay. from the biological impulses. Um, Nilis Anonymous for $10 says, monogamy rests on hierarchy. People seek folks in their same potential group. It transcends looks, capacity, etc. People buy into potential from across mm. multiple hierarchies. Good point. Yeah, very good point. Especially, uh, I, I don't know if you guys have heard me talk about this. Like when, when women organize societies, they tend to do so in egalitarian ways, like in the circle, like, you know, one for you and one for you and it, distribute the, and, uh, the, resources whereas meant to organize societies in hierarchy so it's like you know there's the general and then the lieutenant, lieutenant and cop corporal and all that down the chain of command and we do that in all of our structures so it's like yeah. with corporate society team sports things like that men tend to think in hierarchies women think, try to uh, to think in egalitarian term or communitarian terms i guess maybe is a better way of of putting it yeah because it's usually still a head bitch but it's less structured so yeah i mean it's not that there isn't competition amongst women but the idea of egalitarianism and uh like just sort of what i've called equalism is really a, a more female way of thinking whereas men tend to think more in hierarchies yeah i don't i don't disagree with that and so but but what he's saying is like how does that affect our understanding of monogamy because monogamy is based in male understanding of hierarchy mm-hmm. um Andrew Clark for $5 says, Rolo, why are you so comfortable with intellectually dishonest and emotionally charged language that seems to cause misunderstanding? I don't think you guys are intellectually dishonest. I think you guys are inquisitive. I think you might be a little bit more like in your fields than anything, but like uh, you are you guys have, had, have some really good points, I think. I don't think you're intellectually dishonest. No, he's saying he's asking you. He's not saying, oh, he's not accusing yeah. us of being intellectually dishonest. Am I intellectually dishonest? Like in what way? Um, I think he's, he's saying... I think he's trying to say, why are you comfortable using language that's emotionally charged that causes misunderstandings? I think that's what he's trying to say. Well, what would you write? What would you like me to see? The thing is, like, I can't even say this sentence that I'm saying right now without using a certain tone of voice, without having facial expressions, without gesticulating for that matter. And people could say, well, oh, he must be emotional. Or if I do like this, oh, he must be lying. Right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, th that's one of the greatest, like, the educational experiences I've had of being online and like doing what I do is like, I have, un I understand that so many people will nitpick the most, the slightest, smallest thing that you could possibly imagine. Like if I do like this, like, and I just, I do this because I'm comfortable. It's not because I'm trying to send some like Masonic temple, you know, hand signals, gestures or something like that. So there's no way to, deliver information as a human being with speech that doesn't sound in some way emotional to someone else. Is it true or is it not true? It's really what it boils down to. Is it factually accurate or is it inaccurate? Well, I mean, you could say, oh, I realize that your children, there, Adam. <laughs> well, no, you could say something like, you know, I realize that your children are not your biological children, which is not as incendiary as, oh, you're a cuck. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> like, right? Well, again, what is the definition? That's like all I come, talking all about. I come yeah, we're to. just going to loop the conversation. <laughs> well, that's why, why I keep coming back to well, that. Well, no, but. I know, but the super chat is aimed at why use, what is the purpose of using the incendiary language right. if it's not to shame people into a certain behavior? Right. Which I completely agree. Like the hey, reason we this? slut shame hoes, the reason idea. we <laughs> slut shame <laughs> hoes and we talk about the how the, the girl with the 300 body count is a fucking whole bag is because we're trying to shame her, her into okay, behaving from, differently from here on out, not let's, fucking let's, 10 guys at a party let's, let's not call them cucks anymore let's call them evolutionary dead ends how about that wow well that's, that's much better. You know, you're evolutionary well, no, dead it's, end. there you go so i don't know i don't know how familiar you are with like a lot of the the woke stuff but i'm sure you've heard how they use the term whiteness right they say we need to abolish whiteness. oh yeah that's a good sure one. you've heard this right how would you how would you describe that in non emotional terms? Well, no, no, wait. So, you, have you heard? You know what I'm talking about? Have you heard this term? Like, we need to abolish. I've whiteness? heard it. I've heard it thrown around, but yeah. Right, right. So, when someone says, "Oh, we need to abolish whiteness," and we've had conversations with people like this, and we say, "Well, wait a minute, what the? That's like super fucking racist." You're like, "We need to get rid of white people." They say, mm -hmm. "No, no, 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 no. You don't understand. We don't mean get rid of white people. What we're saying is, when we say the word whiteness, we define it as, and they give this kind of whole long explanation about how they define whiteness is like." A systems of racial prejudice mm. against black people, blah, 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 blah. And then mm. it always comes down to the end of it where I say, well, wait a minute. Why are you using the word whiteness to define this? 
when you know that when you say that everyone's going to interpret it one you know, this other way mm -hmm. and they never want to give a real answer on that and they'll just kind of say like, well, that's just what the word means. That's how we've created this word to mean it. It's like, but mm -hmm. why are you using this specific word? They're doing it to it's, shame white people. <laughs> they're doing it to shame white people. That's the reason they're doing it. There's okay. a specific so, reason they're using so, that language. And, and I 100% and I, I, I understand that. Okay. And I understand that like calling somebody a cuck is going to have a negative connotation just like anything else. Like, oh, you're cuckled. Okay. Look, bizarre, right, so, bizarrely so, base says it so right let, here. I'm, I'm open, uh, maybe the chat can come up with something. No, no, what, bizarre, bizarrely base. What, would, be, what would, would describe the same condition that wouldn't be incendiary? Look, look, stepfather. Ro Rolo. Uh, we already have a term for it. No, 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 no. But see, that's the other way. Stepfather. Oh, that sounds good. That's ennobling. No, no, can't do that. Oh, no, no, stepfather's that's, neutral. That's, that's stepfather's neutral. It, it, stepfather does seem neutral. It, it's it's neutral because you think that it's neutral because you think that it's not. It's not necessarily bad. It's not necessarily good. Look, Whereas, somebody, but, someone in the I chat mean, said. Stepfather for many watch years around, had. Watch, uh, around, um, watch around Father's Day and see how neutral stepfathering is. Yeah, but that I feel like it's almost a reclamation because for for years, for for hundreds of years, I'd say the step parent was usually cast as the villain in the fairy tale. Usually, it had like a negative. Mothers, yes. Like you're the evil stepmother, right? Stepmothers, yeah. which is interesting considering. Right. But, so, yeah, I mean, but, what, but what else would describe it? Tell me look, something. I, like, again, I, when I use when I use alpha and beta, I, can, I I try to preempt this and say, look, these are abstractions. People will say alpha is good and beta is bad. It's not. Those are descriptors. Look, so we, we just want – we're just – Cut is a bad word. What, 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 what suffices? Rolo, the, the, the conflict that we're having here is that you've said that you're just – you're not making moral prescriptions – when it seems obvious you are making moral prescriptions now, bizarrely based in the chat has said this perfectly. Adam, if we shame stepdads, less men will simp for single moms. So that's like he's just enunciated the motivation here. It's like we want we want men to stop being stepdads. We want single moms shut out of the uh, the the mating market. That's the goal. So well, you're using that language as a tool to shame people into a new behavior. Okay, so let's just, how about we do this instead? Instead of stepdad or instead of, of uh, cuckold or whatever else, how about this? How about we're just describing the condition here? We're describing mm -hmm. the effect. We're describing the phenomenon rather than putting a label on it. I don't know how to put it in neutral terms, whether it's stepdad or it's cuckold, but the effect still is the same thing. Sure, so, sure. But, but so so here's the thing is like, do we want here's maybe this is the question. Do we want more guys to sign up to be to be stepdads? Do well, we I don't I don't care either way. Like, uh, you know, I don't, I, I, honestly, I, I don't care what the fuck you do with. It. I I'm figure just, the guys do, you know, the, each guy can make their own cost benefit analysis on, you know, if she's a 10 and she's got like a kid or something, maybe you're like. Well, mm -hmm. she's super hot in the looks department. The kid is kind of a downside, but maybe the kid is cool. I don't know. But I want people on an individual basis to make that determination without society stepping in and saying, look, I'm going to shame you into doing the thing that I want you to do. This third party mm -hmm. who has nothing to do with the situation. Mm -hmm. do, would you say that encouraging men to be step parents is encouraged by society or discouraged by society well i think it, before this conversation i would have said it's kind of morally neutral i mean a lot of people like a lot of older people i know have like they have kids in their first marriage and neither one is like a cock or a, uh, or an evolutionary dead end because the mom has kids and the dad has kids they both just have kids in different marriages and then mm -hmm. they get remarried and everyone has seven kids yeah. yeah, Brady Bunch. It's a success story, right? Blended family. Why? I would, I would argue as I would long argue. as people are happy, I would call it a success story. Obviously, back to the happiness thing again. But I would tell, I would say this is. I think from from the time of the sexual revolution, we have promoted the idea that it is not only just men's like responsibility to become step parents, but we encourage men that it is a positive. Look, I, it's not your responsibility to become a stepdad. Like I'm not going there. I'm not saying that. But I don't think that we should shame people out of it by calling them cucks. Okay. But the reason why it's shocking to call a stepdad a cuck is because for so long we have encouraged the idea that it is ennobling to be a stepfather. I don't I don't recall this. No one I don't wait, no one wait, came wait into my Father's life Day. and said wait till Father's Day comes around and you'll see what I'm talking about. Okay. Well maybe in, maybe in female dad, circles. 
Well, what I mean, I that pretty much defines gynocentric social, the social order for, for really since the 60s. But the, the, and, and I don't reheat all this shit, but what sure. I'm trying to say is I, just, I don't I, see I, how I there's just... a way not to, how, not to make it sound positive or negative by calling it either step parents or, or cuckoldry. But I will say that the only reason it sounds bad is because it's shocking because for so long we've called it a good thing to be a stepfather. By the way, also, I want to clear one other thing here. Yes, you're right. There, there is one factor in this. Like, at least you go in with both eyes open. You know, totally, that, that you're making the conscious decision to do this. Right? Are you doing that because society told you you'll be a better dude? People, the real man. No, you're going. Look, over, she's like ten. You're going. No, she's eternity. a ten. I'm a six. Okay, she has a kid. I'm never gonna get a ten. She's a single mother. Look, she's I, this is a calculation. I think guys do though. They they do. Do you, do you mm -hmm. think do you think that there is a innate or some sort of like natural revolt a revolt a hesitation let's just say on the part of men to like wife up single mothers sure right so why is that why do we go there's a lot of extra why responsibility go against that the same reason there'd be hesitation to have a kid in the first place it's a lot of extra responsibility or is it because it there is an innate need to know paternity well, you do know paternity in that situation. Yeah, I know it question. is, but so, but you do know, and so, is that the source of the hesitation? For some people, it could be part of it that they. Some people could have the feeling that, well, I don't want to, you know, have the responsibility of raising that responsibility of another guy's kid. Of course, someone could have that feeling. Yeah, a lot of guys do have that, but I just, right. I don't think it's right to shame the guys that don't have that, and I don't. Well, like... and I, I don't think it makes sense to define something based on like a biological end result. I think to do that leads us down a weird path of categorization or but like, the hesitation still exists and mate guarding still exists and jealousy still exists because it is in it well at least in the terms of infidelity that we were just talking about so, yeah sure it exists but, because men okay. want to ascertain paternity right but so that's an that's no why one, body count neither matters. neither me matter. nor adam are suggesting that men should be shamed in one direction or other like mm -hmm. for not stepping up to be a stepfather. I don't, that's not either. Yeah, or. totally. That's not what we're well, asking. Not, I should, I should also point out that like, like there's guys that they're cool with adopting kids and that's great. Awesome. Look, if you I'm, think being a step perspective, step that's awesome. The but, only, the yeah. only point that I was bringing up is that for a last conversation, you were saying that you are not making prescriptive claims. And I'm saying that by defining it as a cuck, you are making a descriptive claim. I mean, a prescriptive, prescriptive claim. yeah. Yeah. You are well, making a and also make the claim that by defining it as a stepdad, you're also making a prescriptive claim. Um, maybe, but I'm not saying I'm not making morally prescriptive claims. So I can that, that, that and I would say you, are, you like, are, if you're saying one is good and one is bad. Yeah. And I, but I'm not denying that I am making morally prescriptive claims. And again, I am saying that in doing so, in the shocking of revelation that you, you're essentially entering into the same ultimate well, goal. No, it's, it's not a shocking of, revelation. Of being cut, you're, you're effectively doing the same thing as it, if that woman had duplicitously tricked you into right. believing that the kids were yours it's not a shocking revelation i disagree with how that we should be defining things like this because using that same the rules of logic you're using for this right then we should be referring to people that are alive as just not dead yet okay. because at the end any... of the day we all die so why does anything that we do matter is there okay so you get existentialism but is there it's any... not exist wait 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 it's not existentialism it's, existentialism, it's not existentialism i'm doing the same thing i'm saying we all end up dying at the end of the day biologically so why mm -hmm. don't we just define ourselves by that we can a lot okay of but that would be fucking stupid i would argue why? Why would it be stupid? There's a lot of guys who think that the, there's anti-natalists and there's not right. who don't think it's stupid. Well, I there think are a lot they're, of yeah, I think they're stupid. Human. I think, they're, I think, I think it's going to create I, I, a healthy. I agree with you, but I'm right. just what I'm doing is playing devil's. But wait, but why do you agree with me? Why well, do you? Because because it, 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 life's what you make of it, right? I mean, so we can have oh. this philosophical perspective out of this. So, but so you're making a judgment call here that you we shouldn't define yes, life. I am by making that. a judgment call now because I, it's yeah. again by by describing things you can't not make a judgment call. So, like if I'm going to go and say you're a cuck, and you are assuming the same responsibilities as a cuckold. Whether you call yourself a stepdad or a cuckold or I don't know what the I fuck. I think you can describe called. things without making you're still crunch. You're still of the same status. That's why I say it's semantics. It's no, still no, I think one has a negative content connotation and the other has a positive connotation. So again, we can we can have a conversation about whether the theory of evolution via natural selection is true or not with no moral claims whatsoever about it. 
it's a purely descriptive uh, conversation. So I think yes. you can do that. But there are that certain definitely. aspects of that conversation that people would automatically interpret as being, oh, that's against God. That's against whatever. That's immoral to even suggest that to have that conversation. Of course, some people would the do that. The reason why you're between... even bringing up these topics is because you believe this. Right. That's the Mott Bailey thing, right? Of course. But of course, there's a difference between someone having, you know, Charles Darwin's having some descriptive conversation about evolution and mm -hmm. someone else interprets it prescriptively. Okay, that's a very different scenario than Charles Darwin, again, referring to every time he talks about ugly people having babies or calling them unfit. It's like, well, wait mm -hmm. a minute. Now he's sort of using prescription. That's a, pre that's a prescriptive. Language. That's a prescription. Right. Yeah. So anyway, we can move on. Um, Sammy G for $10 says living an overly abundant life can be dangerous. It warps the brain. Living with more options available ne means you need to set self limits, picking up more responsibility, or you will fall to ruin. True. Good advice. Don't overextend yourself. Um, Not too many viruses. cut babies. <laughs> there you go. Stuck, stuck for five dollars says, for the record, I'd argue that jealousy would be one of several factors producing such cultures, but it would be a deep emotional one at least. Sure. I yeah, agree. Yeah, I mean, yeah, of course. The rude emotion, yeah. Um, <laughs> Libertarian Sasquatch for $2 says, Islam is right about women. There you go. <laughs> He's got a bunch of super <laughs> funny ones. But... <laughs> well, I'm just trying to read like the ones that are questions right now. I know, uh, I, I see you skipping a bunch, but yeah. that's okay. Uh, we'll go back and read the non-question ones afterwards. I don't want to keep uh, rolling. Lucid, the lucid Dreamer? Uh, Darth360, no scope for $20, says, this is a great discussion. Uh, Rolo, are you going to debate Destiny? Uh, the offer's on the table, man. I've told him, uh, I've made this public since November. If he wants to debate me, the door is open in Vegas. Come to Las Vegas. Come Can you just down. debate him online? I mean, we're no, lazy. We don't want I will to. not debate him online because what happens then is things get cut up. People have ways of getting out of shit. People go and want to they, there's it's just too unregulated. You want you want this engagement? You come to fucking Vegas. You we do it live in front of a, a you know, a live on my stream. Yours mm -hmm. we can multi-stream. That's fine. You sit across from me, you tell me why you think I'm wrong. Okay. Huh. Well, well, I mean, I'd like to see that, obviously. It's open, it's open anytime. By the way. I put that out there for like Alex from playing with fire. I put it out there for, for uh, destiny. Anybody who wants to quote unquote, nobody debates anymore. Anyways, you and I, we're not having a debate. We're just having a conversation. We're this a is a heated debate in all caps. What are you <laughs> talking is, about? Rollo? Okay, a, a real formal debate is when you have time limits and you have to make your, yeah, point. All that, shit, yeah. Get yeah. that right. Heated so, debate, debate. Fire, debate. Emoji, fire emoji, fire emoji, fire. Yeah, emoji. The debate died somewhere in the a late eighties, I think. But, um, so, but if you want to come and have a heated conversation, a spirited conversation <laughs> with me in Las Vegas, I will book the time at Sticky Paws Studios. You will sit across the table from me and I, you can tell me what a son of a bitch I am and we will hash it out. No one has taken me up on that except for one dude. And that has been Gary the Numbers Guy. to argue numerology. Oh, no. The astrologist will do it. Oh, but no. So, numerology. There it is. God, oh, What's that's your birth terrible. number? What? What a I conversation just, that was! <laughs> did you get? Did you miss Lucid Dreamer for twenty dollars? Or are we? Did uh, I skip ahead? I don't know where maybe. you ended up. Why don't you just read it? Because I don't know. Lucid Dreamer for twenty dollars. What advice does Rolo have for sexually submissive men seeking sexually dominant women? Oh, that sounds like. They want the femdoms. That what he's saying. You shouldn't have any problem with that today, except for the fact that the dominant women probably don't want to have anything to do with you. Either that, or go see my girlfriend uh, Domo. She's all about like Findom shit. <laughs> Findom is take the your worst money. thing. She'd be happy to take your money and make you feel like a man. Isn't that That's like so an weird. option on Tinder or, or eHarmony no. or something? I'm sure there's an OnlyFans category for <laughs> financial domination. Damn it! That's wild. Yeah. That I I can't even wrap. It was like this. I, like I know, the, right? I, know. I don't understand <laughs> it. Well, and here's so here's the evolutionary question. Like, uh -huh. like the like people that like cuck porn or the idea of being cucked. I don't. I literally cannot understand any part of that. Like, yeah, how does that work? Natural because we have a natural revulsion to that. To that. Yes. Hmm. I don't know. Doesn't make sense. Oh my gosh! Um, you just had a moral judgment. You called cuck or cuckoldry porn. What, look, we're oh not no! The listen, ones. I've we had We make moral of... judgments all day, Rolo. <laughs> I, I, it, my, my moral stance on on cuckoldry has been very well known. Yes, <laughs> it's legendary. Yeah. Yeah. I'm very anti people watching cuck porn. Uh, fondue for two dollars says systemic infidelity, aka the hoe of the gaps. I like that, the hoe of the gaps. That is good. Uh, 
CT for another five dollars says Blep said this. Blep says um, Rolo would say that quote everyone would be a murderer if they could, but except for fucking. Yeah, more or less. Well, what, what is? Oh no, it's. Um, it's Mike Sartain says we're just naked murder apes. <laughs> nice. I'll make I like a t-shirt that. of naked murder apes. <laughs> if you had a time machine. Hairless, though, hairless murder apes. There you go. If you had a time machine, you could cheat. And then you could go back in time before it happened. Mm. And you'd totally get away with it, right? If I had a time machine, I wouldn't. I don't know if I would use it for that. I would use it to make a lot of money. <laughs> well, you could do that too, obviously. Can it be a DeLorean? Sure. That'd, be, that'd be great. Uh, Fondue for Five Hours says, this is the reason we change terms, like the term idiot and moron in psychology. They can't remain neutral and the use of strong... You can't remain neutral and use strong moral language for your terms. Yeah, that is why they change well, like, all the, the terms. The other thing is like, um, so like we, we use a term like eugenics, and we think of that in terms of like the Germans in 1930, which because oh, whose name we can't say on YouTube. Um you can say Nazi. Yeah, Hitler. we say Nazi yeah. all the time. Okay, well, I don't know how. Really? Because I can't say rape or Nazi or like. You said rape a bunch of no. times. I mean, just, I, know, I think Sitch has said rape a bunch of times. I get ratioed every time I do that. But like when we talk about eugenics, eugenics when it first came out was meant to be, you know, like here's, it's describing a, a condition. You give it to the Nazis and now suddenly it's the height of like evil when it just describes like pretty much like we do eugenics with like uh, selective breeding of dogs. Of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, the eugenics the, movement. The connotation was, is that, oh, it's what the Nazis did. Right. Well, the eugenics movement. Um, there were two factions in the eugenics movement in America in the 20s. There was the, the race related ones, but there was the non-relates ones that were actually the intelligence yeah who yeah, yeah they wanted to essentially have people bred for intelligence and hard work mm -hmm. and things of that nature there's right, actually yeah. there's a bunch of states as why there's a bunch of states world. where you had to get a license to have a child which seems so mm. horribly anti-american by today's yeah. standard yep. i made the argument that uh ever since we had hormonal birth control women have been in like like by default or de facto been involved in a eugenics program because they're the ones who decide you know like when it comes to abortion when it comes to uh if, if they can unilaterally control the human reproductive process is that not eugenics mm -hmm. so, anyways mark twain's revenge thanks so much mark twain's revenge for 50 dollars says rollo i currently have three children and a fourth due this month three girls one boy all by the same wife have I secured the future of my genetic yes, seed or should yeah. I have more? I don't know. Like I'd say you know, it's funny. He's like, I only have one kid. I have like my daughter is an only Oh child. my god, you failure. Like, oh my god, yes, I know. I know. It's like, it's like I thought I did pretty good with this one. Oh, you no. should have ten. What's the matter no. with you? You need a clown car for your wife's vagina. Mark Twain, I think an, a good even ten kids is really what you should shoot <laughs> for. Like ten <laughs> feels like the magic number. Well, it's, it's, it's like also the fertility rate thing too we've been below you know whenever i see people like write stories or they do these shows about like the fertility rate being below replacement we've been below replacement since like the mid 90s <laughs> where was everybody then <laughs> well because it gets tied to the immigration thing I think that's yeah yeah of course so yeah. open borders we need more people here because we're not making babies enough mm -hmm. you only had one uh, yeah but i feel good <laughs> Let's try to see if there's another question here that's not a troll comment. Oh, I love my trolls. Um, I have a lot of trolls and spurgs, but they're my spurgs. That's good. <laughs> academic yeah. agent. Hey, academic agent for $2 says, as the most alpha beta to ever sigma, I have something to say. Sadly, Sitch and I are getting a divorce. No. <laughs> it's because I'm Sitch sorry. won't recognize the evolutionary advantage of performing his wifely duties. Sitch <laughs> keeping the car. <laughs> Hey, by the way, like if you put wifely duties in the title of your, uh, I, I suggest everyone who has a channel put really? wifely duties in your titles because Look, you I'm taking you notes all kinds right of here. engagement this week. That's so, true from the crowd. Wifely stuff, yeah. duties. Okay. Wifely duties. Wifely things. Wifely duties. Uh, the most dope for $2 says modern human female ovum choosing sperm doesn't necessarily mean it's a trait evolved by modern human females. It could also be a trait from an earlier ancestor. Evolution in that sense usually doesn't happen so quickly. But yet it's still with us today. So it's either an adaptation or it's a spandrel. He's just saying. Yeah, it's but it's like, um, yeah, but there are traits that could, you know, come from previous well, and then there's, pre human and the ancestors. I, and I, and, and you'll notice I hedge my bets there by saying correlation is not causation either. Course, so it could right. be the fact that not because women are selecting like multiple lovers, it's because they might have been raped by multiple dudes. So that could be part of it or, too. 
you know, pre-human whatever the fuck monkey we were was getting right. Yeah, right. It could be the Neanderthal and... side of our <laughs> human heritage. Those Neanderthals, they just want to fuck willy-nilly. Well, I think the Neanderthals were lived in much less, much smaller communities, so it's probably mm. less likely. But um, I know, like, like one of the examples Richard Dawkins always brings up is um, something like the like the way the giraffe circulatory system works is really fucking stupid because of their long neck. It like, like because of how with the animal they evolved from, it like goes mm. all the way from like their brain to like the base of their stomach and then back up to their heart, as opposed mm. to just going directly to the heart, and that causes all sorts of uh, you know health problems. But as mm. long as it never evolves, you know, randomly away from that, they're just kind of stuck in this. Mm. having this issue with them for the rest of their yeah, species. See, so. see the, see the, like, remember when I told you there's no elevator pitch for the red pill? This is what I'm talking about. Like, we I gotta know about fucking Neanderthals. <laughs> <laughs> I gotta be able to speak, like, lo- like, like knowledgeably about me. I don't know what the hell, what a Neanderthal, you know, where all that comes from. But, like, I mean, I know enough about, like, like neuro neuroscience and, and endocrinology to get myself into trouble. But again, I just, I, I'm connecting dots and, and trying to make you know, logical conclusions. Well, listen, the Neanderthal has got a bad rap because they're actually supposed to be smarter and stronger than humans. And they died out. Uh, yeah. Cause well, it's funny because the thought is that since they were uh, smarter and stronger, they could exist in smaller tribes and then we would mm-hmm. basically breed them, them out or kill them by our numbers. Mm-hmm. So. See eugenics. Can I uh, can I take a well? Shot? That's like actually anti eugenics because them being stronger. Actually yeah, well, that yeah, could be the opposite way. Well, <laughs> eugenics for one. <laughs> yeah. Can I take a shot at answering CT's trolley chat? Sure. See, caffeinated tweaker for two Canadians says, "Why does Rolo think some kids don't deserve dads?" <laughs> <laughs> I I think look I I I'll, let me take a stop, stab at answering and you tell me how close this is, Rolo. I think. And this might not be your answer, but maybe the red, some of the red pill community will think that women who choose incorrectly and get themselves in a situation where they're a single mom, mm-hmm. you know, in, a, in, a, in kind of a sense of karma or fairness, should suffer the consequences of that single momdom. And a stepdad kind of comes in and saves them from their bad decision making. That's what I think of that of that bad decision. Yes. Did, is that a steel man? Did I get it? Did I do it? Did I get yeah, well, it correctly? Sure. Well, I I know another thing is every kid deserves a dad. Let's just okay. I'm, I'm like well, technically, the it has a dad. They have a dad. Yeah, well, just they do. A dead exactly. Dead. exactly. Yeah. And you're right yeah. about that. Is I think a lot of people want to say that. Oh, see, it's that it's that revenge thing. Remember, I told you about how like the reason why shows like Fresh and Fit or whatever, like the accountability shows, are so popular yeah. because people want to say, oh, she got hers. Ha! Get her, get her, get her, Kevin right. Sammy. Like they want to be like they want to be able to vicariously live through the people who are like telling these bitches what they need to hear because if they don't then nobody else will kind of it's the red meat side of things sure. but that and i will be the first one to say that there's nothing productive that comes from from that and but unfortunately trying to explain something in in sort of like nuts and bolts terms that that doesn't get the views of eyes you don't get ctr for for the click-through rate you don't get that for for those right. um but that. but you do for for come up and sort or revenge videos and I think that when we talk about single moms, uh, you can you can be as pragmatic or as explanatory as possible, and it's always going to come off as what he said here. And I know it's a troll, and I know he's just kind of you know being facetious, but the, the she, idea, yeah, she, whoever, <laughs> right? Why didn't you want to have? That's not the point. If I, if I didn't believe that 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 men and boys, or whatever, didn't deserve fathers, I wouldn't be doing this because I have one daughter and I have a thousand sons. So, it's it, it's oh, no. that position of being like sort of. I, I tell these guys all this time is like you're. Oh my you're, God! It like, turns out you were the cuck the whole time. Yes. <laughs> the well, ideological. One. There has to be a. There has to be. Like guys today, like the Lost Boys generation, the guys who had either very weak fathers or no father whatsoever, those are the guys that are watching these shows right now. Those are the guys who are like one, you know, they want uh, the dad they never had. So they look for Jordan Peterson. They look for right. whoever is the most dominant personality. The, the Andrew Tate is the dad they never had. Well, aren't you just wasting your resources helping them? Yeah, you technically, yes. Yes, you are. Okay. I didn't say that. Sometimes, sometimes. But you are a cut. That might be the best thing. To, sometimes that the outcome of being a cuck might be most beneficial, not only for yourself, but for the kid that's involved. So oh, like, no. that's the prescription side, prescriptive side of this. Okay. Descriptively, right. I'm going against my own innate evolved nature 
to want to be investing in my own kids because I have feelings for this kid or I have, like I was saying with adopting, right? It, it maybe you can have kids, maybe you can't, maybe your wife can have kids, maybe she can't. I don't have, hold any grudge against a couple that want to have, want to adopt kids. I think that's a noble thing from a prescriptive way of thinking, from an ideological way of thinking. I think people should do that. But we, we it, have, it, it's the fact of the matter is it goes, uh, still goes. Just, and the reason why it's notable is because it goes against our evolved natures. Just promise me that you're not going to write a Jack Murphy article no, I'm saying no. the virtues of being a cock. You know, it's like, why do we take why do we take destinies like like opinions seriously and not Jack Murphy? <laughs> do they not live like a very well? Because Jack Murphy lied about it. Destiny didn't lie about it. That's that the difference. True. That's well, also the perception is different because at least he's at least he's, at least he's up front with this. Right. Well, oh. well, the perception is different. Um, I mean, because at least the perception, I don't know if it's true or not. The perception is that Destiny is basically using the open relationship to gain access for himself more. To more than, women, yeah. Yeah, more than uh, his girlfriend or his wife now, I guess. With with Jack Murphy, it seemed kind of like, mm, is that what's happening here? I think so. I think it was more, maybe, maybe sort of like the duplicity that, that got him. Well, that didn't help. Like he yeah. was trying to just like pass himself off as this like really moral bastion and trad con Christianity or whatever. Well, and and I think if he not. had just reacted to the original situation better, it wouldn't have been such a big deal. Oh, yeah, 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 absolutely. Exactly. He should have just owned it is what he should have done. Yeah. He moved on and he would have been he's like, and then, and now the the beard is now the international side for cock. Oh God! <laughs> Do you watch? Um, are you familiar with Freedom Tunes, the YouTube channel? Yes, yes. I just used one as in my intro video on Sunday's show. Oh, nice. Yeah, we had we talked to Seamus. Uh, I think last week or the week before. Ago, yeah. When he covers and, Manosphere stuff, and he like he did this one on a whatever podcast that I use. That's what I was gonna ask you. The Every Dating Podcast one. Yeah. Brilliant. Perfect. <laughs> Keep that doing. That dumb bitch. Dumb. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and then the white knight comes in, and she's like, "Do you have a seven pack?" <laughs> you dumb bitch. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I was like, "Okay, perfect." Oh perfect. Jesus! So uh, he, you just gotta laugh to keep from crying. True. <laughs> uh, the most dope for two dollars says, "As a current student of biological anthropology, the Evo Psych stuff sometimes is so cringe-inducing. Listen to. I didn't get why not so your diet was so triggered, but at first, but now I totally get her disdain for him." Well, you gotta remember that, like. Uh, evolutionary psychology is not just about human sexuality. It's about a lot of other things too. Oh yeah. Moral psychology. I mean, we've never talked to, well, not never. We usually talk about it in terms of morality and not. No, what's, what's funny is like, if I go and I want to have a discussion with Gad Saad about his first book, which is like the, uh, what is it? The purchasing mind, the consuming mind. Like it's about purchasing and the evolutionary psychology of human beings and why they buy certain things and why they're susceptible to, to like impulse buys and shit like that. And he goes into a little bit of sexuality because there's a, a section on that but it's not about that it's about like why we go and buy things and feel drawn to things like we do nobody has a problem with that book they have a problem when they start talking about you know unflattering evolutionary psychology truths about women's nature that's when they have a problem about it so you can talk about lots of different things with evo psych but like the only time people like get you know oh, it's cringe it's cringe because it's like revealing unflat there's unflattering truths about men in evolutionary psychology too and nobody has a problem with that yeah, well, it's just, I think what bothers people is when, um, not everyone does this, obviously. I've always been a huge proponent of Evo Psych, I, ironically enough from my mother, who basically raised me to think that way for some reason. I don't know why she had it, had she, why she had that idea, but she did. Um, but I think a lot of people more so nowadays try to use it for v excuses to to justify so just so logic behavior. yes yes it's and the, so that's what's like the cringe it. element of it um yeah. mostly what people are reacting to well, yeah otherwise it's like i think i and i would i would put this to erudite too is that like there's i for the longest time whenever you use the term like alpha male i think one of the reasons we use high value male now is because people thought alpha was cringy right um, but if you use the term alpha male people go oh alpha male you're not those alpha male podcasts it's like derogatory now but if a woman says, I'm an alpha female, oh, you go, girl. Yes, you're an alpha female. You you go out there and get them. Like, they agree with the fact that a female can be an alpha. But if you're an alpha male, then you're like a poser of some sort. That right there should tell you all you need to know about the sort of cringeworthiness of like Evo Psych. 
if it benefits the female imperative, then people are all on board with it. If it's if I tell you there is an evolutionary basis for why women have a better facility with with communication and subcommunications, and they pick up more on visual cues and and, and, and facial gest- gestures and uh, vocal intonation, they get more communication out of it than men do. Men are more overt in their com- communication. Women are more like contextual based when it comes to communication. Women be like, oh, yes, of course. That's a yeah, good, good great finding. But you go and you say, oh, men are better at math and better at like spatial acuity. And you go start talking about how, how, you know, men's brains are different than women's and how it benefits men. They're like, oh, that's cringy. Right. It all depends on like where, what perspective, what point you're looking from. Yeah, well, I mean, everything's going through the lens of sort of the oppression hierarchy of you know men, men, especially white men, have been so evil and dominating women for so long that you know mm-hmm. we can ha- we can only have this one way like whatever whatever has to validate you know, your yeah the your, female right yeah so nothing can validate though the male or make male better for anything. Uh, Stuck for five dollars says, "I don't believe that humans evolved to not raise kids that aren't their own. Tribes men would have invested in other children, especially if the parents died. I mean, I I agree with that, but I I believe in group selection. I don't know if you believe in group selection. I would um I would I would say that when it comes to men, no. When it comes to women, yes, because women. <laughs> that's why. Well, no. Here, let me explain to you. Okay, let me explain. That's, that's why. How how is that insane? Yes. It's, it's, have you heard of the Have you heard of the the, the saying? It takes a village to raise a child. Women sure, will sure. collectively raise the children of other women. Women will will will, uh, will participate in the nurturing of other women's children, and they will actively try to find ways to deceive men that the child is not necessarily theirs. And the reason for that is because of the infanticide. So infanticide is like when when like a uh, an alpha male uh, gorilla takes over the tribe, kills off his rival. He immediately goes and kills the offspring of the rival alpha in that troop of of gorillas or chimps or whatever. It happens in uh, Pride's Alliance too, and the reason why is to kill off the kill off the offspring that aren't his, so that he can have children uh, babies with the pride of lions or or the you know the females of that particular troop. Now the reason for what happens then is, and this is another ugly fact of evolutionary biology, is that in so doing and killing off the offspring of the other of the other uh, rival alpha, it sends the females into estrus. So that right there, what's the what's the biological function of that? Now you can make the um, if you go and you look at the uh, levels of sexual assault and violence of uh, of baby daddies of like the stepfather or the uh, the the boyfriend that the mom brings into the non biological father that she brings into the living situation, it is it was I, I think I want to say it was Rob Henderson was saying this was like it's like eight to ten times the amount of violence that is that would come from like a biological father. Right. So one of the surest ways to put your child at a disadvantage is in to bring in another male into that living situation that is not the biological father there. Mm-hmm. That, by the way, is another thing when we're talking about like cuckoldry and stepfathers and everything else, the incidence of the propensity for infanticide or in our case, like we killing a kid is like crime, right? But like if, if it's a disadvantaging that kid or it's abusing that kid, it is far, far more likely to come from a non-biological parent than the biological parent as well. Right. Still, no, yeah, but... I would still believe, I don't, you know, I don't think you could ever study this, but I wouldn't be shocked if, you know, during our caveman hunter gatherer days, if some father or, or parents both died, even if the women were doing a lot of the, you know, the raising to an extent, say it was a boy, you know, that boy's still going to mm-hmm. grow up and need to learn how to hunt and still have to have, mm-hmm. you know, a male authority figure to teach and them those and are, take those them are... under their wing. And mm-hmm. I would believe that humans definitely evolved to have all that capacity. And, they, and, I, and, I, and I, would, I would agree with that because we tend to be more communitarian than other species, of course. Yeah. The other, also, the reason why we, we, we gravitate towards those stories where we find the orphan and we raise him to be the hero of this. The reason why we're attracted to the romance of that is because telling a moral story is be- yeah. because it is so unusual to, well, to, to, to take over the responsibility of another man. That's it's unusual to do that. Right. And you overcome, what have you overcome? You've overcome yes. your innate need to know that the kids, well, I know it's not my kid, but you know, I can't have kids. So I'm going to take this guy into my room. I teach him how to use a sword and defeat evil. You know that. Sure. But that I mean, that's the story. basis. There's of most a utility of stories, to that. Right? I mean, we don't, we, I mean, th- yeah, there are stories about, you know, bad people doing bad things, but I think there's a reason that most of our stories, our fictional stories are, you know, heroes doing great moral deeds is because they're all supposed to be persuasive cultural memes to try to get people to engage in those actions. Mm-hmm. 
And we also yeah. invest in people that are not our biological kin all the time. That's mm -hmm. what friendships are. I mean, you have networking on your list of things to do. Right. It's, kin, it's kin altruism. Like, who do you care for the most? Your your wife and your kids, your niece and your nephew, your uh, your I don't know whatever your your uncle like twice removed, or the people in your church, or the people yeah, in your different church. levels. Obviously. The, the reason oh, I laughed about the group fans. selection was because group selection is generally considered um, cultural groups competing against one another and you separated into men being a group and women being a group which i just well i'm saying that the reason it why it's let's just say this it's more prevalent amongst women than it would be amongst men because sure. men have that need to know to ascertain paternity whereas women uh, women know where the kid came from you know but it's it's just funny to think of women as a group that are evolving which i mean i guess you can cuz there's the war of the sexes men and women are obviously and in women competition are for children and they're having them later and later in life so but i don't think that's what sitch meant when he talked about group selection no, I mean, in the past, I, I understand that, like, like taking care of children that are your non-biological children, it's, I, I would argue this, it's, it's a, a more rare case to take care of a child that is outside the tribe, that is an orphan, than a orphan that is inside the tribe. So you got that kid. Oh, yeah, but that's a right completely there. different thing. I understand that, but I would say that it's probably more uh, prevalent amongst women, more acceptable or more, there's more of a, a mother, like, what is this, a uh, maternal nature amongst mm -hmm. women to the maternal drive to want to, that's why women like little dogs and cats and stuff like that to little, little neoteny, I think is what it's called. Sure. The more it looks like a baby, the more they want to care. Like that's why baby Grogu and freaking the Mandalorian is so fucking popular. Right. Right. He's right. taking care to, of the baby. To me, that that's whole, sort of that the trap. That's a great, that's a great illustration too. Like when, when the Mandalorian is taking care of baby Yoda or Grogu. <laughs> Like women don't want empowerment narratives. They want baby Yoda. That's, that's really what they're looking for. So the fact that the guy is taking care of he literally in the last series adopts baby Yoda into the tribe that is the Mandalorians. That's the narrative we're talking about. Right. right. There. Well, I mean, I think this is kind of one of the traps I think that people can fall into with the Evo psych stuff is kind of you related to talking about like the little pet stuff. Like you look at, you know, mm -hmm. humans. Women, but men too, they'll look at, you know, there's a cute little dog or cat or whatever. And they're like, oh my God, it's so cute. They'll make the little baby noises. And the reason they're doing that is because it's essentially like the evolutionary, you know, tendency to have that feeling towards a baby is being displaced onto a little cat or a little dog. It's triggering those same senses in the human. But that doesn't mean that humans evolved to have that feeling towards cats or dogs. True. Yeah, it's a it's a completely different species, but because right. it has the similarities of the yeah. stuff, right. really is that, right. that there's this there's innate need to want to mother yeah. it. Right? Well, like a lot of our like a lot of our evolved processes, I guess I'm saying, are they're not super fine tuned. They're just kind of broad and vague and, chemical yeah. processes. I Big would, eyes, small head is like. I would also you know, like so, baby. Yeah. <laughs> the reason I'm, I even bring that up is again that book positive evolutionary psychology i should go get the get the name of the author but it's called positive so, uh, evolutionary psychology it will it will rekindle your faith in evo psych because it's not like oh this is all negative unflattering shit it's meant to like but when i was talking about happiness and how happiness is meant to sort of like be an emotion that drives you from one state to another state it's in that book um the neoteny thing that we were just talking about right now we can be sympathetic maybe not empathetic we can be sympathetic and want to help you know, species that are outside or, you know, we're, we're definitely not biologically re related to this. So it's not kin altruism, but we want to help a dog or we want to help a kitten or something like that. Mm -hmm. right. That impulse in us is actually a positive. We, we can, it, it aligns with what our, our, our moralistic belief is that it's right to help an animal. It's right to help people that are right. in distress. There are evolutionary um, motivators prompts that make us want to do that. And that's, and, and it, it aligns with our morality just great sure so it's, sure, the, sure it's not all gloom and doom and it's not all just about like getting your rocks off true <laughs> libertarian sasquatch for two dollars says obi-wan kenobi is a cuck there you go wow wonderful so is the mandalorian i guess there you go. <laughs> he's a double cuck because baby grogu is not even his species <laughs> true uh landendorf for six months thanks so much says ask rollo about the authentic observer Oh, uh, some backstory with her or something. Uh, do you know who she is? 
Yeah, we had yeah, her we've on. had her on the show. Oh, okay, okay. I, for whatever reason, she's like the fourth Brit girl to come at me. What is it about British <laughs> chicks that I like, hate my guts? I was like, what's her name? Moon Cat came after me. Uh, what's that other girl? Um, Oh. The one that looks like Mooncat. There's, there's like, uh, there's like three or four of these girls, and it's like I, I tend to piss off British women quite a bit. I don't. We call them proto-Americans here. <laughs> would you debate authentic observer? Sure, sure. Oh, I don't okay. I think she would know what she was talking about. Well, See, we the, might be able to make that happen. <laughs> <laughs> I could do it, but the 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 problem I would have here is like we would probably get bogged down in. Um, straw manning because one of the things i think that like destiny does quite a bit is he just says those red pill guys say this when i'm talking about like hafiz from the roommates he'll say those red pill guys meaning me those red pill guys always say this and this and this and it's like mm -hmm. they, we're meant to take that as gospel because they're saying that they must be some sort of authority in the manosphere and every time i listen to those kind of arguments that straw manning of this is what it's really about i'm like who are you listening to who Tell me names. What what what's your experience in all this? Because this is empirically one hundred percent false, and I can show you that it's false. But it's there. It's what I call confident ignorance. They want to pretend like they have some sort of authority of, about the manosphere when they they don't have twenty years in it like I do. I can tell you right now that ninety percent of the stuff that they have an issue with with the manosphere is not what the manosphere or the red pill is about. Well, they're talking. I mean, I'm assuming like with Destiny, he's talking primarily about. Tate, Sneeko, and Fresh and Fit. Yeah, that's seems to be the like, three. Okay, so the I, let me explain. With. Destiny, if you're watching, the Manosphere and the Red Pill does not begin and end with Sneeko and Andrew Tate. I'm okay. starting to burst your bubble there, but okay. it's been around a lot longer than... I don't even think fucking Sneeko was born in 2004. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it was. Maybe it was like four years old at that time. So is it like with, when Destiny people will talk about this, it's not what they're saying, it's just that they're labeling a broad brush, essentially. Well, they find the under things the bus, that they, right? well, again, remember what we said about red meat and looking for sizzle and steak, right? They find what is the most sort of, it's what I call outrage brokership. It's the, it's whatever will produce the most outrage. And they'll go, I can't, can you believe those red pill guys? They say this all the time, heated mm -hmm. debate, right? You, the number seven will shock you, right. you know, that kind of shit. And they know that it agitates them, but they don't care because they're onto the, we live in the TLDR generation. So if it makes a good like sh YouTube short or it's a good, you know, 45 second uh, hot take on TikTok and they can move on to the next thing. It doesn't matter whether it's factual or not. They're just they've moved on to the next thing. But by doing dozens and dozens of these things that they produce and they create a, a an impression or a narrative about the red pill. And I've, I've you probably seen me say this as well is that it's what is it? Uh, this isn't my quote. I forget who said this, but it's a. Uh, it is an order of magnitude greater to refute bullshit than it is to create bullshit. Of course. Especially yeah. in the TikTok age, it is very easy to create bullshit. I'm the one who has to refute bullshit in five hour, you know, mm -hmm. podcasts every Sunday. Well, I think what happens, and you said this earlier, is that, you know, when the content creators in these spaces make the more, the ones that make the more incendiary claims, the more emotionally mm -hmm. prescriptive claims, they're going to get the most eyeballs mm -hmm. and they're going to kind of, be perceived by outsiders as like the forefronts of the movements. And then they're going to criticize their most incendiary takes. And it kind of becomes like this. Everyone just has this hyperbolized image of the movement in their mind that they're reacting to. And half yeah. the reason I went on Dr. Phil was exactly because of that. Yeah. We got to check that out. We'll watch that yeah. after the, after the broadcast. Well, anything else, Adam? No, are we, are we, what do you want to do? You want to say goodbye to Rolo? Don't we have a bunch well, of we other super, super chats? chats but, we're almost yeah. at five hours here. So. Yeah, so. yeah, no, <laughs> let's let's let's, let's say goodbye. Okay. We'll finish up on a couple other super chats, and I like I'm going to hold you to it, Rolo. You said you'd come sure. back on, so um, yeah, well, this was a, I, I definitely will. I did enjoy this. Don't, I mean, just because we get we have uh, look, we have spirit, we're men. We let it go. Okay, we're not. We're not. We're not women. We're not women. We don't carry That's grudges like, for. It. Before, before we go, let me explain something to you guys. I did a well myself and Mike Sartain. We did a uh, an Access Vegas interview of Dr. Richard Reeves. Richard Reeves was on uh, Dr. Phil with me on that show. I actually suggested to their producers that they get Richard Reeves on there because he has a book out called like Of Boys and Men or something, right? He is uh, a very much a classic liberal from the Brookings Institute. And talking about like men's issues, I he gets the 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 uh, the diagnosis correct. His prescriptions, I don't think I think are just pie in the sky like Pollyanna naive prescriptions. But I have him on the show, 
we're talking with him and everybody's like, you need to tell him to go to hell. Fuck this guy. They, they, you, you're going soft on him, blah, blah, blah. And I'm like, no, I'm having a conversation with this guy. And we're going to, we're going to, I know I'm not going to see eye to eye with him. I know we're not going to agree on a lot of shit, but you know what? I want this to be a, the first of a lot of series. Then maybe I can talk to him and we can in the future come to some sort of agreement or, or say, Hey, you know what? You changed my mind about this either way. And that's how you have that conversation. You have to have that crucible of open debate. Yeah. And you don't get that if you're just shutting people out all the time or you punch them in the face and say, ah, oh, see, I beat you. Fuck you. You know, it's this team sports mentality. I I'm, heard I'm never going to be about that. I heard this saying, uh, truth comes from argument among friends. And I completely mm -hmm. buy into that. Like at some point, I mean, you in order to search for the truth, you have to debate in a certain way you know you have to assume a certain amount of good faith in people you know you have to be able to say things that might hurt people's feelings like all that requires some sort of relationship between the people to really make and that's, it work that's so. becoming more rare so or, rare yeah. yeah exactly everything yeah, is like I'm, burn the bridge the bridge the is only burned way, <laughs> the only way to test the strength of an idea is in the crucible of open debate and yeah if that doesn't happen or people, and, and you, there's lots of ways to cancel that. There's, you know, technology wise, or simply you just like you, you adopt this team sport mentality. It's us versus them. And it's like, oh, you destroyed them. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. <laughs> well, this was a great discussion. Thanks. Thank you for having it with us. Uh, sure. You know, obviously yeah, leave us your thoughts in the comments below. And I guess we'll say, good. Uh, we'll say goodbye for now, Rolo. Sounds good. All right, guys. I've enjoyed this. We'll see you later. Take care. See man. you later. All right. Okay, let me go back. Read the ones I skipped. There you go. The only way to get the truth is to ask Chat GPT. How does Chat GPT feel about cucking? That's the real question. I mean, we could ask. If we, <laughs> I'm kind of if, curious. Write us an ethical conversation about cucking. If if we end up creating AI, a new a new species, we're essentially a species of cucks, right? We. Oh yeah, that's the ultimate. There you go. That cut look, CT, you gotta clip that cuck <laughs> that cuck debate out. <laughs> because that was hilarious. Yep. Oh my god. Magor, thanks so much for joining the free will seekers. Um, let's see. It's gonna take a while because I have to if they read each chat to see if I read it already. Oh yeah, we were totally skipping around. Yeah. Now fondue for two dollars says dual strategist or strategic duelist. There you go, I like it. But if I skip yours by accident, just ping me in the chat and I'll try to make sure I didn't get I didn't skip it. Um, Scott Gafrida for two Owasis says the tribe ran a train beating drums and all. That's terrible. Uh Von Du for five dollars. Thank you. Says, don't you get it, Adam? It's just contradictions of capitalism. I mean women. <laughs> Ouch. Big ouch. Oh yeah, I saw that one. Yes. Uh, fondue for Tudor says, I think I understand now how not so erudite feels. There you go. Oh, yeah. Um, a, and she had a conversation with Destiny, though, where she seemed to warm up to evolutionary psychology. And I DM'd her. I said, oh, you had this great conversation with Destiny. It's like, it seems like you are on board with Evo Psych now. Mm -hmm. And she was like, Adam. I've always been on board with Evo Psych. <laughs> That's always been my position. Yeah, she said, and I try to remember. I think in our conversation, she said she wasn't, um, she didn't hate it. I thought she just said she didn't like that people use it to make prescriptive moral claims. I thought that's what she said in our conversation, but I don't remember. We were not having a cooperative conversation about Evo Psych at all. <laughs> well, I don't remember us talking that much about it with her, honestly, but. I mean, I after a while, I kind of checked out of the conversation, but I kept. Oh, well, there you go. I was paying attention though, okay, and sure. I do remember. I do remember chiming in and saying, "Like asking, is it because of the red pill? Is that why you are not into oh. Evo Psych?" Obviously, I mean, not many other people really talk about it that much. Yeah. Unfortunately, just yeah, of course, yeah, it is sad. It's totally sad. Uh, fondue for two dollars. Thank you, Fondue, for all the money today. Says, quote, awesome, I'm a single mother. Said no one ever. There <laughs> you go. Yeah, that's a, yeah. Uh, Phil That Remains for $10 says, I just tuned in. What did I miss? Thank you, Phil Remains. Thank you for $10. Hope you enjoyed the conversation, Phil. 
Yeah, I got this book. I can't believe you've read a book that I haven't. The Ape That Understood the Universe. I don't think yeah, I've ever read book. that. You never read that? Uh, you, yeah. I just, I just got it. I yeah. had to read that for a psych class, actually, in college. Did you really? Yeah. yeah you were in college in 2019? But wait, maybe I'm thinking of a different book then. That book came out 2019? The Ape That Understood the Universe, yeah. What book am I thinking of? Well, but it could be a, it could be like the latest edition. Could be one of those books that has multiple editions. No, I'm probably thinking of something else then. Oh, okay. What the fuck book am I thinking of? It was like the ape. Well, it better it was... be good. I'm reading it on your recommendation. <laughs> well, I don't know. I've never read this book then. I mean, I listen, I like Stephen Stewart Williams. I follow him on Twitter. Oh, okay. So I'm sure it's a good book. But I guess not. I guess I'm thinking of something else. Then. What the fuck book am I thinking of? Well, if not, I'll just... I'll it's a book it. about Evo Psych that has ape in the title. That's all I remember. Powerful ideas, oh, bro. Maybe I'm thinking of a different book. Whatever. I'll check it out. I needed a book um, anyway. There you go. I'm sure it's good. All right. Magor for three months says, you should play the Ryan Long skit when Jordan Peterson tries to be Andrew Tate for the contrast. That sounds interesting. Is it bad or good? I don't know. I don't I'm think sure, I've sure seen it's that. funny. I'm sure it's funny. Andrew Long is hilarious. He was on Tim Pool recently. I don't know if you saw it. Uh, no, I don't watch Tim Pool regularly, so I did not see it. I don't watch Tim Pool regularly either, but I saw Ryan Long on there. Mm -hmm. It was actually a good episode. They were talking about the Steven Crowder deal. And how Tim Pool was talking about how a lot of content creators, they get screwed over by people who understand the landscape of the, the, they understand the YouTube environment and they give them shitty deals, which I can mm. see that happening. Like um, they, they know their earnings potential better than the, cr the content creators do. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it is what it is. They cuck him, basically. <laughs> I don't watch it on stream because it's like, I don't want to steal Ryan Long's content, but I'll watch afterwards. Five minutes when Jordan Pearson tries to be Andrew Tate. Cool. Libertarian Sasquatch for $2 okay. says, this is cringe. <laughs> oh, I saw that one. But Libertarian, Sasquatch, Libertarian Sasquatch, not a fan of uh, Rolo, it seems. Well, I don't know. It's when you say this is cringe, I don't know if you're talking about us responding or his. No, or... he means... He means uh, how do you know? Judging from all of those other super chats. Oh, Libertarian Sasquatch for four ninety nine. A fifty year old man unironically calling things beta, betas and bucks and cucks. Just feels so slimy. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Clark for two dollars says Rolo S class or eighteen. <laughs> we didn't ask. There we go. We didn't ask. Um, do do that's the con convention in Orlando. Uh, read that one. Or that one. Adam Robot for four months it says, Sitch, don't let Adam gaslight you. He is so emotional that he has two elephants and has passed his second off to you. Unrelated to the show, probably, though. I mean, I felt like yeah. we were doing pretty good. I felt like we yeah, were keeping good. it cool. We were. Yeah. I have come to the conclusion that keeping it cool is really the best strategy it is yeah it is sometimes yeah. difficult to do yes yes um john a for eight months oh i read that one uh libertarian sasquatch for another two dollars says this guy seems to think that all men think like he does yeah that's always a problem and we've talked uh, about blaine, that many times right. blaine's escape quarter thank you so much blaine for the five gifted memberships thank you yeah, I think Plane is a content creator. We should have him on sometime. We should. Yeah. Sam Always Sarah, like thanks so much for joining the Free Will Seekers. Uh, John A., thank you so much for the 10 gifted memberships. Thank you, John. Yeah. Uh, John Watts for three months with a bunch of T-Rex emojis. Thank you. you yeah, T-Rexes are cool. You know who wasn't getting cucked? T-Rex. T-Rex. Of course not. He was out there cucking other T-Rexes. Actually, don't even. What were the mating habits of T Rex? <laughs> Who knows? Who knows? Did they lay eggs? Probably. It, well, they're they're yeah, they did lay eggs. Yeah, of course they did. Do their colloquia? 
<laughs> the cloaca. cloaca. Did um actually wait? That's an interesting question. Do only mammals have harems, or like polygamous mating um, situations? Do any egg laying non mammals have like a harem type reproductive strategy? That would just change everything if you just hand the egg off. Here, you want to raise it, you raise it. Abort like it for all no I care. <laughs> it's your. To egg. be clear, I know there are non mammals that will have the sort of like they just like the male just tries to mate with as many females as they want. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the specific like lion gorilla strategy of there will be one male who'll have his like harem that he protects and mates with. And are there non mammals that do that? Chickens do know. that? Really? Chickens do that? Oh, you're right. Chickens. Yeah, with the, the, the cock. Oh, yeah. Chickens oh, okay. have so there big you go, time actually. harem. Interesting. Okay. There you go. Elephant seals. Yeah, elephant seals are. Mammals, though, obviously. Contrast for $2 says, Adam, why do you equate divorce and deadbeat dads? Listen, you're, I you're... asked because I was curious if the T-Rex, the mating strategies of the T-Rex, okay? That's why I asked. Oh, for the... And if they're related to chickens and birds, maybe. Anyway. Well, chickens are chickens are related to T-Rexes. Exactly, yeah. right? They're birds, yeah. Contrast for two, for two Aussie dollars says, Adam, why do you equate divorce and deadbeat dads? Well, you're exactly right contrast that's not a good thing for me to do because there are plenty of dads who want to have a relationship with their kids and what and whatnot and are not remotely deadbeat dads that end up getting divorced so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. it's not good it's to throw them under the bus so i probably shouldn't do that it's true chickens are domesticated but i don't think sharks have that kind of mating behavior. I don't think sharks, males don't stick around with females at all. Don't they're just completely <laughs> like soft, solid area. I've they? heard sharks, the baby sharks are born live, and that sometimes uh, they eat each other in the womb before they're even born. They're so Jesus. hungry. Yeah. Oh my God. Can you imagine? You're like just stuck in your mom's womb, and some brother comes over and says, I'm going to eat you, motherfucker. <laughs> Pretty bad. Get in my belly. That's pretty bad. Uh, no, Majin, do not. You should not draw me looking at T-Rexes having sex. <laughs> Majin has been going crazy on Twitter. He did. He I, I don't think I can bring any of these up. You can. You can bring them up. Can I? Are they? I mean, they seem like sexual content. To be honest with it's you, it's fine. You listen. It's me with my uh, snake. My snake waifu, okay. Well, one, I see, actually, I literally see a dick through the underwear. That one, I Listen, don't think we can bring. Just because you see the outline of my massive penis doesn't mean that YouTube will not like it, okay? You can censor it. You can put a little sitch, a little sitch face over my, my little sitch head. <laughs> Look, I'm not going to edit. I'm not going to censor these. <laughs> look, if you, if you guys hear all... I'll put a link in the chat if you guys want to look at the picture. You can... Wow, look at this fucking... Look at this cuck over here. <laughs> look at this cuck. Look at this cuck. Look, YouTube is cracking down on sexual content, so... Is that true? That's I don't true. know how... Rolo has a bunch of thumbnails, and I'm like, this is pornography. How do, How is this your thumbnail? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Tifa's crying right now. True. Of Jeez. course Tifa's totally crying right now. The Reaper for four months with the eagle with the American flag glasses. Thank you so much, The Reaper. Great custom emoji that we have there. I think CT uh, made that one. She did. Uh, Libertarian Sasquatch for $2 says, but Christian is a sophist? Question mark. Ooh. God. I should have called Rolo a sophist. Is that what that's you're what, saying? That's what they're saying. <laughs> Look, you can call him a sophist if you want. I, I, didn't, I didn't feel... Like he was dodging. I, I do feel like he was changing the subject on some of the stuff, and I feel like we were able to reel him in, mm -hmm. which I don't think was necessarily happening with Christian. So, yeah. Um, I think there's one dodge, which is the, the circle argument about the, stepfather cuck. Yeah. So, because I just I don't think there's a logic. Well, in, in the end, he agreed that the to use neutral language. I mean, we weren't even asking for him to use right. neutral language, but yeah, I, we, I just well, wanted him to admit make... that it, the charge language was serving a purpose, a moral purpose. Yeah, right. Yeah. Like you can you can say that you feel that way. It's just, but then you have to just accept that you're making a moral claim. 
Look, I'm sure there's a lot of people in the chat that feel being a stepdad is being a cuck personally themselves. Sure. Like if right. that's the way you feel, that's that's fine. I'm just saying right. when you go out in the world and call people cucks, you're you're well, saying yeah. you should feel this way. Right. And again, so you know, someone can make that argument. They can argue for that and that's fine, I guess. Um but it's just to to make the argument is to make a moral claim. That's my only point. Yeah. The rape thing was perfect. Like I said, CT, you got to cut that out. That was like beautiful. I I typed in the chat several times like this is so good. When he cuz when he brought J Mac into it, I was like, "Oh my god. How dare you attack our Well, no, it's our just It was perfect cuz everyone knew J Mac is like the super chat. Like everyone's like, "Yo, when you're like, what?" Yeah. I know. What are you talking about? It just made it was like, "Huh?" Just yeah. on the face of it, it didn't make any sense. Oh, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. Um, Fondue for five hours says, how has this guy done all this research and does not understand social slash moral prescription? There you go. Well, he's looking at it from mating strategy perspective. And like we, a lot of the evolutionary psychology that we've looked into is basically from a moral perspective. perspective right. Yeah. <laughs> J Mac for five dollars says, "My stepdad is not a cuck; he's a Chad." Yeah, based. There you go. Look, and a lot of the it's hard for me too because I know like a like a lot of my friends and stuff have stepdads, and it's like they have they have kids in other marriages. It's not like they're an evolutionary dead end or a cuck. You know, a lot of people used to get married. You know, they, they used to get their girlfriend pregnant and married at like 18. And then they'd reach 25 and realize, oh, my God, I married the wrong person. Mm -hmm. So they'd end up at getting divorced because it didn't work out and end up in another marriage. So the kids went with mom and dad got the new kids. Oh, is speaking that, of is adult... that horrible? I don't think so. No, I agree. Speaking of adult pictures, you should you should bring up that picture. uh of the of Sammy's package I sent you, Adam. Oh, is that the one you want me to bring up? We didn't bring up the Biden one last time either, which was is pretty funny. Yeah. Is this you putting your big look? Is that a this better be a sword? Okay, I don't know what this. <laughs> Sitch, did you? T is this your photography? Did you do this? This is my photography. Yeah. Okay. My photographer. Sitch wants to show off. Look, here's Sitch making a cuck out of the Adam plushie here. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know why you would do this. I saw this. Look, I saw this picture. Yeah. And I was like, what the fuck is Sitch doing with his spare time? Because <laughs> I thought you made this thing. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> he thought I made the pack. <laughs> Who sits down? Who sits down and thinks? <laughs> Who sits down and is like, I'm going to make a big black dick. <laughs> <laughs> Sammy G. That's well, no, it, once I got, look, then the next day I had one of these sitting on my desk and I was right. like, oh, now I get it. Now you get it. Yeah. yeah. I was like, okay, now it all makes sense. Mm -hmm. I did not even know how to respond when I saw this. I was like, sitch. <laughs> you need like a time management class or something. This is not good. Yeah, well, I'll send I'll send you a picture that gives you like a better scope of this. Oh no! Oh, no, without a big so um, you know, sexually lewd, right? Yeah, of course. So what? Uh, so Sammy sent me a package, and I I made the cardinal mistake. I jokingly said, "Don't do something." So right. of course, that's the signal to do something. Of course. This is so. Yeah, I said like, oh, because you want to send me the, there was Sitch and Adam's book, there were Sitch bookmarks that had like Sitch Chan on one side and like Sexy Sitch on the other. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, you know, don't send me them in like a dick-shaped package. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so, of course, what does that mean? <laughs> Did you even know you could get a dick-shaped package when you uttered this? Thing? I didn't know, no, I didn't know. The but internet. No, you, it, it's a giant fucking package, too. I sent you another, uh, so you could see the scale of this fucking thing it was foolish it was foolish um holy holy it's crap. a really big package holy crap in, in every sense of the word 
<laughs> I think Sammy might be trying to send you some message or something. I'm not sure. She wants me on her D. Is that what you're saying? <laughs> Maybe. That's, that's not. What she said. That's not what I'm saying. But oh, okay. That's how. That's how I interpreted it. So. Okay. <laughs> okay. And uh, well, I'll show you. Then in, inside of it, so inside of this massive dick package that that Sam sent me, uh, there's a bunch of bunch of gay art, <laughs> including gay me and you art. Well, we can't look at that. Well, it's not like nude. Okay. Like, you know, a bunch of men in compromising positions. So you're like, saying it's tasteful? It's tastefully done? Is that what you're? Tasteful. Well, tasteful. Is an oh my! Well, holy cow! Question, man. This is a work of amazing art here. This Isn't belongs it? in a museum. Doesn't it? It's pretty impressive. It's pretty impressive. <laughs> Look at this. Yes. Look at this. You open Holy it up, there's just crap. a lot of gay inside. But it's it's almost like a triptych, like a like a Catholic triptych or something. <laughs> the triptych dick. Yes, yes. Oh, you're right, yeah. You know what I'm talking about? I know, you know what you're the, talking about. The three, like, you know, the Garden of Eden on one side and the hell on the on the right yep. side. Yep. And then uh, inside, inside that box was mm -hmm. another dick box, mm -hmm. oh, which wow. was a dick, which is the dick box that you got. It was the same so it's like a way. dick within a dick, huh? It's a dick within a dick. Wow. I didn't even know that was possible. It's very possible, my friend. <laughs> Is it? Apparently. I mean, you'd have to have a pretty... A pretty big one. Or a very small one. Yeah. <laughs> a very tiny yep. one. No, so it actually... um, So uh, Sammy originally just went to buy the dick box, and she's like, this isn't big enough. So mm. she made a dick box that was even bigger. <laughs> So she bought the small dick box and then made yeah. the big dick box to go around. And then made the big dick right. box, yeah. yeah. Right. The big dick box energy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, she must really like you because you got the big dick box. That's true. Yeah. You just got, I, well, I sent I you a I got the leftovers. Kind of elucidate that. <laughs> Aiden Dill says, it's called docking. I didn't want to know that, Aiden. How yeah, dare, Sammy, I don't know if you want to show this. You. <laughs> Sammy, Sammy dressed up in this like nice dress to go mm. to the mailbox. Can I show that picture, Sammy? Oh, no. It's pretty funny. The picture of you at the mailbox, the mail place with this. <laughs> I'm nicer to Adam. Because <laughs> I'm like... I was like, I want to see, like, what is the, the male person's reaction when you go to the fucking postal office and you give right. them this dick package, right? Yeah. And you're just like, here you go. You guys mail dicks, right? <laughs> you guys mail screens. How do you do postage on <laughs> dick boxes? There, bring up. Is that about. like your dick in a box or is it a box shaped like a dick? <laughs> mm hmm. Okay, I, I sent you the picture, Adam. Is this like the. The comparing, hold on, which picture, which one am I bringing up here? Bring up both of them. The comparison and then Sammy mailing the package. Well, I, I don't see the Sammy mailing the package. Oh, just one. refresh. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'll just refresh. <laughs> oh, my God. Who, <laughs> who took this picture? This is hilarious. That's what, That was the first thing I said. I said who took this picture? <laughs> Mom, I need you to go to the post office with me. Look, no mother, no mother is going to be happy about this picture. She said it was not her mom. So. <laughs> Sammy, if this picture gets online, do you know what's going to happen? People are going to say they're going to. It's going to. This is going to lower your mate value, Sammy. <laughs> oh my goodness, Sammy. Did you bring it up? I did, yeah. But we want to see the guy's face. We can't see the guy's face. Oh, there's, a, there's another picture. Oh, there is? Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like a, a better picture of the guy's face. Well, well like doxing the guy. But... 
Oh, okay. But um, no, because that's what I, I was like. I, what is the the guy when you go to the post office and you hand them this big fucking dick box? Mm -hmm. What the fuck is the guy's reaction to that? Yeah. <laughs> This is gonna be like, oh my fucking god! Is this dick going international? <laughs> she said, um, she said when she mailed you the dick box, mm -hmm. your dick box, mm -hmm. a different person was there, and they said, oh, you're the girl with the dick box. <laughs> <laughs> they knew she had a reputation. I was like, so there you go. Come on. They work at the post office. You know, they were talking all day long about the, about dick, the box. dick box. Yeah. How many right. people, how many people were goosed with your dick box before it actually made it into the, <laughs> into the mail truck? Listen, she brought light and love to a very bored postal office. Okay. Right. With that dick box. Sitch wants me, wants to obviously show off the dick measuring contest going on here in his room. Where is it? Where is this happening at? Sitch, uh, Sitch has a giant it's wang happening in here. Happening my sex dungeon, obviously. Sitch has a giant wang here, and I've got like the itty bitty little peeny. <laughs> <laughs> Although proportionally, as a little uh, plushy, obviously that's. I mean, it's I don't. Still pretty <laughs> massive. Yes, I don't. Still look, very massive. Look, yeah. yours is like the Empire State Building. I know. <laughs> it's a little uh a little much, right? I can't imagine I can't imagine you getting a girlfriend with that kind of like I you know, some I hear tell that girls like um penises to be a bit larger, but I think there, there, is, there is a, a limit. limit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there is a limit. I agree. Yes. I, I am pushing it. There. there is there is, yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> that is like the um that's like the death note. <laughs> the ding, death. Do, ding dong there. The death note. Huh? Yeah, when you write down like death by my schlong. That's my penis. Yes. Okay, enough of this. Look, now if the stream isn't demonetized by now, I don't know what is going to demonetize it. That's hilarious. Where'd you go, Sitch? Did you leave? Oh, I, I took like 20 pictures of those boxes. Oh, you're, so, you're saying, still sending more pictures? I was saying if there's any other ones I should show. Like, I That's took so hilarious. many pictures of this box. I thought it was so funny. I took a bunch of pictures. I took one of you, of your plushie, riding on top of the dick box. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> I just imagine. A nice... Uh... A nice Stitch playing, shirt. Stitch playing with dolls in his room. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Listen. Sammy sent me all the extra Adam plushies, and in our living room we have them all yeah. hanging from the ceiling. But That's every time, creepy. every time someone visits, they want one so bad that we're like, okay, <laughs> we'll part with the Adam oh, plushie. There you go. Yeah. Nice. So they're disappearing. <laughs> yeah, it's kind of cool. Well, I don't know. I sent you what was inside my dick box. Okay. The little dick box at the bottom, which was, I thought, very funny. But yeah, that's the thing where... What was oh, it? Sammy sent me an alligator jerky and these amazing paper clips in the shape of an elephant. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> a lot of good things. All right. I guess I didn't and refresh then... soon enough because I finally saw the picture of the post, the postal worker. Oh yeah, he's like, what which the is fuck? hilarious. Yeah, yep. baby. He's like, what the fuck? He's like, this fucking crazy bitch. <laughs> is it white pants? <laughs> with the black, black penis box. <laughs> oh, look at this face. What are you trying to tell me here? <laughs> <laughs> You can totally see that smile. Yes. Uh, yeah. Yep. Mm -hmm. Hand reveal. Now show us your face. That's right. You guys got some sitch hand reveal. That's true. That's true. Oh, is that what happened? That was your hand in there? That Who else's hand would it be? I don't know. Maybe Mom, was... can you come hold the dick box for me so I could take a picture? Sure <laughs> thing, honey. Know. I thought maybe you hired a hand model. 
And that was at the bottom of the box when I when I got all the goodies out. <laughs> I did laugh pretty hard at that. That guy flipping the bird. The guy flipping me off. That's what you get. <laughs> yep. Take Perfect. that. Perfect. Thank you, Sammy. It's a wonderful package. And and package. I mean that in every sense. <laughs> package. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. What great fun. Thank you. Uh, let's see. I read that one. Darth 360 no scope. CT for two Canadians says, don't worry, you're a 10 2 sitch. Well, thank you, CT. I appreciate it. Yeah. You're not the only 10 here, Adam. Watch out. I know. I know. We're all 10s. We're all 10s. That's right. We shouldn't be selling free will. We should be selling 10s, <laughs> right? Well, I just like it's so superficial. I don't, I thought we were, look, I don't like superficial people. I really don't. <laughs> mm -hmm. I I live in Los Angeles. I'm surrounded by superficial people. I just, I don't think, you know, look, I like attractive people as much as an ex guy likes attractive people as much as much as an ex gal loves it, likes attractive people. Of but course. If you if all you are is attractive and you're just you know brain dead, which I've met plenty of people like that, God, that's a chore. That's that's like a chore to be around. Mm -hmm. Don't you think? No, I agree because you know it's funny. Like you know, um, why I listened to Rolo's entire not entire thing, but I listened to like three hours of his stream, the David M. Bus stream, mm -hmm. and it was funny because like. You know, he was talking about Twilight, you know, briefly brings up Twilight. And I was thinking back, you know, I always talk about, I was, you know, dating this girl who was really into Twilight. So I watched these terrible fucking movies. Um, but I would have conversations with her about like, you know, what is the underpinning thing, you know, evolutionary tendency, what is the underpinning psychology that women likes Twilight? And I have an interesting conversation with her. I take something that was really fucking super boring, Twilight, and I turn it into an interesting conversation with her about like why is it that women are attracted to these twilight characters what do these characters represent and i was like yeah if you're just going out with someone who's an idiot it'd be like a fucking horrible experience like how do you have these conversations with someone that are just, just oh they're pretty but they're stupid you're like get to the sex <laughs> yeah i guess i guess i mean i don't know look you gotta have yeah. something to talk about after the sex is over all right what's well, the thing like if you're just looking for sex then why are you wasting your time in a relationship just fucking hire a you know an attractive prostitute right yeah so, you gotta find someone that's your partner someone that'll have your back yeah someone you enjoy being around okay nils anonymous for five dollars says look if your wife is looking up a swedish death metal band look through her phone and steal her playlist true Libertarian Sasquatch for five dollars says Rolo should teach a class on how to rationalize your insecurity one oh one. Ouch. Libertarian Sasquatch just going after Rolo. Going hard, yeah. Uh Fondue for five dollars says, What's the whole point? You can't get away from making moral judgments. The human species doesn't work that way. True. Yeah. Well, I think you can, but you have to be I think if you're not making a moral judgment, you have to be very clear that you're not making a moral judgment. If you're, if that's your plan of action. Well, we, the thing is, and the only reason we kept bringing it back up was because he brought it up. Well, He's he is making one. moral judgments. Um, of course so, he is. But yeah. he was the one that came out and said, look, this is just, you know, I'm talking descriptively, not prescriptively. Right. But I don't uh, think you can say that if you're calling everyone cucks. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Doomer for $2. Thank you. My uh, stalker love Doomer. Says, eat some slimy, vile ocean garbage, sea boy. I don't know who, 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 do you want to do that? I don't know who you're talking to there, but be nicer to, be nicer to our guests, okay? Ex Excel self for ten dollars says, gynocentrism. Quote: It's not what you say; it's how you say it. How you said it, my feels. It is literally the same end result, regardless of how you feel. Interesting. Um, are you talking about that in terms of the the cuck comment? 
Because I don't agree. How you say something. Because it's not just a question of how you say. I mean, none of us were talking about Rolo in terms of like his tone. It was more about you whether you're making a moral prescription when you call an action a cuck action, which I think it intrinsically is because... When you say something as a cuck behavior, you cannot separate that from the fact that we as humans label something that is cuck as something to avoid. Yeah, obviously. discouraging it. So, right. Um, well, this is the whole idea. They wanted to stop slut shaming so women could be whores. Right. They were like, stop shaming us. Right. So, and how we and how we decide to define something can obviously have a moral prescriptive reason to it. I mean, this is kind of the whole conversation we have with you know, the leftists when they talk about how they want to define a woman and they try to they try kind of to do something similar where they say, oh, well, it just is. A trans woman, it just is a woman. It's like, well, wait a minute, slow down. You're trying to define a trans woman as the same as a cis woman by, because you're trying to create some sort of moral, uh, you're trying to use a moral claim to produce a behavior yep. out in the world. And this is kind of when we were covering Big Joel's video, which he didn't seem to understand or he pretended he didn't understand. Oh, he pretended. Yeah. Look at that. Right. Pretender. Well, it's just it's so stupid. It's hard for me to wrap my brain that he didn't understand what's going on there. But, um, did you see Corn Cob Jake covered our cover? Yeah, I, well, I saw that he did. did. I didn't watch it because it was like right before we started streaming. So, there was, I listened what, to what a video. What video was it that he was covering? Our talk with TJ. Oh. Which it was kind of interesting because, I mean, we were getting along with TJ. And, mm -hmm. I mean, he was just basically, Corn Cob Jake was completely bad faith. Like, he of was course. criticizing the way we looked. <laughs> Listen, we have shit on Corn Cob Jake so right. much. Like, every facet of that man's being, we have made fun of. So, I, that he, we are open game to him as well. <laughs> it's totally fine. Well, no, okay. I completely agree, obviously. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I just, I feel more comfortable calling him a fat ass now. <laughs> <laughs> because I feel like, look. Right. I don't, did we call him a fat ass before this? Maybe, um, I don't know maybe, if we called him fat. Maybe we did. I don't know if we called him fat. I don't remember. Probably. There was one, he made some like really fucked up comment about mm -hmm. bullying children. In the past, I remember I said, oh, well, that's how you're... If, if you're fine with bullying children that you don't agree with their politics, then, you know, we're not going to have any mercy with being you know, nice or mean to you at that point. Oh, yeah. So maybe we called them fat then. I don't remember. That's that was hilarious. obviously before, um, you know, we talked to TJ. So, yeah. I mean, it'd be interesting because I, I, I wonder if that means Corn Cob Jake has watched all of us shitting all over him. He just seethed silently about it the whole time. <laughs> Well, the last exchange we had on Twitter right. was he tried to come out and say that we were begging to have him on. And I was like, we invited you on. You declined. We're not like pining about it. Yeah, and I, that was I remember yeah. telling him like the, right. that window has closed. Like we don't necessarily want to have you on anymore. Mm -hmm. So go fuck yourself. Well, it's like a weird, it's like a cope, you know? Oh, you know, he's not running from us, right? He, we were mm -hmm. begging. We we're, you know, we're the ones in the, in the more beta position, we were begging him. Like, he's so high status that we, like, really give a shit. We get way more views than him. Yeah. What is he talking about? I know. I Look, know. and I just, he, the, he, the thing that he said that really stuck with me was he was basically making this argument that we were framing everything in mm -hmm. a way that was just intended to be bad faith. When we were talking to TJ? Yeah. We were, t we were talking to TJ specifically about dogma and we were framing, like we framed uh, trans women or women as a dogma. That's exactly mm -hmm. what people are trying to do. And he thought us using the religious terminology was basically done in bad faith to kind of make moral prescriptions because everybody hates religion. Well, But he got it completely wrong because our crowd, we don't, we're not religious haters at all. It's he's he's half right and half incorrect. We're not mm -hmm. saying it in terms of like religion bad, right? We're saying in terms of religion is not something that's based off of it's something based off faith as opposed to something that's based off like evidence, yeah, and evidence, right? And so that's totally. what we were alluding to when we would have that conversation. 
Right, but I, I in the conversation I was saying that dogma is not necessarily bad because I was saying not. like, right. you know, don't lie is a dogma. Yeah, having you know patriotism is, is a form of sure dogma. right. Not being anti-racist is a dogma. right. But since Jake, you know, he's super atheist or he's an anti-theist, right? You know, from his perception, us calling it dogma has that since it would have it to him, he assumes that was our intention. No, of course not. So, yeah. Now maybe if we had a conversation with him, we would say that just to. You know, rile him up because you know he doesn't like. It. <laughs> That's a different thing. I mean, I don't. Now think he's going to listen to that and say, "Look, I told you there were bad things. Look at that." There you go. I mean, we weren't we weren't doing that to TJ. I don't. No, think we were no. Talking about it in those terms for for you know annoying TJ because we liked. I mean, at least at the time of the conversation, I, I liked TJ even though I disagreed with him. So. Look, I've gone out of my way to be nice to TJ, and I think right. T, like I would like to have TJ back on the show. The, I didn't get the like the promise to come back on, that I should have got to get D, to, to be able to like force TJ back onto the show. So right, but he Fondue might for, he might come on. Yeah, sure. Um, Fondue for five dollars says Corn Cob Jake tried to act like he didn't know who you were. It was pretty funny to see him see. <laughs> that was funny. Oh yeah, he did that. <laughs> he completely did that. Like you picked out the video, you know who the fuck I am. <laughs> well, then you got. Did you have a conversation with him like a while ago, like like years ago? Am I hallucinating? We had a, only a conversation on the internet on the oh, on, Twitter. on Twitter. Yeah. Okay. Well, here's the thing: you guys don't know. Like, if we cover someone's video, it sends a notification to their YouTube channel. It says this person used your content. Should you copyright strike them? So everyone we've covered knows who we are. Like no one can pretend they don't know who we are. Well, they they might not go to that tab. So I've I didn't know that tab existed for like okay, maybe, a year. Until... Right. Maybe I don't know. I mean cuz you cuz they know who we were because early, like one of the first people we ever covered when we started doing this was them. Was yeah. their was them. It was their Bible reloaded stuff because they were going very hard after Jordan Peterson and just kind of bad faithing everything about Jordan Peterson. Yep. So or and not so understanding it. Right, right. So so we covered them. Then uh, James from Modern Day Debate of Total Bro, good friends with him, mm -hmm. reached out and said, hey, you want to debate Jake? And we, Sitch and I both said, yeah, hell yeah. And they said no, that they, we were bad faith. They didn't want to debate us. Right, right. So, I don't know. Yeah. Majin says they did a response to us about the JP Jordan Pearson stuff. Did they? I don't remember. Kind of vaguely, that. Now that you said that, I kind of vaguely remember that, but I don't remember what they said in it. So, oh, really? Whatever. Anyway, it's all you know. It's all a, a, a game of uh, pro felicity at this point. We with, have a Jake. I mean, we we kind of we want to invite anyone on the show that we cover their stuff. That's just kind of a, a, a rule that we have. So, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I it's more a sitch thing. I'm like, no, let's just beat up on them and tell them to fuck off when they want to come on the show. But, well, no, listen, I'm fine beating up people, but I just I feel like if we do beat up on someone, unless that person is like super bad faith, you know, they want to come on and, and I mean, it's good content when we talk to them. Sure, yeah, no, right. That's a big question, like whether or not it's going to be productive. Sure. Most of the time well, I it's not like a question. It's well, not. no, it's not a question of productivity. It's a question is, will it make good content? <laughs> That's yeah, the question. no, you're right. That is more yeah. important. Well, it, here's the question: You have to weigh in your mind. Will it make good? The amount of good content we'll make versus how will I feel good or shitty after the conversation? Right. <laughs> it's, you have to kind of weigh these two things in your in your mind. Well, you're always no. more apprehensive about that stuff than me. I'm just like, whatever. Mm. About what? Just having well, a no, conversation. I don't want, I don't, I'm like, just. I'm just mapping. No, on. I want to do. I like to. If I'm talking to someone, you like, want to be prepared. Be very, I know. Yeah, who I know is going to be very um, confrontational. Confrontational. Yeah. I want to be prepared to understand their arguments. So. Right. Because they could just throw out a bunch of shit, a bunch of like you know studies and facts. I'm like, I don't fuck it. You know, how do I? I don't really know any of this because here's the thing if you listen to like destiny or vosh or people that are like really uh, good at a lot of like internet debate stuff 
Um, you can tell when they don't know whatever is being related to the study because someone will cite a study and they don't try to refute it. They just kind of change the conversation yeah. to some other point. And I don't, I mean, I could do that. I don't like to do that. I want to actually try to refute or understand whatever their specific argument is. So. Yeah. We want to engage with their substance. Right. I agree. Uh, blue five, six, six for five months. Thanks so much. Being a five month discipline equals freedom. It says there's a different pretext to the relationship. If you're a cuck, as opposed to being a stepdad, <laughs> even objectively, rarely do we define things only by the outcomes they entail. That exactly it. True. Yeah. Exactly. It, yeah. That's why at the end, and I brought up like, if you're just going to define something by its biological outcome, we're all just dead. We're just dead men walking at that point. So and we don't really define life that way. I almost asked him, how does, how does he feel about abortion? Because the entirety of the abortion conversation is where you define where life begins or not. So speaking of abortion, caffeinated tweaker for two Canadians says, why does Rolo thinks, oh no, that's a, that's the next one. Let me jump down to it. Speaking of abortion, caffeinated tweaker for two dollars says, "Kids deserve to suffer because the mother because kids deserve to suffer for the mother's choices." There you go. Wow. True. Isn't that just the same as the abortion argument, though? That's the pro life argument, right? Interesting. Yeah. I don't know if CT, I, CT, I don't know if you meant to accidentally make the pro life argument, but. Well, she was meant more in, into the relationship of like, you know, you shouldn't have stepfather or something. Yeah. And obviously, so. ki a kid is much different than a, than a fetus. Uh, fetus. Yeah. Right. Well, as you said, I think a lot of people, and kind of where the conversation is, I, I don't know what the stats are. I mean, he brought up the 42% the of kids born out of wedlock thing. But I'm still pretty sure that in those statistics, there's there are people that are in relationships, long term relationships with people. Yeah, that are unmarried. Not, yeah. Yeah, there's unmarried. Cohabitating. Right. They're cohabitating or something. <laughs> um, but I'd be curious because I think a lot of what goes on too is what you said. It's like um, a lot of people, they'll have a, a first marriage, they'll have kids, they'll get divorced, and they'll remarry someone else that ha already has kids. Right. So they're so, not interested in having kids together. They're, they already have, you know, biologically right so reproduced. to call that like a cuck is really fucking weird but then also it's weird too because it's only from the male perspective i mean why is it we're not what are stepmothers cucks <laughs> you know for raising someone else's kid i mean i don't know it's, it's to me again it's super weird and we don't want to have our society based based off of these like very narrow evolutionary biological lenses I don't think that's going to produce good outcomes for anybody. So. The idea of calling your stepmom a cuck is hilarious. <laughs> it's fucking weird. Yeah, it's weird. So I don't know. The whole thing is bad. But Who's um, that woman? That's my cuck. That's my dad's new cuck. There you go. <clears throat> and you know that's happened. You know there's been some fucking stepson now who's like watched Andrew Tate or something their stepfather a cuck. oh that's so horrific i feel like if they do they should get i think it was like a free pass to just smack your child <laughs> your stepchild in the mouth well this is a thing i mean you just you put build, the fear of god in them you build relationship yeah you know, like you build lifelong friendships with people as well i don't understand why of course what's different about that there isn't yeah, yeah what, what's the point of you why would you like if you have a friend and they're like, oh, can you help me do something? She said, no, no, I don't have a reproductive advantage in doing in helping. You yeah, do of course you have. A, <laughs> you do though. What? It's a coalitional advantage. Like that, we're all about building coalitions. Yeah, right, right. That's yeah. the beauty of it. Well, also, I mean, lots of people that, that that marry people that have children. Either they have their own children with a previous marriage, or they can still have children with that with that person. So I don't. The whole thing yeah. just seems weird. It seems super weird to me. To me. Or they that. build a relationship with the kid, like sure, of course. Some kids are actually interesting. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, Definitely a good thing. It is moral to do such a thing. Uh, Lucius Cornelius Sulla for five dollars says, "I know someone who defended the Uvalde cops at first. They said you can't expect small town cops to stop a mass shooter. That's pretty fun. That's wow. some weird levels of fucking cope. Jesus, that's bizarre." 
uh, <laughs> uh, Goob for 12 months. Thank you so much for being a 12 month free, free will seeker. Says, What are you doing, step cuck? <laughs> You know the you know the comic of like the father like how you doing? <laughs> it's, oh, that's yeah. what you do. It's the are you winning, son? <laughs> are you winning, step cuck? Wow, <laughs> that should be the comic. That should be the red pill comic. Are you winning, step cuck? Terrible. Yeah. Uh, Kevin Humphrey for five dollars says, "Why would a guy want to invite the responsibility of a kid from another father into his life just for sex from a ten? It sounds like a bad deal to me. Well, if it was just for sex, I would agree with you." would be a really bad reason to do it um but i don't think you should get in a relationship with anyone just for sex so and if you uh go ahead well is it, if if you meet someone who you really like sexually you really like emotionally you really like them as a person and you want to be with them i mean obviously you know you weigh that in your mind about is that worth the responsibility of having a kid another kid a kid in the first place or another kid in your life it's all things that you'd have to to weigh in your mind so. Yeah, and once again, I just I want you to make that calculation. Like, I sure. maybe she's like amazing in the sack or something, and blows your mind, and you instantly fall in love. I just I don't think. Well, I don't. I think should marry someone just because they're really good at sex. But... Don't listen to Sitch. Okay, he doesn't know. <laughs> he has no idea what he's talking about. We okay? know who's the Coomer brain here. But... Look, but I'm just look. I I only bring it up as an example. Like, who knows why why you make the calculations that you make but i'm just saying each individual should be able to make those calculations for themselves without society right. jumping in and saying no you know we you can't do this because i'm going to shame you for why i mean not why right, right. yeah well and also the, i mean the question is too why is that's not really asked is um why is the biological <laughs> imperative the correct one yes yeah totally in the first place it yeah. is for some people but i it's like well, okay yeah you can make a decision that it is but there's no you can't assume it to be automatically true that mm -hmm. that is the important thing that is the moral there is a moral prescription just by assuming that the biological imperative is the one you should follow in the first place right so uh bizarrely base thank you so much for joining the free will seekers yeah totally welcome um, is that one uh, bizarrely based for 75 NTs? What are NTs? The stepdad is okay if mommy is 18. If it's a it's a cuck, if it's mommy a cuck, is if 30. mommy is 30. Oh. This is an interesting argument, actually. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm not sure I will agree to the cuck language at either age just because i feel like it is trying to shame the person but it is interesting you're you're basically laying your calculation on the table you're you're saying listen if she's 18 and possibly can have more kids with me then we're having a conversation if she's sure over the hill and wants me to be stepdaddy for life you're out of there well, I mean, that would depend. Do you have kids? Did you want to have kids, right? Well, that so, would be, yeah, obviously part right. of the calculation that's not in the super chat, but. Sure. I mean, I think a lot of people do include that in the calculation. Of course. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, having, whether you want to have kids or not is included in the calculation too. Of course, yeah. Uh, Blank Escape Corner for $2 says, that sounds like a defense of Murphy. <laughs> Rollo equal cock. That's what I was saying. His, his definition of cock is. I mean, he's kind of including himself in the definition, so. How? You know, it's, I, I don't agree with that. Just because he's, you know, he's helping all these other disaffected young men that are oh, not yeah. his offspring. So he's wasting time and resources on them. So. I, isn't it? I mean, at some level, it feels good to help people. Of I mean, it's it one does. of the things all content creators talk about, like the emails or messages they get from people, you know, saying you inspired me or helped me right. make some decision. That's well, that, awesome. Though that's why to me, the the oversimplification and reduction of, of the definition of cuck didn't make sense. Because to me, the key aspect of being cuck is that you are being tricked into doing something that you are not aware of oh, that, is, yeah. that is limiting your uh, reproductive ability, you know, behind your back, essentially. Yeah. Right? 
That's what you're it being means. defrauded. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. right. That would be another good example. Like, there's a difference between like you know, defrauding someone of something and you know, selling them something, <laughs> right? Or yeah. you know, stealing versus buying from someone. You know, the end. You know, the end is the end result is kind of the same for the for one person, right? Right. Whether you stole it from or you bought from them, they get the they get the object. So. Uh, Andrew Clark for two dollars says enjoying family time. It's my birthday. Well, happy birthday, Andrew Clark. Yeah, happy birthday. I guess I won't. Uh, I feel like I should take Andrew Clark's wrench away on his. You birthday. Can't take it on his birthday. That's like that's just cruel and unusual. I feel like I should. I feel like I should. Yeah. <laughs> Here's your birthday present. Here's your birthday present, <laughs> Yank. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You didn't do it right. I did not know. Good. That's <laughs> that just looks awful. Uh, Gray Poupette for five dollars. Hey, Gray it says, "Hey, fellas, I need a free will refill from my debate with <laughs> with OC and AF's little buddy Ed this Thursday at five p.m." Ed says, "A comedian telling edgy jokes is not free speech." Wow. I'll have to check that out. That sounds interesting. Yeah, I was like going to watch your video, but I couldn't remember the name of your channel, so I linked it now. It's like Grey Poupon, but Grey Poupette. Right. Yes. I so su could... subscribed, but, right. you know. So on Thursday at 5 o'clock, you'll be debating someone saying, telling edgy jokes is not free speech. That's Look, I'm clicking notify me right now. He's already got the stream up. Doomer is super cucked, right? Yes. Doomer is the most cucked, so... Stitch should Google stepdad without the filter off to get a better idea. <laughs> I'm gonna pass on that one. <laughs> is, is that see that's the question for Rolo? <laughs> if the stepdad fucks his stepdaughter, is he a cuck? <laughs> how does that how does that enter the equation, Adam? That's a little. That's a little, <laughs> that's a little much. That's a little much. Yeah. <laughs> right. <laughs> There you go. I don't know how Ro I'll let Rolo respond to You'll that next Rolo time he comes that on. Right. right. That's funny. Uh, where was it? Rock? <laughs> oh, Soto's for two dollars says. Turns out Lay Miz is a cuck story. Who knew? True. That's true. Wow. Did you know that? Um, what was the name of the cop in, in Lay Miz? It's chasing Jao Valjean. I don't remember. Probably because I've never seen Le Mis. Inspector Javard. Is Javard a cuck because he spends all his time in, res in resources trying to catch uh, Valjean? Oh, yeah. Instead Obviously. of, like, you know, having a family? Obviously, yeah. What is this picture you put <laughs> That's you. Live reaction to the your mail, your the mail of the day. It, you didn't bring up the picture of me with my snake waifu. You brought up the picture of me with the penis box. I can't. Why are you? Why are you? What are you wearing? Star wearing of David shorts or are you Star in your of David underwear? Boxers, yeah. There you go. You're like, yay! <laughs> I've been like, yay! I got my big black penis box. Yep. What does that mean? <laughs> Madge, you gotta tell us what the mean what the deep hidden meaning of this is. There you go. Look, I picked the one where the the dildo was blurred, so we were safe for you two. Thank you. <laughs> he's got he's got it digitally blurred in one. Uh, Zero Fox <laughs> made a horrific picture, Adam. I don't know if you saw it. I can I bring it up? I don't one of them looks Who is are these too much people? Too much boobage in the... I mean, it's all clothes. Who are these people, though? There's I, me, you, Dev, Carl, Kittith. I don't know who the black guy is in that picture, but... Yeah. And Baby Yoda. I mean, listen, Adam, you got a really nice rack in that picture. I do, yeah. Thank you. Now, if Thank I had to choose in that picture, I'm going with Adam. Thank you for give, giving me the nicest rap. I mean, the, the facial hair might be an issue, but, you know. Look, I can shave. 
<laughs> you gotta bring the picture, otherwise people don't know what the fuck we're talking about. Okay, I'll bring it up. They're like, what the fuck is happening? No one tell Lance that we use this picture yeah. in the live stream. Yes. This is the whatever podcast. Mm -hmm. Zero fucks made this monstrosity. Right. For some reason. Did he Photoshop all those cups in or? Oh, no. No, those are all those cups were there. There's a lot right. of cups there. Jeez. Yes. Did you, you Photoshop? Why did you Photoshop an N64 onto the table? <laughs> yeah, I was like, what's what's that all about? <laughs> I feel like there's some video games photoshopped in there somewhere. Wait, do they have a fucking... Is that the stone trophy from Guts in the middle of the table? I don't know. Nickelodeon game show Guts? Hmm. There you go. The N64 covers their Game Boy. That is Sargon, yes. Yeah, hey, look at so... Adam. Adam. Adam's got the nice bod there. Adam's definitely a 10 in that picture. Look at that. Yep. Coming for Adam's you. about to fall out of his dress. <laughs> Look if go. it happens. If it happens, it happens. I do like that Sargon has a little baby Yoda. Baby Yoda is always a good accessory. <laughs> yes. Women do love baby Yoda. There you go. Yeah, the aggro crack. That's what it was. Yeah. Oh my god, you're right. Once I get a face reveal, it's gonna be awful. It's like my face on everything. Yeah, that's gonna be great. Uh Junebug for two dollars says, I like Rolo. Well, thank you. There you go. Stug for two dollars says, You should have asked who Rolo keeps in his witch shit. <laughs> that's terrible. Um Ard, adherent of Lady Columbia for $5. Say, look at that. Bioshock Infinite fan. This was quite an interesting conversation, and while there's disagreement, it was overall very civil. True. That is true. I mean, it got a little heated at some time, so. Yeah, but it wasn't like. <clears throat> That's always good. No ad homming occurred. Right. Well, except for the stepdads. Well, neither of us, no one here is a stepdad. So, I mean, right. there's no ad hominem of another participant in the conversation. Uh, J Mac, cursor get father J Mac for $20 says the male sea louse. There's a sea louse. Hmm, I don't know. Oh, it's a little, little, uh, little cephalopod thing. The male sea louse forcefully impregnates a bunch of females and buries the. Buries them under the sand. The eggs develop internally and eat their way out once fully developed nature. That is fucking horrific. Jesus Christ. Well, that sounds like a cuck. <laughs> I mean... That's, I don't know. That's fucking horrifying. Oh, my God. So he, he impregnates the female. He rapes the females. Then he buries them under the sand. And then they're eaten by their own offspring. It's disgusting. This is why you don't make moral prescriptions based around evolution, everybody. <laughs> Jeez. Terrible. Uh, Ethan Rogers for $2 says, how does cuck queening fit into this? That's a good question. How does it? Uh, Asmi for 30 MYR says, rape and sex are not the same. One gives you trauma while the other doesn't. There are cases where it doesn't happen, but you're just looking for exceptions at this point. He is anything but rational. There you go. Uh, Blind Escape Quarter for $10 says, Thanks, Adam. I make content around healthy escapism, anime, and games. Friend, friend, and I went through a bad time, and he's a friend. Oh, I had a friend and went through a bad time, and he's gone. Wanted to make space for people to know work stuff isn't everything. Well, that's nice, Blaine. I like that. Yeah, we'll, we'll have you on sometime. I've watched some of your videos, so. Uh, Asmi for six MYR says this guy is anything but rational. Asmi was not a fan. We should have the uh, IJP Mexican on as well because he does content too. Sure, definitely. Yeah. Uh, Joe Sullivan for eight months says, "When's the last time a cuck was accused of abusing a child?" Pretty sure stepdads have that stereotype and not cucks. So what is really worse? 
Well, that's interesting. <laughs> that is true. There's definitely a difference of uh, behavior going on there. Uh, Lucius Cornelius Solova for $2 says, the context was arguing for stricter gun control. Oh, the um, you can't expect small town cops to run in there. That makes sense. So apparently they were... I could see that. So someone is kind of trying to justify why they need stricter gun control. And so they kind of make up this insane argument like, well, you can't expect the cops to run in there when there's a mass shooter. It's like, well, no, I can. I can totally expect them to do that. But no, nope, it's interesting. Do your job. Yep. 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 I hate to have to agree with the pyramid scheme on that one, but. Uh oh. <laughs> Uh, some weird guy. Some weird guy. Well, let me make sure I read that. I read. Uh, I read that one. I read that one. Some weird guy for two dollars says, "Is Kid Boo more sympathetic than Frieza?" Kid Boo operates basically by instinct, emotion, and impulse. While Frieza predated, while Frieza premeditated all his crimes. By that logic, would Kid Boo also be the most sympathetic Dragon Ball Z villain? Yeah, it's kind of um. That that line of that logic that line of logic it kind of reminds me of like the bizarre line of logic that Ayn Rand gave for why she thought like she became very enamored with this I think he was like a serial killer or something who was completely amoral and like a psychopath and she became enamored with him as like he was like the perfect person because <laughs> he wasn't concerned with anyone else. This is kind of hilarious. Um but uh, yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, obviously not. I mean, you know, obviously Frieza is super evil. Kid Buu is super evil. But if you had to deal with one, right? If you had to deal with Frieza or Kid Buu, you'd obviously want to deal with Frieza because at least Frieza, you're like, well, as long as I grovel and do what, do what Frieza says, maybe I won't die, right? With Kid Buu, you're just kind of ultra fucked. There's really no way around it, so... Though I don't know, I don't think you could see. I don't think you could classify either of them as being more sympathetic than the other. They're both just strictly purely evil, so in just different ways. Soldo for two dollars says, since we're talking about sexual evolution, can we all please just admit that pandas are a hoax? Those damn things cannot have survived in the wild at all. They mate maybe once every few years and will kill multi multiple offspring. Yeah, that what is up? Why? And how did pandas evolve to be so fucking incompetent? Right. Yeah. Sexually that's incompetent. A, yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. Um, they have the I, easiest birthing too, because isn't the baby is like a, as big as a thumbnail. Yeah, it's like tiny. Yeah. And it climbs like a little, <laughs> like a little insect up into the mom's pouch. That's right. They have little pouches. Yeah. Or do wait, pandas it's have pouches? So, it's so bizarre. Mm -hmm. I know that they have like the little tiny baby. Like the birth, the thing could just fall out of the mom. It's so small. Uh, yeah. No, the pandas don't have pouches. You're thinking of like a koala, I think. Oh, so does it work its way up to the tit and it suckles on the tit or something? I have. Maybe. I mean, I know it comes out and it's super tiny. Yeah, I've seen the video of the thing climbing up the belly of the panda. Yeah, maybe it climbs up and... I think the, the koalas climb into the pouch or some weird shit like that. But, um, but yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. Why? How did pandas exist in the wild so horribly incompetent? And I don't know the answer to that question. Maybe they were just so isolated and predation yeah. free that evolution kind of ran wild on them that's it no natural predators yeah. kind of like the uh you know like the dodo essentially <laughs> so but see that's another thing that's about the you know an, an aspect of evolution i think it's lost on the evo psych stuff evolution can evolution itself can lead you in the fucking dead ends <laughs> like it did with the dodo like it's doing with the panda of because course. evolution is not Evolution is just machine learning. It's just a random process of kind of, you know, whatever works pet gets passed on. But whatever works at that moment can end up being the detriment down the road. So 
The sad thing is I think cultural evolution is just as blind and random, even though we like to think, oh, no, we're smart. We think of the good ways to do things. I just... I, I think the way it, I think it is, but I think obviously humans have significantly more control over it than we do with evolution, evolution. Oh, of course. But right. the, the changes, the adaptations, well, they could be non-adaptive. I just, I feel like the changes to society are often just random. Like this, all this huge trans thing. Well, narrative I, that we're going on here. I don't think it's random. I think when you have these very big changes occur, you have to have all these different little um, things have to be in the right place at the right time to make these massive societal changes occur. But it's just it's hard to see what all the little pieces are that line up to allow whatever to change to change. Right. But do you think there would be, do you think it's random or do you think so there's some sort of intentional process going on? Well, it's random. Well, it is random, sake. isn't it? <laughs> well, it's random in terms of like, because so my theory of all this is that there's always extreme forces that are always trying to pull society in the direction at all times. So that's intentional. But then it's random in terms of that which one of there them are, gets picked up. Yeah, because like there'll, there'll have to be certain events that occur that are they're not random, but it's not like the person who like wants George their Floyd, free ideology. Obviously. Well, like okay, let's use the trans for example, like. Like there's always going to be, let's just say like hypothetically, there's always a group of people that are always pressing for like super hyper pro trans issues for the last 50 years, but they never gain headway until wokeness comes into being. Right. And so like from their perspective, it's random that wokeness came into being like maybe they didn't have anything to do with that, but it's not random because there are reasons for why wokeness came into being, you know, in the first place. Well, and the social media technology, I think, is a huge component of it as well. Right. So I wouldn't use the word random. I'd say maybe it's um, not serendipitous. Was it? Was it called when you like take advantage of something? It's like opportunism. I, I guess it's sort of opportunistic, maybe. But anyway, uh, Soto another two dollars it says it's funny when people pretend that words suddenly lose all social context when it suits them like rollo with calling stepdads cucks or dev calling harassment victims weak also is doomer a cuck for letting dev host his video oh that's a great question i mean i don't like to call anyone a cuck except for doomer but <laughs> doomer. doomer why are you cucking yourself why are you allowing dev to host your video hmm? yeah I guess it doesn't meet the definition of cuck since it was consensual, so. True. Well, but even, I mean, you can be a consensual cuck. That's what all that weird porn shit is, but. Oh, I know. That's what pe people kept saying that in the chat. And I, I never stopped to tell them, listen, we understand there's the cuck fetish in porn. But we're talking about. We're talking about like actual. Yeah, the life, biological yeah. process of cuckolding. Right. Well, see, that would be interesting. So the people that get off on like cuck porn, do would they actually get off on the actual raising of another man's child? Because usually, <laughs> oh my God. when that's so weird, like w with the cuck porn stuff, I don't. I mean, does childbearing go into it? Is it just like, oh, you know, my wife is getting fucked by another man? That is so that the psychology of that I just do not understand. I don't either. But how does that I'm work like, into evolution? How how where's the psychology of that going coming do, from? That's it's so counter-evolutionary. Here's the thing that I'm always wondering. Remember when the weirdo Mr. Girl came on our show and told us about how, like he mentioned offhandedly. Gross things are attractive? Yes, yeah, something about, like he basically self-reported that, you know, gross things turn him on. Yes. And I wonder yes. if the cucking is like just, you know, you're, you still get that same jealousy feeling, but that's what turns you on. It's like you're emotionally devastated and that's what's making you, um, <laughs> it's hard basically. Yeah. No, I, I guess that's a humiliation fetish, but the question is, why does anyone have a, humil a I know, humiliation I know. fetish in the first place? I mean, I don't have one, so I can't understand it. 
but psychologically. You, but you can understand, look, you can understand the sexual, um, what is it, just being turned on by it with or without the jealousy component. That's my question is, is the jealousy component part of it for these people who are in the cuck fetish? I mean, it had to be. Jealousy it doesn't necessarily have tied to be. Into it. Look, you could be getting turned on in the same way that a normal person is turned on by watching pornography, right? You're just watching a woman have sex with a guy and you're like, maybe you're a mat, maybe you're a POV guy and you're imagining you're the guy. So you're imagining your wife is yeah, but doing the that to is, you. Right. But the difference is when you're watching porn, mm -hmm. you presumably don't have the option of having sex with whoever the porn star is. Right, watching, you could right? just have sex with your wife. But if it's in real life and it's your wife, then you do. So it's well, like, that's an excellent point. That is an yeah. excellent point. Right, it's a little different. The guy's like, no, stand up. It's so weird, too, because he's, you've heard situations where these guys come forward and they're like, yeah, the husband wanted, you know, basically paid me to rail his wife and and watch. And you're thinking, and you're like, this is fucking weird. Like, I mean, that's uncomfortable. I don't want to do that. I yeah, I wouldn't want to be in that situation either because I'm like, what? I don't want to be the cucker or the cucky. Right. Oh my god. Well, you know, it could be. Um, and we talked about this. I think I think sexual fetishes generally come from one of two places, or one of three places. I mean, one is just literal brain damage. <laughs> <laughs> so maybe it's just brain damage. Do you think it's like a mental illness? Well, I don't, not mental illness, but just it could just literally be, you know, there's some weird um, no, the cross fetish, wiring. No, it belongs in the in, DSM. In the, the cuck right. fetish belongs in the DSM. It, I mean, I'm maybe putting it my should. foot down. It should. Yeah, so it could, it could just literally be brain damage or some cross wiring in the brain that occurred either at birth or somewhere through life that just, you know, you get your wires crossed maybe. So like, it could be that. Um, one, I mean, that's number one. Number two, there could be some sort of deep psychological fulfillment that's occurring there. I think that's probably less with cucking because I can't wrap my mind around what would be the psychological fulfillment of being humiliated in, in that fashion specifically. Um, like, you know, when you talk about like psychological fulfillment, you know, it's sort of like, oh, you know, the guy who's like the high power CEO, but then he goes to like the femme dominatrix who ties him up and says he's worthless right, and stuff. Yeah. Like you could kind of see like, okay, I could kind of understand that some like psychological thing happening there. Like they're in charge all the time and, you know, they want to right. basically not be in charge. I can kind of understand that, but that's very different than the cucking thing. Um, the third thing I think that f sexual fascists come from is I think people for whatever reason, it's kind of similar to the cross wiring thing. I think people can just get, uh, if they're in like a horny state of mind, can just develop new fetishes like somewhat randomly by being in close proximity maybe to an action while horny. And maybe that's causing some of this stuff. So, but the thing is, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know if I, well, obviously I've never experienced that, but I guess someone could. Well, I'm just thinking. I, I, I you're like fly fishing, and you get a boner, and all of a sudden you're like, God, I'm just so horny for fly fishing. Well, no, it'd be more like you're so horny, like you're so horny, and then and then someone does something to you that you never liked or thought of liking, and then maybe you're like, Oh, now I like this thing. Like your brain associates it with you being horny so much, uh -huh. you know, in that experience. Essentially, is what I'm saying. Right. Um, like you're mugged. Now you sure. Like a huge mugging fetish. You're super. <laughs> Well, like, okay, let's do the example. It'd be like, you know, you're you're having sex with someone in the back of your car, uh -huh. and then you're rear-ended. Well, no, let's try <laughs> to be a little bit more grounded. Off. You know, someone, you know, a police officer knocks on your window right, and interrupts, <laughs> you know, the the act and okay. you know, chews you out. Maybe all of a sudden, if you were really into sex at that moment, the like in your mind, uh, you associate like the being discovered aspect of it with the oh, okay. enjoyment of the action. Oh, so now all of a sudden That's you're an I'm... exhibitionist. Right. Yeah. So maybe you were just having sex with your girlfriend in the car because that was all you like, you know, you're young and you didn't have camping at home with your parents or something. Right. But then it turns into like this weird exhi exhi exhibitionist thing that it wasn't really before. So I think that can happen. You like call your friend over and you're like, oh, come on in. I'm just fucking my wife here in the living room. Yeah, right. Exactly. But the cut thing is weird because it's so 
it's like it's a category that exists. It's not just like a one-off. Oh, thing, I know, right? I know. So that makes me that's think what's it's more disturbing like disturbing about it. I, that's what makes me think it's more of like a brain damage cross wiring thing because it's. I don't know how prevalent it is, but it's prevalent enough to be like a category. So. Well, wait, we always ask the POV question. Maybe we're looking at this incorrectly. Maybe the reason why it is a category is because people fetishize cucking another man. Like they're not imagining themselves in the cuck's position. They're imagining themselves in the guy's position, fucking the guy's wife in front of him. No, that's well, I'm sure there's some people that watch it for that. But I, I think most people that watch cuck porn watch it to be the cock because usually the well, way yeah this uh, it seems like that's supposed to be the pov for the person watching see i don't know so but i mean i'm sure some people watch it the way you're suggesting they're, like, in they're the like, humiliation. Oh, the right <laughs> they're the in so. the humiliation position right and and to me even though i think that's bad i understand psychologically why someone would get off on doing that being the humiliator supposed to the humiliate zero but. fox how do you know that look how do you know all this terminology? It's very <laughs> unseemly. What? Cock? Zero no and zero bull. fuck says the other guy's the the bull. Yes. Bull. The I've bull. heard these terms. We just call him the other guy around here. The other guy. We're the other guys. There you go. There you go. But anyway. I should listen, if I could go back in time, I would have been like in I would have been in college in one of my psych classes, like, I'm gonna do a study. <laughs> The cuck study. <laughs> We're gonna get to the bottom of this. We're gonna figure out what the fuck is happening here. I bet you there's research in this that if, if anyone give a shit enough to look into this, I bet you there's research in like this cucking shit. Of course. Oh. Uh Metalworks 411 says cuck is humiliation fetish. You guys are clearly not subs. But it's it's beyond that. It's beyond that. Like I could understand someone being a sub and not a dom, it, but that doesn't mean that they want to be a cock. That's just—it's such a specific thing. Well, being dominated by a woman is completely different than being. Sure, that can be really hot, yeah. But being a cock, that is like, oh my god. I guess it is a kind of different—a different kind of domination. I mean, I, it's a form of domination, right? But yeah. like, that's like saying like, like. Someone could be into a, like a, a woman dominating them, but doesn't mean they want to get pegged, right? Oh yeah. <laughs> so like it's just yeah, obviously the everyone dom has sub... their lines. Everyone is right. Their... Right. Well, I'm just saying, saying like the dom subcategory is a very general and vague, and there's lots of subcategories <laughs> that would break down into it. So I don't think it's so simple to just say it's like a dom sub thing. And I think it's the same thing with humiliation too. I don't. I can't think of any other humiliation fetishes out of my head, but whatever. I have, to, I have to run to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Okay. Subbed to the channel, but not a sub. There you go. See, you need to become a cockologist. <laughs> Listen, we're gonna get to the bottom of this. We're gonna help these poor cucks. Okay, we're gonna cure them. Cuck seems like you're being dominated by the guy too. That's a good point. Yeah. With the cuck, you are being dominated by the guy hmm yeah well then there's another weird element too because there's like there's the cucking thing and there's also the whole like oh the people that get off on sharing they want to like share their wives which is different um but also something i can't really wrap my brain around it seems to be obviously counter a very counter evolutionary process i mean i guess that would be the question for rollo why why do people develop these sexual fetishes that are very uh counter evolutionary actually hurt their odds of uh you know reproducing right how does that make sense evolutionarily makes no sense i mean same thing with pedos that's like an evolutionary dead end right there so i don't know there's a lot of uh i think evolution produces a lot of derivations so yeah anyway oh that's it nice what a great that's show it. that's it yeah leave us uh your thoughts in the comments below obviously i read all the comments and always there's some fascinating points that you guys make always uh always interesting to read sure. anyways thank you all for coming
Thank you all for your incredibly generous donations. Thank you, Roll, for coming on. It was a very interesting conversation. Uh, and it was a good conversation, I think. Um, and thank you, you, who made it to the end of the stream. You are the true Feeble Seekers. And we'll see you all next Sunday.